Introductory Note to Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Introductory Note. The character of the contents of volumes 1, 2, and 3 is so closely related that they may be said to constitute three volumes under one general title. There are myths of Greece and Rome in this volume, as well as in volume 3, and there are more animal myths in volume 1, particularly of the Hindus and of the North American Indians. What gives the volume a special character is the large group of stories from the sagas or epic songs of the Northmen including the story of Brunhilde and Siegfried, and a particularly attractive version of Lohengrin condensed, but not rewritten from the story by Miss Maud. These stories belong to us in a very particular sense, since the blood that flows in the veins of English and American boys is largely the blood of the fair-faced, fair-haired Northmen, or Scandinavians, or Danes, or whatever we call them, who invaded England in the ninth and tenth centuries. Their strong bodies and strong wills have worked wonders in the world and have made the world a pleasanter place to live in. It was the Northman blood that sent Robinson Crusoe a wandering and helped Christian defeat the giant in Doubting Castle. W.P. End of introductory note. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 1, Part 1 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Stories from the Northern Sagas, Part 1. The Northman Story of How All Things Began by E. M. Wilmot Buxton. Once upon a time, before ever this world was made, there was neither earth nor sea, nor air nor light, but only a great yawning gulf full of twilight. To the north of this gulf lay the home of mists, a dark and dreary land out of which flowed a river of water from a spring that never ran dry. As the water in its onward course met the bitter blasts of winter from the yawning gulf, it hardened into great blocks of ice which rolled far down into the abyss with a thunderous roar and piled themselves one on another until they formed mountains of glistening ice. South of this gulf lay the home of fire, a land of burning heat, guarded by a giant with a flaming sword which, as he flashed it to and fro before the entrance, sent forth showers of sparks and these sparks fell upon the ice blocks and partly melted them so that they sent up clouds of steam and these again were frozen into hoar frost which filled all the space that was left in the midst of the mountains of ice then one day when the gulf was full to the very top this great mass of frosty rime warmed by the flames from the home of fire and frozen by the cold airs from the home of mist, came to life and became the giant Emir, with a living, moving body and cruel heart of ice. Now there was as yet no tree nor grass nor anything that would serve for food in this gloomy abyss. But when the giant Emir began to grope around for something to satisfy his hunger, he heard a sound as of some animal chewing the cud, and there among the ice hills he saw a gigantic cow, from whose udder flowed four great streams of milk, and with this his craving was easily stilled. But the cow was hungry also, and began to lick the salt off the blocks of ice by which she was surrounded. And presently, as she went on licking with her strong rough tongue, a head of hair pushed itself through the melting ice. Still the cow went on licking, until she had at last melted all the icy covering, and there stood fully revealed the frame of a mighty man. Ymir looked with ice of hatred at this being, born of snow and ice, for somehow he knew that his heart was warm and kind, 
and that he and his son would always be the enemies of the evil race of the frost giants so indeed it came to pass for from the sons of emir came a race of giants whose pleasure was to work evil on the earth and from the sons of the ice man sprang the race of the gods chief of whom was odin father of all things that ever were made and odin and his brothers began at once to war against the wicked frost giants and most of all against the cold-hearted emir now when after a hard fight the giant emir was slain such a river of blood flowed forth from his wounds that it drowned all the rest of the frost giants save one who escaped in a boat with only his wife on board and sailed away to the edge of the world and from him sprang all the new race of frost giants who at every opportunity issued from their land of twilight and desolation to harm the gods in their abode of bliss when the giants had been thus driven out all father odin set to work with his brothers to make the earth the sea and the sky and these they fashioned out of the great body of the giant emir out of his flesh they formed midgard the earth which lay in the centre of the gulf and all round it they planted his eyebrows to make a high fence which should defend it from the race of giants with his bones they made the lofty hills with his teeth the cliffs and his thick curly hair took root and became trees bushes and the green grass with his blood they made the ocean and his great skull poised aloft became the arching sky just below this they scattered his brains and made of them the heavy grey clouds that lie between earth and heaven the sky itself was held in place by four strong dwarfs who supported on their broad shoulders as they stand east and west and south and north the next thing was to give light to the new-made world so the gods caught sparks from the home of fire and set them in the sky for stars and they took the living flame and made of it the sun and moon which they placed in chariots of gold and harnessed to them beautiful horses with flowing manes of gold and silver before the horses of the sun they placed a mighty shield to protect them from its hot rays but the swift moon steeds needed no such protection from its gentle heat and now all was ready save that there was no one to drive the horses of the sun and moon this task was given to many and soul the beautiful son and daughter of a giant and these fair charioteers drive their fleet steeds along the paths marked out by the gods and not only give light to the earth but mark up months and days for the sons of men then all father odin called forth night the gloomy daughter of the cold-hearted giant folk and set her to drive the dark chariot drawn by the black horse frosty mane from whose long wavy hair the drops of dew and hoar frost fall upon the earth below after her drove her radiant sun day with his white steed shining mane from whom the bright beams of daylight shine forth to gladden the hearts of men but the wicked giants were very angry when they saw all these good things and they set in the sky two hungry wolves that the fierce great creatures might forever pursue the sun and moon and devour them and so bring all things to an end sometimes indeed or so say the men of the north the great wolves almost succeed in swallowing sun or moon and then the earth children make such an uproar that the fierce beasts drop their prey in fear and the sun and moon fleet more rapidly than before still pursued by their hungry monsters one day so runs the tale as manny the man in the moon was hastening on his course he gazed upon the earth and saw two beautiful little children a boy and a girl carrying between them a pail of water they looked very tired and sleepy and indeed they were for a cruel giant made them fetch and carry water all night long when they should have been in bed so Manny put out a long, long arm and snatched up the children and set them in the moon, pale and all, and there you can see them on any moonlight night for yourself. 
but that happened a long time after the beginning of things for as yet there was no man or woman or child upon the earth and now that this pleasant midgard was made the gods determined to satisfy their desire for a home where they might rest and enjoy themselves in their hours of ease they chose a suitable place far above the earth on the other side of the great river which flowed from the home of mist where the giants dwelt and here they made for their abode asgard wherein they dwelt in peace and happiness and from whence they could look down upon the sons of men from asgard to midgard they built a beautiful bridge of many colours to which men gave the name of rainbow bridge and up and down which the god could pass on their journeys to and from the earth here in asgard stood the mighty forge where the gods fashioned their weapons wherewith they fought the giants and the tools wherewith they built their palaces of gold and silver meantime no human creature lived upon the earth and the giants dared not cross its borders for fear of the gods but one of them clad in eagle's plumes always sat on the north side of midgard and whenever he raised his arms and let them fall again an icy blast rushed forth from the mist home and nipped all the pleasant things of earth with its cruel breath in due time the earth brought forth thousands of tiny creatures which crawled about and showed signs of great intelligence and when the gods examined these little people closely they found that they were of two kinds some were ugly misshapen and cunning-faced with great heads small bodies long arms and feet these they called trolls or dwarves or gnomes and sent them to live underground threatening to turn them into stone should they appear in the daytime and this is why the trolls spend all their time in the hidden parts of the earth digging for gold and silver and precious stones and hiding their spoils away in secret holes and corners Sometimes they blow their tiny fires and set to work to make all kinds of wonderful things from this buried treasure. And that is what they are doing when, if one listens very hard on the mountains and hills of the Northland, the sound of tap-tap-tapping is heard far underneath the ground. The other small earth creatures are very fair and light and slender, kindly of heart and full of good will. These the gods called fairies, or elves, and gave to them a charming place called Elfland, in which to dwell. Elfland lies between Asgard and Midgard, and since all fairies have wings, they can easily flit down to the earth to play with the butterflies, teach the young birds to sing, water the flowers, or dance in the moonlight round a fairy ring. Last of all, the gods made a man and woman to dwell in fair Midgard, and this is the manner of their creation. Old Father Odin was walking with his brothers in Midgard, where, by the seashore, they found growing two trees, an ash and an elm. Odin took these trees and breathed on them, whereupon a wonderful transformation took place. Where the trees had stood, there were a living man and woman, but they were stupid, pale, and speechless, until Hönir, the god of light, touched their foreheads and gave them sense and wisdom and loki the fire god smoothed their faces giving them bright colour and warm blood and the power to speak and see and hear it only remained that they should be named and they were called ask and embla the names of the trees from which they had been formed from these two people sprang all the race of men which lives upon this earth and now all father odin completed his work by planting the tree of life this immense tree had its roots in Asgard and Midgard and the Mistland, and it grew to such a marvellous height that the highest bow, the Bow of Peace, hung over the hall of Odin on the heights of Asgard, and the other branches overshadowed both Midgard and the Mistland. On the top of the Peace Bow was perched a mighty eagle, and ever a falcon sat between his eyes, and kept watch on all that happened in the world below, that he might tell Odin what he saw. Hadron, the goat of Odin, who supplied the heavenly mead, browsed on the leaves of this wonderful tree, and from them fed also the four mighty stags from whose horns honeydew dropped onto the earth beneath, 
and supplied water for all the rivers of Midgard. The leaves of the Tree of Life were ever green and fair, despite the dragon which, aided by countless serpents, gnawed perpetually at its roots, in order that they might kill the Tree of Life and thus bring about the destruction of the gods. Up and down the branches of the tree scampered a squirrel, Ratatosk, a malicious little creature, whose one amusement it was to make mischief by repeating to the eagle the rude remarks of the dragon, and to the dragon those of the eagle, in the hope that one day he might see them in actual conflict. Near the roots of the Tree of Life is a sacred well of sweet water from which the three weird sisters, who know all that shall come to pass, sprinkle the tree and keep it fresh and green. And the water, as it trickles down from the leaves, falls as drops of honey on the earth, and the bees take it for their food. Close to the sacred well is the council hall of the gods, to which every morning they rode, over the rainbow bridge, to hold converse together. And this is the end of the tale of how all things began. End of chapter 1, part 1. Recording by phone. Chapter 1, part 2 of Junior Classics, volume 2. Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, volume 2. Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton Stories from the Northern Sagas, Part 2 How the Queen of the Sky Gave Gifts to Men by E. M. Wilmot Buxton By the side of Allfather Odin, upon his high seat in Asgard, sat Frigga, his wife, the Queen of the Azas. Sometimes she would be dressed in snow-white garments, bound at the waist by a golden girdle, from which hung a great bunch of golden keys and the earth-dwellers, gazing into the sky, would admire the great white clouds as they floated across the blue, not perceiving that these clouds were really the folds of Frigga's flowing white robe as it waved in the wind. At other times, she would wear dark grey or purple garments, and then the earth-dwellers made haste into their houses, for they said, The sky is lowering today, and a storm is nigh at hand. Frigga had a palace of her own called Fensalir, or the Hall of Mists, where she spent much of her time at her wheel, spinning golden thread, or weaving web after web of many-coloured clouds. All night long she sat at this golden wheel, and if you look at the sky on a starry night, you may chance to see it set up where the men of the south show a constellation called the Girdle of Orion. Husbands and wives who had dwelt lovingly together upon earth were invited by Frigga to her hall when they died so they might be forever united within its hospitable walls. Frigga was especially interested in all good housewives, and she herself set them an excellent example in Fensalir. When the snowflakes fell, the earth dwellers knew it was Frigga shaking her great feather bed, and when it rained they said it was her washing day. It was she who first gave to them the gift of flax that the women upon earth might spin and weave, and bleached her linen as white as the clouds of her own white robe. And this is how it came about. There once was a shepherd who lived among the mountains with his wife and children, and so very poor was he that he often found it hard to give his family enough to satisfy their hunger. But he did not grumble, he only worked the harder, and his wife, though she had scarcely any furniture, and never a chance of a new dress, kept the house so clean and the old clothes so well mended that all unknown to herself she rose high in the favour of the all-seeing frigga now one day when the shepherd had driven his few poor sheep up the mountain to pasture a fine reindeer sprang from the rocks above him and began to leap upward along the steep slope the shepherd snatched up his crossbow and pursued the animal thinking to himself now we shall have a better meal than we have had for many a long day. Up and up leaped the reindeer, always just out of reach, and at length disappeared behind a great boulder just as the shepherd, breathless and weary, reached the spot. No sign of the reindeer was to be seen, but, on looking around, 
The shepherd saw that he was among the snowy heights of the mountains, and almost at the top of a great glacier. Presently, as he pursued his vain search for the animal, he saw to his amazement an open door, leading apparently into the heart of the glacier. He was a fearless man, and so, without hesitation, he passed boldly through the doorway and found himself standing in a marvellous cavern, lit up by blazing torches which gleamed upon rich jewels hanging from the roof and walls. And in the midst stood a woman, most fair to behold, clad in snow-white robes and surrounded by a group of lovely maidens. The shepherd's boldness gave way at this awesome sight, and he sank to his knees before the Asa, Frigga, for she it was. But Frigga bade him be of good cheer, and said, Choose now whatsoever you will to carry away with you as a remembrance of this place. The shepherd's eyes wandered over the glittering jewels on the walls and roof, but they came back to a little bunch of blue flowers which Frigga held in her hand. They alone looked homelike to him. The rest were hard and cold, so he asked timidly that he might be given the little nosegay. Then Frigga smiled kindly upon him. Most wise has been your choice, said she. Take with the flowers this measure of seed and sow it in your field, and you shall grow flowers of your own. They shall bring prosperity to you and yours. So the shepherd took the flowers and the seed, and scarcely had he done so when a mighty peal of thunder, followed by the shock of an earthquake, rent the cavern, and when he had collected his senses he found himself once more upon the mountainside. When he reached home and had told his tale, his wife scolded him roundly for not bringing home a jewel, which would have made them rich forever. But when she would have thrown the flowers away, he prevented her. Next day, he sowed the seed in his field, and was surprised to find how far it went. Very soon after this, the field was thick with tiny green shoots, and though his wife reproached him for wasting good ground upon useless flowers, he watched and waited in hope until the field was blue with the starry flax blooms. Now one night, when the flowers had withered and the seed was ripe, Frigga, in the disguise of an old woman, visited the lowly hut and showed the shepherd and his astonished wife how to use the flax stalks, how to spin them into thread, and how to weave the thread into linen. It was not long before all the dwellers in that part of the earth had heard of the wonderful material, and were hurrying to the shepherd's hut to buy bleached linen or the seed from which it was obtained. And so the shepherd and his family were soon among the richest people in the land, and the promise of Frigga was amply fulfilled. End of chapter 1, part 2「Chapter 1, part 3 of Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Stories from the Northern Sagas, Part 3 The Dwarves and the Fairies by A and E. Carey. The earth is very beautiful, said Odin, from the top of his throne. Very beautiful in every part, even to the shores of the dark North Sea. But alas, the men of the earth are puny and fearful. At this moment I see a three-headed giant striding out of Jotunheim. He throws a shepherd boy into the sea, and puts the whole of the flock into his pocket. Now he takes them out again, one by one, and cracks their bones as if they were hazelnuts, while all the time men look on and do nothing. Father, cried Thor in a rage, last night I forged for myself a belt, a glove, and a hammer, with which three things I will go forth alone to Jotunheim. Thor went, and Odin looked again. The men of the earth are idle and stupid, said Odin. There are dwarves and elves who live amongst them, and play tricks which they cannot understand, and do not know how to prevent. At this moment I see a husbandman sowing grains of wheat in the furrows, while a dwarf runs after him and changes them into stones. Again I see two hideous little beings, 
who are holding under water the head of one, the wisest of men, until he dies. They mix his blood with honey. They have put it into three stone jars and hidden it away. Then Odin was very angry with the dwarves, for he saw that they were bent on mischief. So he called to him Hermit, his flying word, and dispatched him with a message to the dwarves and light elves, to say that Odin sent his compliments, and would be glad to speak with them, in his palace of Gladsheim, upon a matter of some importance. When they received Hermit's summons, the dwarves and light elves were very much surprised, not quite knowing whether to feel honoured or afraid. However, they put on their pertest manners, and went clustering after Hermit like a swarm of ladybirds. When they were arrived in the great city, they found Odin descended from his throne, and sitting with the rest of the Aesir in the judgment hall of Gladsheim. Hermit flew in, saluted his master, and pointed to the dwarves and elves hanging like a cloud in the doorway, to show that he had fulfilled his mission. Then Odin beckoned the little people to come forward. Cowering and whispering, they peeped over one another's shoulders, now running on a little way into the hall, now back again, half curious, half afraid, and it was not until Odin had beckoned three times that they finally reached his footstool. Then Odin spoke to them in calm, low, serious tones about the wickedness of their mischievous propensities. Some, the very worst of them, only laughed in a forward, hardened manner, but a great many looked up surprised and a little pleased at the novelty of serious words while the light elves all wept, for they were tender-hearted little things. At length Odin spoke to the two dwarves by name, who he had seen drowning the wise man. Whose blood was it, he asked, that you mixed with honey and put into jars? Oh, said the dwarves, jumping up into the air and clapping their hands, that was Kvasir's blood. Don't you know who Kvasir was? He sprang up out of the peace made between the Vanir and yourselves, and has been wandering about these seven years or more. So wise he was that men thought he must be a god. Well, just now we found him lying in a meadow, drowned in his own wisdom. So we mixed his blood with honey, and put it into three great jars to keep. Was that not well done, Odin? Well done, answered Odin. Well done? You cruel, cowardly, lying dwarfs! I myself saw you kill him. For shame! For shame! and then Odin proceeded to pass sentence upon them all. Those who had been the most wicked, he said, were to live henceforth a long way underground, and were to spend their time in throwing fuel upon the great earth's central fire, while those who had only been mischievous were to work in the golden diamond mines, fashioning precious stones and metals. They might all come up at night, Odin said, but must vanish at the dawn. Then he waved his hand, and the dwarfs turned round, surely chattering, scampered down the palace steps, out of the city, over the green fields, to their unknown, deep-buried earth homes. But the light elves still lingered, with upturned, tearful, smiling faces, like sunshiny morning dew. And you, said Odin, looking them through and through with his serious eyes, and you, Oh, indeed, Odin, interrupted they, speaking altogether in quick, uncertain tones. Oh, indeed, Odin, we are not so very wicked. We have never done anybody any harm. Have you ever done anybody any good? asked Odin. Oh, no, indeed, answered the light elves. We have never done anything at all. You may go, then, said Odin, to live among the flowers and play with the wild bees and summer insects. You must, however, find something to do, or you will get to be mischievous like the dwarves. If only we had anyone to teach us, said the light elves, for we are such foolish little people. Odin looked round inquiringly upon the Aesir, but among them there was no teacher found for the silly little elves. Then he turned to Njord, who nodded his head good-naturedly, and said, Yes, yes, I will see about it. And then he strode out of the judgment hall, right away through the city gates, and sat down upon the mountain's edge. After a while, he began to whistle in a most alarming manner, louder and louder, in strong wild gusts, now advancing, now retreating. Then he dropped his voice a little, lower and lower, until it became a bird-like whistle, 
low soft enticing music like a spirit's call and far away from the south a little fluttering answer came sweet as the invitation itself nearer and nearer until the two sounds dropped into one another then through the clear sky two forms came floating wonderfully fair a brother and sister their beautiful arms twined round one another their golden hair bathed in sunlight and supported by the wind my son and daughter said njord proudly to the surrounding aesir frey and freya summer and beauty hand in hand when frey and freya dropped upon the hill njord took his son by the hand led him gracefully to the foot of the throne and said look here dear brother lord what a fair young instructor i have brought for your pretty little elves odin was very much pleased with the appearance of frey but before constituting him king and schoolmaster of the light elves he desired to know what his accomplishments were and what he considered himself competent to teach i am the genius of clouds and sunshine answered frey and as he spoke the essences of a hundred perfumes were exhaled from his breath i am the genius of clouds and sunshine and if the light elves will have me for their king i can teach them how to burst the folded buds to set the blossoms to pour sweetness into the swelling fruit to lead the bees through the honey passages of the flowers to make the single ear a stalk of wheat to hatch birds eggs and teach the little ones to sing all this and much more said frey i know and will teach them then answered odin it is well and frey took his scholars away with him to alfheim which is in every beautiful place under the sun End of chapter 1, part 3. Recording by phone. Chapter 1, part 4 of Junior Classics, volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Stories from the Northern Sagas, Part 4. How Thor Went to Jotunheim, by A. and E. Carey. Once on a time, Aesop, Thor, and Loki set out on a journey from Asgard to Jotunheim. They travelled in Thor's chariot, drawn by two milk-white goats. It was a somewhat cumbrous iron chariot, and the wheels made a rumbling noise as it moved, which sometimes startled the ladies of Asgard, and made them tremble. But Thor liked it, though the noise sweeter than any music, and was never so happy as when he was journeying in it from one place to another. They travelled all day, and in the evening they came to a countryman's house. It was a poor, lonely place, but Thor descended from his chariot, and determined to pass the night there. The countryman, however, had no food in his house to give these travellers, and Thor, who liked to feast himself and make every one feast with him, was obliged to kill his own two goats and serve them up for supper. He invited the countryman and his wife and children to sup with him, but before they began to eat he made one request of them. Do not, on any account, he said, break or throw away any of the bones of the goats you are going to eat for supper. I wonder why, said the peasant's son, Tialfi, to his sister Roska. Roska could not think of any reason, and by and by Tialfi happened to have a very nice little bone given him with some marrow in it. Certainly there can be no harm in my breaking just this one, he said to himself. It would be such a pity to lose the marrow. And as Aza Thor's head was turned another way, he slyly broke the bone in two, sucked the marrow, and then threw the pieces into the goat's skins, where Thor had desired that all the bones might be placed. I do not know whether Tialfi was uneasy during the night about what he had done, but in the morning he found out the reason of Aza Thor's command, and received the lesson on wondering why, which he never forgot all his life after. As soon as Aza Thor rose in the morning, he took his hammer, Mjolnir, in his hand, and held it over the goatskins as they lay on the floor, whispering runes the while. 
They were dead skins with dry bones on them when he began to speak. But as he said the last word, the Elfie, who was looking curiously on, saw two live goats spring up and walk towards the chariot, as fresh and well as when they brought the chariot up to the door, the Elfie hoped. But no, one of the goats limped a little with his hind leg, and Asa Thor saw it. His brow grew dark as he looked, and for a minute the Elfie thought he would run far, far into the forest, and never come back again. But one look more at Asa Thor's face, angry as it was, made him change his mind. He thought of a better thing to do than running away. He came forward, threw himself at the Asa's feet, and confessing what he had done, begged pardon for his disobedience. Thor listened, and the displeased look passed away from his face. "'You have done wrong, Thialfi,' he said, raising him up. "'But as you have confessed your fault so bravely, instead of punishing you, I will take you with me on my journey, and teach you myself the lesson of obedience to the Aesir, which is, I see, wanted. Roska chose to go with her brother, and from that day Thor had two faithful servants, who followed him wherever he went. The chariot and goats were now left behind, but, with Loki and his two new followers, Thor journeyed on to the end of Mannheim, over the sea, and then on, on, on in the strange, barren, misty land of Jotunheim. Sometimes they crossed great mountains. Sometimes they had to make their way among torn and rugged rocks, which often, through the mist, appeared to them to wear the forms of men, and once for a whole day they traversed a thick and tangled forest. In the evening of that day, being very much tired, they saw with pleasure that they had come upon a spacious hall, of which the door, as broad as the house itself, stood wide open. Here we may very comfortably lodge for the night, said Thor, and they went in and looked about them. The house appeared to be perfectly empty. There was a wide hall, and five smaller rooms opening into it. They were, however, too tired to examine it carefully and as no inhabitants made their appearance, they ate their supper in the hall, and lay down to sleep. But they had not rested long before they were disturbed by strange noises, groanings, mutterings, and snortings, louder than any animal that had ever seen in their lives could make. By and by, the house began to shake from side to side, and it seemed as if the very earth trembled. Thor sprang up in haste, and ran to the open door, but, though he looked earnestly into the starlit forest, there was no enemy to be seen anywhere. Loki and Thialfi, after groping about for a time, found a sheltered chamber to the right, where they thought they could finish their night's rest in safety. But Thor, with Mjolnir in his hand, watched at the door of the house all night. As soon as the day dawned, he went out into the forest, and there, stretched on the ground close by the house, he saw a strange, uncouth, gigantic shape of a man, out of whose nostrils came a breath which swayed the trees to their very tops. There was no need to wonder any longer what the disturbing noises had been. Thor fearlessly walked up to the strange monster to have a better look at him, but at the sound of his footsteps the giant's shape rose slowly, stood up an immense height, and looked down upon Thor with two great misty eyes like blue mountain lakes. Who are you? said Thor, standing on tiptoe and stretching his neck to look up. And why do you make such a noise as to prevent your neighbors from sleeping? My name is Skrymir, said the giant sternly. I need not ask yours. You are the little Aza Thor of Asgard. But pray now, what have you done with my glove? As he spoke, he stooped down and picked up the hall where Thor and his companions had passed the night and which, in truth, was nothing more than his glove, the room where Loki and Thialfi had slept being the thumb. Thor rubbed his eyes, and felt as if he must be dreaming. Rousing himself, however, he raised Mjolnir in his hand, and, trying to keep his eyes fixed on the giant's face, which seemed to be always changing, he said, It is time that you should know, Skrymir, that I am come to Jotunheim to fight and conquer such evil giants as you are, and, little as you think me, I am ready to try my strength against yours. Try it, then, said the giant. And Thor, without another word, threw Mjolnir at his head. 
Ah, ah, said the giant, did a leaf touch me? Again Thor seized Mjolnir, which always returned to his hand, however far he cast it from him, and threw it with all his force. The giant put up his hand to his forehead. I think, he said, that an acorn must have fallen on my head. A third time Thor struck a blow, the heaviest that ever fell from the hand of an Asa, but this time the giant laughed out loud. There is surely a bird on that tree, he said, who has let a feather fall on my face. Then, without taking any further notice of Thor, he swung an immense wallet over his shoulder, and, turning his back upon him, struck into a path that led from the forest. When he had gone a little way, he looked round, his immense face appearing less like a human countenance than some strange, uncouthly shaped stone toppling on a mountain precipice. Ving Thor, he said, let me give you a piece of good advice before I go. When you get to Utgard, don't make much of yourself. You think me a tall man, but you have taller still to see, and you yourself are a very little mannequin. Turn back home, whence you came, and be satisfied to have learned something of yourself by your journey to Jotunheim. Mannequin or not, that I will never do, shouted Aza Thor after the giant. We will meet again, and something more we will learn or teach each other. The giant, however, did not turn back to answer, and Thor and his companions, after looking for some time after him, resumed their journey. But before the sun was quite high in the heavens, they came out of the forest, and at noon they found themselves on a vast barren plain, where stood a great city, whose walls of dark rough stone were so high that Thor had to bend his head quite far back to see the top of them. When they approached the entrance of the city, they found that the gates were closed and barred, but the space between the bars was so large that Thor passed through easily, and his companions followed him. The streets of the city were gloomy and still. They walked on for some time without meeting anyone, but at length they came to a very high building, of which the gates stood open. Let us go in and see what is going on here, said Thor, and they went. After crossing the threshold, they found themselves in an immense banqueting hall. The table stretched from one end to the other of it. Stone thrones stood round the table, and on every throne sat a giant, each one, as Thor glanced round, appearing more grim and cold and stony than the rest. One among them sat on a raised seat, and appeared to be the chief. So to him Thor approached, and paid his greetings. The giant chief just glanced at him, and without rising said, in a somewhat careless manner, It is, I think, a foolish custom to tease tired travellers with questions about their journey. I know without asking that you, little fellow, are Asa Thor. Perhaps, however, you may be in reality taller than you appear and as it is a rule here that no one shall sit down to table till he has performed some wonderful feat, let us hear what you and your followers are famed for, and in what way you choose to prove yourselves worthy to sit down in the company of giants. At this speech, Loki, who had entered the hall cautiously behind Thor, pushed himself forward. The feat for which I am most famed, he said, is eating, and it is one which I am just now inclined to perform with right good will. Put food before me, and let me see if any of your followers can dispatch it as quickly as I can. The feat you speak of is one by no means to be despised, said the Utgard king, and there is one here who would be glad to try his powers against yours. Let Logi, he said to one of his followers, be summoned to the hall. At this, a tall, thin, yellow-faced man approached, and a large trough of meat having been placed in the middle of the hall, Loki sat to work at one end, and Logi at the other, and they began to eat. I hope I shall never see anyone eat as they ate, but the giants all turned their slow-moving eyes to watch them, and in a few minutes they met in the middle of the trough. It seemed, at first, as if they had both eaten exactly the same quantity, but when the thing came to be examined into, it was found that Loki had, indeed, eaten up all the meat, but that Logi had also eaten the bones and the trough. 
Then the giants nodded their huge heads, and determined that Loki was conquered. King Utgard now turned to Thialfi, and asked what he could do. I was thought swift of foot among the youth of my own country, answered Thialfi, and I will, if you please, try to run a race with any one here. You have chosen a noble sport indeed, said the king, but you must be a good runner if you could beat him with whom I shall match you. Then he called a slender lad, Hugi by name, and the whole company left the hall, and going out by an opposite gate to that by which Thor had entered, they came out to an open space, which made a noble race ground. There the goal was fixed, and Thialfi and Hugi started off together. Thialfi ran fast, fast as the reindeer which hears the wolves howling behind. But Hugi ran so much faster that, passing the goal, he turned round and met Thialfi halfway in the course. Try again, Thialfi, cried the king, and Thialfi, once more taking his place, flew along the course, with feet scarcely touching the ground, swiftly as an eagle, when, from his mountain crag, he swoons on his prey in the valley but with all his running he was still a good bow shot from the goal when Hugi reached it. "'You are certainly a good runner,' said the king. "'But if you mean to win, you must do a little better still than this. But perhaps you wish to surprise us all the more this third time.' The third time, however, the Alfie was wearied, and though he did his best, Hugi, having reached the goal, turned and met him not far from the starting point. The giants again looked at each other, and declared that there was no need for further trial, for that Thialfi was conquered. It was now Asa Thor's turn, and all the company looked eagerly at him, while the Utgard king asked by what wonderful feat he chose to distinguish himself. "'I will try a drinking match with any of you,' Thor said shortly, for, to tell the truth, he cared not to perform anything very worthy, in the company in which he found himself. King Utgard appeared pleased with this choice, and when the giants had resumed their seats in the hall, he ordered one of his servants to bring in his drinking cup, called the Cup of Penance, which it was his custom to make his guests drain at a draught, if they had broken any of the ancient rules of the society. There, he said, handing it to Thor, we call it well drunk if a person empties it at a single draught, some, indeed, take two to it, but the very puniest can manage it in three. Thor looked into the cup. It appeared to him long, but not so very large, after all. And being thirsty, he put it to his lips, and thought to make short work of it, and empty it at one good, hearty pull. He drank and put the cup down again, but, instead of being empty, it was now just so full that it could be moved without danger of spilling. Ha-ha! <laughs> you are keeping all your strength for the second pull, I see, said Utgard, looking in. Without answering, Thor lifted the cup again, and drank with all his might till his breath failed. But when he put down the cup, the liquor had only sunk down a little from the brim. If you mean to take three draughts through it, said Utgard, you are really leaving yourself a very unfair share for the last time. Look to yourself, winged Thor, for if you do not acquit yourself better in other feats, we shall not think so much of you here as they say the Aesir do in Asgard. At this speech, Thor fell angry, and, seizing the cup again, he drank a third time, deeper and longer than he had yet done. But when he looked into the cup, he saw that a very small part only of its contents had disappeared. Weird and disappointed, he put the cup down, and said he would try no more to empty it. "'It is pretty plain,' said the king, looking round on the company, "'that Aza Thor is by no means the kind of man we always supposed him to be.' "'Nay,' said Thor, "'I am willing to try another feat, and you yourselves shall choose what it shall be.' "'Well,' said the king, "'there is a game at which our children are used to play.' A short time ago I dare not have named it to Aza Thor, but now I am curious to see how he will acquit himself in it. It is merely to lift my cat from the ground. 
A Childish Amusement Truly As he spoke, a large grey cat sprang into the hall, and Thor, stooping forward, put his hand under it to lift it up. He tried gently at first, but by degrees he put forth all his strength, tugging and straining as he had never done before. But the utmost he could do was to raise one of the cat's paws a little way from the ground. "'It is just as I thought,' said King Utgard, looking round with a smile. "'But we are all willing to allow that the cat is large, and Thor but a little fellow. "'Little as you think me,' cried Thor, "'who is there who will dare to wrestle with me in my anger?' "'In truth,' said the king, "'I don't think there is any one here who would choose to wrestle with you. "'But if wrestle you must, I will call in that old crone Ellie.' She has, in her time, laid low many a better man than Asa Thor has shown himself to be. The crone came. She was old, withered, and toothless, and Thor shrank from the thought of wrestling with her, but he had no choice. She threw her arms round him, and drew him toward the ground, and the harder he tried to free himself, the tighter grew her grasp. They struggled long. Thor strove bravely, but a strange feeling of weakness and weariness came over him, and at length he tottered and fell down on one knee before her. At this sight all the giants laughed aloud, and Utgard coming up desired the old woman to leave the hall, and proclaimed that the trials were over. No one of his followers would now contend with Asa Thor, he said, and night was approaching. He then invited Thor and his companions to sit down at the table, and spent the night with him as his guests. Thor, though feeling somewhat perplexed and mortified, accepted his invitation courteously, and showed by his agreeable behaviour during the evening that he knew how to bear being conquered with the good grace. In the morning, when Thor and his companions were leaving the city, the king himself accompanied them without the gates, and Thor, looking steadily at him when he turned to bid him farewell, perceived for the first time that he was the very same giant Skrymir with whom he had met in the forest. "'Come now, Asa Thor,' said the giant with a strange sort of smile on his face. "'Tell me truly, before you go, how you think your journey has turned out, and whether or not I was right in saying that you would meet with better men than yourself in Jotunheim.' "'I confess freely,' answered Asa Thor, looking up without any false shame on his face that I have acquitted myself but humbly, and it grieves me, for I know that in Jotunheim henceforth it will be said that I am a man of little worth. By my troth, no, cried the giant heartily. Never should you have come into my city if I had known what a mighty man of valour you really are, and now that you are safely out of it, I will, for once, tell the truth to you, Thor. All this time I have been deceiving you by my enchantments. When you met me in the forest, and hurled Mjolnir at my head, I should have been crushed by the weight of your blows, had I not skilfully placed a mountain between myself and you, on which the strokes of your hammer fell, and where you cleft three deep ravines, which shall henceforth become verdant valleys. In the same manner, I deceived you about the contests in which you engaged last night. When Loki and Logi sat down before the trough, Loki, indeed, ate like hunger itself, but Logi is fire, who, with eager, consuming tongue, licked up both bones and trough. The Alfi is the swiftest of mortal runners, but the slender lad, Hugi, was my thought, and what speed can ever equal his? So it was in your own trials. When you took such deep draughts from the horn, you little knew what a wonderful feat you were performing. The other end of that horn reached the ocean, and when you come to the shore you will see how far its waters have fallen away and how much the deep sea itself has been diminished by your draught. Hereafter, men watching the going out of the tide will call it the ebb, or a draught of Thor. Scarcely less wonderful was the prowess you displayed in the second trial. What appeared to you to be a cat was, in reality, the Midgard serpent which encircles the world. When we saw you succeed in moving it, we trembled, lest the very foundations of earth and sea should be shaken by your strength. Nor need you be ashamed of having been overthrown by the old woman Ellie, for she is old age, 
and there never has and never will be one whom she has not the power to lay low we must now part and you had better not come here again or attempt anything further against my city for i shall always defend it by fresh enchantments and you will never be able to do anything against me at these words thor raised mjolnir and was about to challenge the giant to a fresh trial of strength but before he could speak utgard vanished from his sight and turning round to look for the city he found that it too had disappeared and that he was standing alone on a smooth green empty plain what a fool i have been said asa thor aloud to allow myself to be deceived by a mountain giant ah answered a voice from above i told you you would learn to know yourself better by your journey to jotunheim it is the great use of travelling thor turned quickly round again thinking to see skrymir behind him but after looking on every side he could perceive nothing but that a high cloud-capped mountain which he had noticed on the horizon appeared to have advanced to the edge of the plain End of chapter 1, part 4. Recording by phone. Chapter 1, part 5 of Junior Classics, volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, volume 2. Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton Stories from the Northern Sagas Part 5 How Thor's Hammer Was Lost and Found By E. M. Wilmot Buxton Most precious in the eyes of Thor was his magic hammer, Mjolnir, of which even the mighty frost giants stood in dread. Always he laid it by his side when he went to rest, and always it was the first thing for which his hand was outstretched when he awoke. Judge, then, of his horror and dismay when, on opening his eyes one morning, the hammer was nowhere to be seen. Starting up with a roar of rage, Thor commenced to search everywhere for the missing weapon. Up and down his wonderful palace, built of the thunder clouds, he tramped, with a noise that shook the whole city of Asgard. But the hammer was not to be found. Then he called upon golden-haired Sif, his wife, and bade her help in the search, and still the hammer was nowhere to be seen. It was clear that someone must have stolen it, and, when he realized this, Thor's wrath broke all bounds. His bristling red hair and beard stood up on end, and from them flew a whole volley of fiery sparks. Presently, as the angry Asa was shaking the palace with his thunderous voice, Red Loki came along to inquire into the trouble. He was not likely to sympathize with Thor, but, always brimful of curiosity, he loved to have a part in everything that happened. "'What's the matter, Asa Thor?' said he, and Thor replied, lowering his voice as he spoke, for he did not want his loss to be too widely known. "'Now listen to what I tell thee, Loki. Tis a thing which is known neither on earth below nor in heaven above.' My hammer's gone. This news was most interesting to Loki, who had long owed Thor a grudge, which he was afraid to pay openly. Ho, ho, said he. Then shall we soon have the giants turning us out of Asgard, brother Thor. Not if you use your wits as you know how, growled Thor, still in a very bad temper. Come, you call yourself a clever fellow. Find out for me who has robbed me of my thunderbolt, my hammer, my mjolnir. Then Loki gave a grin and a wink, and promised to do what he could. Not because he cared for Thor, but because he loved to be of importance, and was, moreover, really frightened as to what might happen to Asgard if the magic hammer was not at hand. It was not long before he noticed that an extraordinary kind of tempest was raging in the regions below. Not an orderly kind of tempest, with first some thunder and then some rain and then a gust of wind or two such as thor was wont to arrange but a mixture of hail and wind and thunder and lightning and rain and snow all raging together in a tremendous muddle so that the earth folk thought the end of the world was come 
This gave Loki a hint, and he began to peer about between the clouds, until at length he saw that the trouble was coming from a certain hill which stood in the centre of giant land. Now on the top of this hill lived a certain Thrym, prince of the frost giants, who for a long time past had been very envious of the might of Thor. He had, indeed, done his best to imitate him as far as he could, and had managed to get up a very good imitation of lightning and hail and rain, but he had not been able to manage the thunderbolts, for they could only be made by means of Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. All this was well known to Red Loki, and he was therefore not at all surprised to find that, somehow or other, Thrym must have got hold of the magic weapon, for here were thunderbolts crashing about the earth and sky at a terrible rate. When informed of the discovery, Thorn flew in a still more tremendous rage, and wanted to rush off at once to try conclusions with the giant. But Loki, who loved rather to get a thing by trickery and deceit, persuaded him that violence would never do. Remember, said he, that Thrym with the hammer is much stronger than Thor without it. This is a matter which must be managed by clever wit and craft, not by force and loud talking. Leave, therefore, the whole matter to me. To this, Thor very reluctantly agreed. Then Loki bethought him of some disguise wherein he might visit giant land in safety, for he was not at all anxious to risk his life. He betook himself to the house of maidens, over which ruled Freya, fairest of all in Asgard, she who was wont to shake the spring flowers from her golden locks as she passed over the frozen uplands, leaving behind her a region of green and smiling beauty. Loki found the goddess, and begged the loan of her magic falcon plumes, in which she was wont to flit to and fro over the earth, and when she learned for what purpose he needed them, she gladly assented. Then Loki took the appearance of a great brown bird, and spreading his wings, he flew away toward giant land. It was a long journey, as he already knew, and, although the tempest had now ceased to rage, he found the country of the giants darker and colder and drearier than ever. The longest journey comes to an end, and at length Loki reached a mountain where sat the giant Thrym, his huge legs dangling to the ground, playing with a puppy as large as an elephant. Perching as near as he dared, Loki gazed at the giant with his bright round eyes, and was wondering how to begin when Thrym, who, at a glance, had seen completely through his disguise, said calmly, in a voice as much as possible like Thor's thunderous roar, "'Oh, ho, Loki, what are you doing so far from Asgard? Are you not afraid, little fellow as you are, to venture alone into our country?' Then Loki, thinking to win his way by flattery, replied, "'Sad indeed it is in Asgard, now that Mjolnir has vanished.' Clever was that one who spirited it away from the fairy side of Thor. Methinks none but you could have done it, O mighty Thrym. Pleased with the compliment to his cleverness, the giant chuckled before admitting, Ay, Loki, the hammer is mine, tis very true, and now men will know who really is the thunderer. Oh well, sighed cunning Loki, some men are strong by reason of their weapons, and some are just as strong without. Small need you have, O mighty Thrym, for hammers, but Thor is not without it. Yet since all the world knows that you are his master, let him have his plaything back, that we may cease to be troubled by his peevish outcry. But though Thrym was as stupid as he was big, he was not to be caught thus. No, no, my little Loki, he said. Mine is the hammer, and deep have I buried it beneath the bottom of the sea. Go, tell this to your Aza folk, and say to them that I will give it back on one condition only, and that is that they send me Freya, the fairest of maidens, to be my wife. At this suggestion Loki could scarcely keep from laughing, for the idea of sending the beautiful Freya, the joy and the light of Asgard, to be the wife of this ill-favoured frost giant was too absurd for words. It was not much to him, however, what happened to any one except himself, so he hastened to reply, Be sure, O Thrym, that everything I can do to further the matter shall be done, and if Freya is of the same mind as I, you will soon be welcoming that most sweet maiden to giant land. Farewell. 
So saying, he spread his brown wings and flew back to Asgard, delighted to think of the mischief he could now set brewing. First of all, he visited Thor, and told him of what had passed, and the Thunderer, when he heard of Thrym's boastful words, was filled with wild wrath and wanted to start off then and there and wrest the hammer from the depths of the sea. But Loki pointed out the difficulties that stood in the way, and, leaving the Aza to ponder over his words, he hurried off to Freya and informed her of Thrym's proposal. The beautiful Freya was walking in her garden, and round her neck she wore her famous necklace of stars. When she heard Loki's suggestion that she should wed a hideous giant, she fell into such a rage that she broke her necklet, and all the stars went falling through the sky so that men cried, See how the stars are shooting! Meantime, the Aza folk had met together to consider all that had happened, and, having calmed the fury of Thor, they pointed out to him that Asgard stood in the gravest danger of an attack, which would find them quite unprotected. When they had said this several times over, Thor began to weary of the subject, and he replied with great surliness, Very well, then. Let Freya go to Thrym as his wife, and then shall we be as before, with Mjolnir to defend us. When Freya heard this, her rage turned to tears and lamentations, and she declared that it would be death to her to send her to the gloomy halls of Giantland, when she could never hope to revisit the flowery meads and grassy slopes of Asgard. And the Aesas, unable to bear the sight of her grief, with one voice declared that they would never spare her from the home of bliss. Then there stepped forward Heimdall, the watchman who sits on guard over the rainbow bridge by night and day. Now Heimdall had the gift of seeing into the future, and the Aesas were always ready to hear his words, well knowing them to be wise. My plan is this, said he. Let Thor bore the clothes of Freya, and put a thick veil over his face, and let him go thus to Thrym's castle and pass for his bride, and if he cannot by some means manage to get hold of the hammer when he is there, why, he must give it up altogether. At this suggestion the Aesas clapped their hands with approval, all indeed save Thor, who looked most glum, and was extremely unwilling to agree to the plan. Dress me as a bride, he grumbled. A pretty maiden I shall make. Ready enough am I to fight, but I will not make myself a laughing stock if I know it. But the Aesas besought him to give way, while Loki twitted him with cowardice. Fair Freya, too, appealed with tearful eyes, and so at length, with great reluctance, the Thunderer agreed to do what they wished. Fortunately, the maiden Freya was very tall, but even so it was with some difficulty that they managed to cover the burly form of Thor with her robes. He insisted, moreover, upon wearing his own shirt of mail and his girdle of strength, and these took much drapery to hide. Great was the laughter in the halls of Asgard that night, as the battle maidens brushed and curled Thor's long yellow hair and set a jeweled headdress upon it. And finally, when the maidens proceeded to cover up his thick beard and angry eyes with a silken veil, the mirth of the Aesas was unrestrained. To complete the disguise, the maidens hung round his neck the famous necklet, which had now been restrung, and finally Frigga, the wife of old father Odin, secured at his girdle the great bunch of keys proper to brides at a wedding in the Northland. While this was being done, Loki, more than all, had been convulsed with merriment at the success of his mischief-making. The very sight of Thor's disgusted looks, and of his great hands clenched with rage under the delicate veil, nearly killed him with laughter, and when all was ready he declared himself unable to lose an atom of the fun in store. "'Let me go with you,' he implored. "'See, I will dress myself as your handmaiden. Ah, oh, you had better agree.' for without me to prompt you, you will never play your part. So Loki was dressed as a waiting maid, and took his seat very demurely by the side of Thor in the goat car. Loud was the laughter in Asgard as the Aesas watched the two drive off together, and heard the roar of the thunderous voice issuing from the folds of a meek maiden's veil as he urged his goats upon their course. 
Long and stormy was that ride to Giant Land, for Thor was still in the worst of tempers, and drove his chariot so furiously that the mountains crashed, the earth stood in flames, as the hoofs of the goats clattered over mountains and waters, striking sparks wherever they touched the rock. Thrym was much overjoyed when he heard that a chariot containing the two maidens was approaching his door. Away ran his servants in different directions, some with orders to make ready a grand banquet, some to prepare the chamber of the bride, some to receive her at the door. The giant himself assisted them to alight, and looked with admiration at the stately figure of his bride, but he made no attempt to see her face, since it is the custom in the Northland for the bride to remain veiled until the marriage has been completed. A bride worthy of a giant, murmured his servants, as he led her to a lofty seat beside his own great throne of gold. And they looked with approval also on the bosom form of the waiting maid, who stood, closely veiled, behind her mistress's chair. Now the journey had been long and cold, and it was with joy that the newcomers noticed that the preparations for the banquet were complete, for they were exceedingly hungry. The giants are huge eaters, and they gathered round the board whereon were displayed an enormous ox roasted whole, a vast dish of salmon, and various other dainties. But because the bride was a woman, and modest withal, they brought her tiny morsels on a dainty golden plate. This was too much for Thor, who had always possessed a most healthy appetite, and was now more than usually ready for his supper. Gradually drawing nearer to the table, while the others were busy with the meal, he managed to get hold of the dish of roasted ox, and within a few minutes the whole of the animal had disappeared. Then he put out his hand to the platter of salmon, and in eighth mouthfuls disposed of eighth of the great fish. After this he noticed a large plate full of cakes and sweetmeats, which was set apart for the ladies of the party. Of these two he made short work. Finally, feeling thirsty after his huge meal, he took up two barrels of mead and tossed them off, one after another, down his capacious throat. Then he sat back on his chair with a sigh of deep content. These proceedings had been watched by Loki with uneasiness, but by Thrym with open-mouthed dismay. Was this the usual appetite of this dainty maiden, who had eaten more than the company of giants? But Loki bent toward him, and whispered in his ear that the thought of marrying had so excited Freya that she had eaten nothing for eight days, and had therefore been on the point of starvation. This reassured the giant, and being now himself filled with mead, he drew nearer and, lifting a corner of the veil, tried to kiss the cheek of his future bride. But Thor, who was longing to be at close grips with him, threw him such a fiery glance that he drew quickly back, saying, Why does fair Freya's eye burn like a spark from a furnace? Pooh, whispered Loki again, that is nothing but her love for you, which for eight days has raged like a flaming fire. This news was still more pleasant to hear, and Thrym, in high good humour, cried, Bring in the hammer, my wedding gift, wherewith to plight the maid, for when I have laid it on her lap she will be my own forever, and together we will work dire evil against the Aza folk, whom I hate with all my heart. What was that unmaidenly sound that issued from under the silken veil at those words? But though Loki turned pale to hear it, Thrym, busy sending for the hammer, did not pay any heed. Back came the giant servants at length, bending under the weight of Mjolnir, and as they bowed before the silent maiden, sitting with meekly bent head upon the throne, Thrym cried with a merry jest, See, here is little Thor's tiny plaything, a pretty toy truly for his feeble hands. Take it, fair Freya, as my wedding gift. And take that as mine, roared Thor, in a voice of thunder, as he flung off the veil and rose to his full height, and with the words he swung the hammer once, and ere the eye could follow its movement it had crashed through Thrym's skull, and had knocked over a round dozen of his guests. Yet again did it swing in the Aza's hand, and this time it left not a giant standing in the hall. A third time it was swung, 
and on this occasion the roof and walls of the palace came tumbling on every side and only thor and loki were left alive amid the ruins ha ha laughed red loki that was neatly done fair freya thor who was now busily tearing off the hated robes and veil stayed to look threateningly at his companion no more of that loki said he the thing had to be done tis true but talk not to me again of this woman's work we will remember only that i am the thunderer and that my hammer that was lost is found so they drove back peacefully to asgard and this is the end of the tale of how thor's hammer was lost and found end of chapter 1 part 5 recording by phone Chapter 1, Part 6 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Stories from the Northern Sagas. Iduna's Apples of Youth by a and e carey one reflections in the water of all the groves and gardens round the city of asgard and there were many and beautiful there was none so beautiful as the one where iduna the wife of bragi lived it stood on the south side of the hill not far from gladsheim and it was called always young because nothing that grew there could ever decay or become the least bit older than it was on the day when Iduna entered it. The trees were always a tender light green colour, as the hedges do in spring. The flowers were mostly half opened, and every blade of grass bore always a trembling glittering drop of early dew. Brisk little winds wandered about the grove, making the leaves dance from morning till night, and swaying backwards and forwards the heads of the flowers. Blow away, said the leaves to the wind, for we shall never be tired. And you will never be old, said the winds in answer. And then the birds took up the chorus and sang, Never tired and never old. Iduna, the mistress of the grove, was fit to live among young birds and tender leaves and spring flowers. She was so fair that when she bent over the river to entice her swans to come to her, even the stupid fish stood still in the water, afraid to destroy so beautiful an image by swimming over it. And when she held out her hand with bread for the swans to eat, you would not have known it from a water lily. It was so wonderfully white. Iduna never left her grove even to pay a visit to her nearest neighbor, and yet she did not lead by any means a dull life. For besides having the company of her husband, Bragi, who must have been an entertaining person to live with, for he is said to have known a story which never came to an end, and yet which never grew wearisome. All the heroes of Asgard made a point of coming to call upon her every day. It was natural enough that they should like to visit so beautiful a grove, and so fair a lady. And yet, to confess the truth, it was not quite to see either the grove or Iduna that they came. Iduna herself was well aware of this, and when her visitors had chatted a short time with her, she never failed to bring out from the innermost recess of her bower a certain golden casket, and to request as a favour that her guests would not think of going away till they had tasted her apples, which, she flattered herself, had a better flavour than any other fruit in the world. It would have been quite unlike a hero of Asgard to have refused such courtesy, and besides, Iduna was not as far wrong about her apples as hostesses generally are, when they boast of the good things on their tables. There is no doubt her apples had a peculiar flavour, and if any one of the heroes happened to be a little tired, or a little out of spirits, or a little cross, when he came into the bower, it always followed that, as soon as he had eaten one apple, he found himself as fresh and vigorous and happy as he had ever been in his life. So fond were the heroes of these apples, and so necessary did they think them to their daily comfort, that they never went on a journey without requesting Iduna to give them one or two, 
to fortify them against the fatigues of the way. Iduna had no difficulty in complying with this request. She had no fear of her store ever failing, for as surely as she took an apple from her casket, another fell in. But where it came from, Iduna could never discover. She never saw it till it was close to the bottom of the casket, but she always heard the sweet tinkling sound it made when it touched the golden rim. It was as good as play to stand by her casket, taking the apples out, and watching the fresh rosy ones come tumbling in, without knowing who threw them. One spring morning, Iduna was very busy taking apples out of her casket, for several of the heroes were taking advantage of the fine weather to journey out into the world. Bragi was going from home for a time. Perhaps he was tired of telling his story only to Iduna, and perhaps she was beginning to know it by heart. And Odin, Loki, and Hönir had agreed to take a little tour in the direction of Jotunheim, just to see if any entertaining adventure would befall them. When they had all received their apples, and taken a tender farewell of Iduna, the grove, green and fair as it was, looked, perhaps, a little solitary. Iduna stood by her fountain, watching the bright water as it danced up into the air and quivered, and turned, and fell back, making a hundred little flashing circles in the river. And then she grew tired, for once, of the light and the noise, and wandered down to a still place, where the river was shaded by low bushes on each side and reflected clearly the blue sky overhead. Iduna sat down and looked into the deep water. Besides her own fair face, there were little wandering white clouds to be seen reflected there. She counted them as they sailed past. At length, a strange form was reflected up to her from the water. Large, dark, lowering wings, pointed claws, a head with fierce eyes, looking at her. Iduna started and raised her head. It was above as well as below, the same wings, the same eyes, the same head, looking down from the blue sky, as well as up from the water. Such a sight had never been seen near Asgard before, and while Iduna looked, the thing waved its wings, and went up, 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 till it lessened to a dark spot in the clouds and on the river. It was no longer terrible to look at, but, as it shook its wings, a number of little black feathers fell from them, and flew down toward the grove. As they neared the trees, they no longer looked like feathers. Each had two independent wings and a head of its own. They were, in fact, a swarm of nervous apprehensions, troublesome little insects enough and well known elsewhere, but which now, for the first time, found their way into the grove. Iduna ran away from them. She shook them off. She fought quite bravely against them. But they are by no means easy to get rid of, and when at last... One crept within the folds of her dress, and twisted itself down to her heart. A new, strange feeling thrilled there, a feeling never yet known to any dweller in Asgard. Iduna did not know what to make of it. 2. The Winged Giant In the meantime, Odin, Loki, and Hrnir proceeded on their journey. They were not bound on any particular quest. They strayed hither and thither that Odin might see that things were going on well in the world, and his subjects comporting themselves in a becoming manner. Every now and then they halted while Odin inspected the thatching of a barn, or stood at the smithy to see how the smith wielded his hammer, or in a furrow to observe if the ploughman guided his ploughshare evenly through the soil. Well done, he said, if the workman was working with all his might, and he turned away, leaving something behind him. A straw in the barn, a piece of old iron at the forge door, a grain in the furrow, nothing to look at, but ever after the barn was always full, the forge fire never went out, the field yielded bountifully. Toward noon, the Aesir reached a shady valley, and, feeling tired and hungry, Odin proposed to sit down under a tree, and while he rested and studied a book of runes which he had with him, he requested Loki and Hrunir to prepare some dinner. I will undertake the meat and the fire, said Hoenir. You, Loki, will like nothing better than foraging about for what good things you can pick up. That is precisely what I mean to do, said Loki. There is a farmhouse near here, from which I can perceive a savoury smell. It will be strange, with my cunning, if I do not contrive to have the best of all the dishes under this tree before your fire is burnt up. As Loki spoke, he turned the stone in his hand, and immediately he assumed the shape of a large black cat. 
In this form, he stole in at the kitchen window of a farmhouse, where a busy housewife was intent on taking pies and cake from a deep oven and ranging them on a dresser under the window. Loki watched his opportunity, and whenever the mistress's back was turned, he whisked the cake or a pie out of the window. One, two, three. Why, there are fewer every time I bring a fresh one from the oven, cried the bewildered housewife. It's that thieving cat. I see the end of her tail on the window sill. Out of the window leaned the housewife to throw a stone at the cat, but she could see nothing but a thin cow trespassing in a garden. And when she ran out with a stick to drive away the cow, it too had vanished, and an old raven with six young ones was flying over the garden hedge. The raven was Loki, the little ones were the pies, and when he reached the valley, he changed himself and them into their proper shapes. He had a hearty laugh at his own cleverness, and at the old woman's dismay. "'Well done, Loki, king of thieves,' said a chorus of foxes, who peeped out of their holes to see the only one of the Aesir whose conduct they could appreciate. But Odin, when he heard of it, was very far from thinking it well done." He was extremely displeased with Loki for having disgraced himself by such mean tricks. It is true, he said, that my subjects may well be glad to furnish me with all I require, but it should be done knowingly. Return to the farmhouse and place these three black stones on the table from whence you stole the provisions. Loki, unwilling as he was to do anything he believed likely to bring good to others, was obliged to obey. He made himself into the shape of a white owl, flew once more through the window, and dropped the stones out of his beak. They sank deep into the table, and looked like three black stains on the white deal board. From that time the housewife led an easy life. There was no need for her to grind corn, or mix dough, or prepare meat. Let her enter her kitchen at what time of day she would. Stores of provisions stood smoking hot on the table. She kept her own counsel about it and enjoyed the reputation of being the most economical housekeeper in the whole countryside. But one thing disturbed her mind, and prevented her thoroughly enjoying the envy and wonder of the neighbouring wives. All the rubbing and brushing and cleaning in the world would not remove the three black stains from her kitchen table, and as she had no cooking to do, she spent the greater part of her time in looking at them. If they were but gone, she said, a hundred times every day, I should be content, but how is one to enjoy one's life when one cannot rub the stains of one's own table? Perhaps Loki foresaw how the good wife would use her gift, for he came back from the farmhouse in the best spirits. We will now, with Father Odin's permission, sit down to dinner, he said, for surely, Brother Hönir, while I have been making so many journeys to and fro, you have been doing something with that fire which I see blazing so fiercely, and with that old iron pot smoking over it. The meat will be by this time ready, no doubt, said Hönir. I killed a wild ox while you were away, and part of it has been now for some time stewing in the pot. The Aesir now seated themselves near the fire, and Hönir lifted up the lid of the pot. A thick steam rose up from it, but when he took out the meat, it was as red and uncooked as when he first put it into the pot. Patience, said Hönir, and Odin again took out his book of runes. Another hour passed, and Hönir again took up the lid, and looked at the meat, but it was in precisely the same state as before. This happened several times, and even the cunning Loki was puzzled, when suddenly a strange noise was heard coming from a tree near, and, looking up, they saw an enormous human-headed eagle seated on one of the branches, and looking at them with two fierce eyes. While they looked, it spoke. "'Give me my share of the feast,' it said." and the meat shall presently be done. "'Come down and take it. It lies before you,' said Loki, while Odin looked on with thoughtful eyes, for he saw plainly that it was no mortal bird who had the boldness to claim a share in the Aesir's food. Undaunted by Odin's majestic looks, the eagle flew down, and seizing a large piece of meat, was going to fly away with it, when Loki, thinking he had now got the bird in his power, took up a stick that lay near, and struck a hard blow on the eagle's back. The stick made a ringing sound as it fell, but when Loki tried to draw it back, he found that it stuck with extraordinary force to the eagle's back. Neither could he withdraw his own hands from the other end. 
Something like a laugh came from the creature's half-human, half birth like mouth, and then it spread its dark wings and rose up into the air, dragging Loki after. "'It is as I thought,' said Odin, as he saw the eagle's enormous bulk brought out against the sky. "'It is Thiassi, the strongest giant in Jotunheim, who has presumed to show himself in our presence. Loki has only received the reward of his treachery.' and it would ill become us to interfere in his behalf. But, as the monster is near, it will be well for us to return to Asgard, lest any misfortune should befall the city in our absence. While Odin spoke, the winged creature had risen up so high as to be invisible even to the eyes of the Aesir, and during their return to Asgard he did not appear again before them. But as they approached the gates of the city, they were surprised to see Loki coming to meet them, he had a crestfallen and bewildered look, and when they questioned him as to what had happened to him, since they parted in such a strange way, he declared himself to be quite unable to give any further account of his adventures, than that he had been carried rapidly through the air by the giant, and at last thrown down from a great height near the place where the Aesir met him. Odin looked steadfastly at him as he spoke, but he forbore to question him further, for he knew well that there was no hope of hearing the truth from Loki, and he kept within his own mind the conviction, he felt, that some disastrous result must follow a meeting between two such evildoers as Loki and the giant Thiassi. That evening, when the Aesir were all feasting and telling stories to each other in the great hall of Valhalla, Loki stole out from Gladsheim, and went alone to visit Iduna in her grove. It was a still, bright evening. The leaves of the trees moved softly up and down, whispering sweet words to each other. The flowers with half-shut eyes nodded sleepily to their own reflections in the water, and Iduna sat by the fountain, with her head resting in one hand, thinking of pleasant things. "'It is all very well,' thought Loki, "'but I am not the happier because people can here live such pleasant lives. It does not do me any good, or cure the pain I have had so long in my heart.' Loki's long shadow, for the sun was setting, fell on the water as he approached, and made Iduna start. She remembered the sight that had disturbed her so much in the morning, but when she saw only Loki, she looked up and smiled kindly, for he had often accompanied the other Aesir in their visits to her grove. "'I am wearied with a long journey,' said Loki abruptly, "'and I would eat one of your apples to refresh me of my fatigue.' The casket stood by Iduna's side, and she immediately put in her hand and gave Loki an apple. To her surprise, instead of thanking her warmly, or beginning to eat it, he turned it round and round in his hand with a contemptuous air. "'It is true, then,' he said, after looking intently at the apple for some time. "'Your apples are but small and withered in comparison. I was unwilling to believe it at first, but now I can doubt no longer.' "'Small and withered,' said Iduna, rising hastily. "'Nay, Aza Odin himself, who has traversed the whole world, "'assures me that he has never seen any to be compared to them.' "'That will never be said again,' returned Loki, "'for this very afternoon I have discovered a tree in a grove not far from Asgard, "'on which grow apples so beautiful that no one who has seen them will ever care again for yours.' I do not wish to see or hear of them, said Iduna, trying to turn away with an indifferent air. But Loki followed her, and continued to speak more and more strongly of the beauty of this new fruit, hinting that Iduna would be sorry that she had refused to listen when she found all her guests deserting her for the new grove, and when even Bragi began to think lightly of her and her gifts. At this Iduna sighed, and Loki came up close to her, and whispered in her ear, it is but a short way from Asgard, and the sun has not yet set. Come out with me, and before any one else has seen the apples, you shall gather them and put them in your casket, and no woman shall ever have it in her power to boast that she can feast the Aesir more sumptuously than Iduna. Now Iduna had often been cautioned by her husband never to let anything tempt her to leave the grove, and she had always been so happy here that she thought there was no use in his telling her the same thing so often over. But now her mind was so full of the wonderfully beautiful fruit, that she felt such a burning wish to get it for herself, that she quite forgot her husband's commands. "'It is only a little way,' she said to herself. 
there can be no harm in going out just this once and as loki went on urging her she took up her basket from the ground hastily and begged him to show her the way to this other grove loki walked very quickly and iduna had not time to collect her thoughts before she found herself at the entrance of always young at the gate she would gladly have stopped a minute to take breath but loki took hold of her hand and forced her to pass through though at the very moment of passing she half drew back for it seemed to her as if all the trees in the grove suddenly called out in alarm come back come back oh come back iduna she half drew back her hand but it was too late the gate fell behind her and she and loki stood together without the grove the trees rose up between them and the setting sun and cast a deep shadow on the place where they stood a cold night air blew on iduna's cheek and made her shiver let us hasten on she said to loki let us hasten on and soon come back again but loki was not looking on he was looking up iduna raised her eyes in the direction of his and her heart died within her for there high up over her head just as she had seen it in the morning hung the lowering dark wings the sharp talons the fierce head looking at her for one moment it stood still above her head and then lower 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 the huge shadow fell and before iduna found breath to speak the dark wings were folded round her and she was borne high up in the air northwards towards the grey mist that hangs over jotunheim loki watched till she was out of sight and then returned to asgard the presence of the giant was no wonder to him for he had in truth purchased his own release by promising to deliver up iduna and her casket into his power but as he returned alone through the grove a foreboding fear pressed on his mind if it should be true he thought that iduna's apples have the wonderful power odin attributes to them if i among the rest should suffer from the loss occupied with these thoughts he passed quickly among the trees keeping his eyes resolutely fixed on the ground he dare not trust himself to look around for once when he had raised his head he fancied that gliding through the brushwood he had seen the dark robes and pale face of his daughter hela three hela when it was known that iduna had disappeared from her grove there were many sorrowful faces in asgard and anxious voices were heard inquiring for her loki walked about with as grave a face and asked as many questions as any one else but he had a secret fear that became stronger every day that now at last the consequence of his evil ways would find him out days passed on and the looks of care instead of wearing away deepened on the faces of the aesir they met and looked at each other and turned away sighing each saw that some strange change was creeping over all the others and none liked to be the first to speak of it it came on very gradually a little change every day and no day ever passing without the change the leaves of the trees in iduna's grove deepened in colour they first became a sombre green then a glowing red and at last a pale brown and when the brisk winds came and blew them about they moved every day more languidly let us alone they said at length we are tired 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 the winds surprised carried the new sound to gladsheim and whispered it all round the banquet hall where the aesir sat and then they rushed back again and blew all through the grove we are tired said the leaves again we are tired we are old we are going to die and at the word they broke from the trees one by one and fluttered to the ground glad to rest anywhere and the winds having nothing else to do went back to gladsheim with the last strange word they had learned the aesir were all assembled in valhalla but there were no stories told and no songs sung no one spoke much but loki and he was that day in a talking humour he moved from one to another whispering an unwelcome word in every ear have you noticed your mother frigga he said to baldur do you see how white her hair is growing and what a number of deep lines are printed on her face then he turned to frey look at your sister freya and your friend baldur he said as they sit opposite to us what a change has come over them lately 
who would think that that pale man and that faded woman were balder the beautiful and freya the fair you are tired you are old you are going to die moaned the winds wandering all round the great halls and coming in and out of the hundred doorways and all the aesir looked up at the sad sound then they saw for the first time that a new guest had seated herself that day at the table of the aesir there could be no question of her fitness on the score of royalty for a crown rested on her brow and in her hand she held a sceptre but the fingers that grasped the sceptre were white and fleshless and under the crown looked the threatening face of hela half corpse half queen a great fear fell on all the aesir as they looked and only odin found voice to speak to her dreadful daughter of loki he said by what warrant do you dare to leave the kingdom where i permit you to reign and come to take your place among the aesir who are no mates for such as you then hela raised her bony finger and pointed one by one to the guests that sat round white hair she said wrinkled faces weary limbs dull eyes these are the warrants which have summoned me from the land of shadows to sit among the aesir i have come to claim you by these signs as my future guests and to tell you that i am preparing a place for you in my kingdom at every word she spoke a gust of icy wind came from her mouth and froze the blood in the listener's veins if she had stayed a moment longer they would have stiffened into stone but when she had spoken thus she rose and left the hall and the sighing winds went out with her then after a long silence bragi stood up and spoke aesir he said we are to blame it is now many months since iduna was carried away from us we have mourned for her but we have not yet avenged her loss since she left us a strange weariness and despair have come over us and we sit looking on each other as if we had ceased to be warriors in aesir it is plain that unless iduna returns we are lost let two of us journey to the urda found which we have so long neglected to visit and acquire of her from the norns for they know all things and then when we have learned where she is we will fight for her liberty if need be till we die for that will be an end more fitting for us than to sit here and wither away under the breath of hela at these words of bragi the Aesir felt a revival of their old strength and courage. Odin approved of Brage's proposal, and agreed that he and Baldur should undertake the journey to the dwelling place of the Norns. That very evening they set forth, for Hela's visit showed them that they had no time to lose. It was a weary time to the dwellers in Asgard while they were absent. Two new citizens had taken up their abode in the city, age and pain. They walked the streets hand in hand, and there was no use in shutting the doors against them for however closely the entrance was barred the dwellers in the houses felt them as they passed four through flood and fire at length baldur and bragi returned with the answer of the norns couched in mystic words which odin alone could understand it revealed loki's treacherous conduct to the aesir and declared that iduna could only be brought back by loki who must go in search of her clothed in freya's garments of falcon feathers loki was very unwilling to venture on such a search but thor threatened him with instant death if he refused to obey odin's commands or failed to bring back iduna and for his own safety he was obliged to allow freya to fasten the falcon wings to his shoulders and set off towards the Asi's castle in jotunheim where he well knew that iduna was imprisoned it was called a castle but it was in reality a hollow in a dark rock the sea broke against two sides of it and above the sea birds clamoured day and night there the giant had taken iduna on the night on which she had left her grove and fearing lest odin should spy her from air throne he had shut her up in a gloomy chamber and strictly forbidden her ever to come out it was hard to be shut up from the fresh air and sunshine and yet perhaps it was safer for iduna than if she had been allowed to wander about jotunheim and see the monstrous sights that would have met her there she saw nothing but thiassi himself and his servants whom he had commanded to attend upon her and they being curious to see a stranger from a distant land 
came in and out many times every day. They were fair, Iduna saw, fair and smiling, and at first it relieved her to see such pleasant faces around her, when she had expected something horrible. Pity me, she used to say to them, pity me, I have been torn away from my home and my husband, and I see no hope of ever getting back. And she looked earnestly at them, but their pleasant faces never changed, and there was always, however bitterly Iduna might be weeping, the same smile on their lips. At length, Iduna, looking more narrowly at them, saw, when they turned their backs to her, that they were hollow behind. They were, in truth, L women, who have no hearts, and can never pity any one. After Iduna saw this, she looked no more at their smiling faces, but turned away her head and wept silently. It is very sad to live among L women when one is in trouble. Every day the giant came and thundered at Iduna's door. Have you made up your mind yet, he used to say, to give me the apples? Something dreadful will happen to you if you take much longer to think of it. Iduna trembled very much every day, but still she had strength to say, No, for she knew that the most dreadful thing would be for her to give a wicked giant the gifts that had been entrusted to her for the use of the Aesir. The giant would have taken the apples by force if he could, but whenever he put his hand into the casket, the fruit slipped from beneath his fingers, shriveled into the size of a pea, and hid itself in the crevices of the casket where his great fingers could not come. Only when Iduda's little white hand touched it, it swelled again to its own size, and this she would never do while the giant was with her. So the days passed on, and Iduna would have died of grief among the smiling elf woman if it had not been for the moaning sound of the sea and the wild cry of the birds. For however others may smile, these pity me, she used to say, and it was like music to her. One morning, when she knew that the giant had gone out, and when the L woman had left her alone, she stood for a long time at her window by the sea, watching the mermaids floating up and down on the waves, and looked at heaven with their sad blue eyes. She knew that they were mourning because they had no souls, and she thought within herself that even in prison it was better to belong to the Aesir than to be a mermaid or an L woman, were they ever so free or happy. While she was still occupied with these thoughts, she heard her name spoken, and a bird with large wings flew in at the window, and smoothing its feathers, stood upright before her. It was Loki, in Freya's garment of feathers, and he made her understand in a moment that he had come to set her free, and that there was no time to lose. He told her to conceal her casket carefully in her bosom, and then he said a few words over her, and she found herself changed into a sparrow, with the casket fastened among the feathers of her breast. Then Loki spread his wings once more, and flew out of the window, and Iduna followed him. The sea wind blew cold and rough, and her little wings fluttered with fear, but she struck them bravely out into the air, and flew like an arrow over the water. This way lies Asgard, cried Loki, and the word gave her strength. But they had not gone far when a sound was heard above the sea, and the wind and the call of the seabirds. The Asi had put on his eagle plumage, and was flying after them. For five days and five nights the three flew over the water that divides Jotunheim from Asgard, and at the end of every day they were closer together, for the giant was gaining on the other two. All the five days the dwellers in Asgard stood on the walls of the city watching. On the sixth evening they saw a falcon and a sparrow, closely pursued by an eagle, flying towards Asgard. There will not be time, said Bragi, who had been calculating the speed at which they flew. The eagle will reach them before they can get into the city. But Odin desired the fire to be lighted upon the walls, and Thor and Tyr, with what strength remained to them, tore up the trees from the groves and gardens, and made a rampart of fire all round the city. The light of the fire showed Iduna her husband and her friends waiting for her. She made one last effort, and, rising high up in the air above the flames and smoke, she passed the walls, and dropped down safely at the foot of Odin's throne. The giant tried to follow, but, wary with his long flight, he was unable to raise his enormous bulk sufficiently high in the air. The flames scorched his wings as he flew through them, and he fell among the flaming piles of wood, and was burned to death. How Iduna feasted the Aesir on her apples, 
how they grew young and beautiful again, and how spring and green leaves and music came back to the grove, I must leave you to imagine, for I have made my story long enough already, and if I say any more, you will fancy that it is Bragi who has come among you, and that he has entered on his endless story. End of chapter 1, part 6「Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton Stories from the Northern Sagas Part 7 How the Fenris Wolf Was Chained by E. M. Wilmot Buxton. Fair as were the meads of Asgard, we have seen that the Asa folk were fond of wandering far afield in other regions. Most restless of all was Red Loki, that cunning fellow who was always bringing trouble upon himself, or upon his kindred. And because he loved evil, he would often betake himself to the gloomy halls of Giantland and mingle with the wicked folk of that region. Now one day he met a hideous giantess named Angur Boda. This creature had a heart of ice, and because he loved ugliness and evil, she had a great attraction for him, and in the end he married her, and they lived together in a horrible cave in giant land. Three children were born to Loki and Angur Boda in this dread abode, and they were even more terrible in appearance than their mother. The first was an immense wolf called Fenris, with a huge mouth filled with long white teeth, which he was constantly gnashing together. The second was a wicked-looking serpent with a fiery red tongue lolling from its mouth. The third was a hideous giantess, partly blue and partly flesh color, whose name was Hela. No sooner were these three terrible children born than all the wise men of the earth began to foretell the misery they would bring upon the Aza folk. In vain did Loki try to keep them hidden within the cave wherein their mother dwelt. They soon grew so immense in size that no dwelling would contain them, and all the world began to talk of their frightful appearance. It was not long, of course, before all father Odin, from his high seat in Asgard, heard of the children of Loki. So he sent for some of the Asas, and said, Much evil will come upon us, O oh, my children, from this giant bread if we defend not ourselves against them. For their mother will teach them wickedness, and still more quickly will they learn the cunning wiles of their father. Fetch me them here, therefore, that I may deal with them forthwith. So, after somewhat of a struggle, the Asas captured the three giant children and brought them before Odin's judgment seat. Then Odin looked first at Hela, and when he saw her gloomy eyes full of misery and despair, he was sorry and dealt kindly with her, saying, Thou art the bringer of pain to man, and Asgard is no place for such as thou. But I will make thee ruler of the mist home, and there shalt thou rule over that enlightened world, the region of the dead. Forthwith he sent her away over rough roads to the cold dark region of the north called the mist home. And there did Hela rule over a grim crew, for all those who had done wickedness in the world above were imprisoned by her in those gloomy regions. To her came also all those who had died, not on the battlefield, but of old age or disease. And though these were treated kindly enough, theirs was a joyless life in comparison with that of the dead warriors, who were feasting and fighting in the halls of Valhalla, under the kindly rule of Allfather Odin. Having thus disposed of Hela, Odin next turned his attention to the serpent, and when he saw his evil tongue and cunning wicked eyes, he said, Thou art he who bringest sin into the world of men, therefore the ocean shall be thy home for ever. Then he threw that horrid serpent into the deep sea which surrounds all lands, and there the creature grew so fast that when he stretched himself one day, he encircled all the earth, and held his own tail fast in his mouth. And sometimes he grew angry to think that he, the son of a god, 
had thus been cast out, and at those times he would writhe with his huge body and lash his tail till the sea spouted up to the sky. And when that happened, the men of the north said that a great tempest is raging. But it was only the serpent son of Loki writhing in his wrath. Then Odin turned to the third child, and behold, the Fenris wolf was so appalling to look upon that Odin feared to cast him forth, and he decided to endeavor to tame him by kindness, so that he should not wish them ill. But when he bade them carry food to the Fenris wolf, not one of the Aesas would do so, for they feared a snap from his great jaws. Only the brave Tyr had courage enough to feed him and the wolf ate so much and so fast that the business took him all his time. Meantime, too, the Fenris grew so rapidly and became so fierce that the gods were compelled to take counsel and consider how they should get rid of him. They remembered that it would make their peaceful halls unholy if they were to slay him, so they resolved instead to bind him fast, that he should be unable to do them harm. So those of the Aesir folk who were clever smiths set to work and made a very strong thick chain, and when it was finished they carried it out to the yard where the wolf dwelt, and said to him, as though in jest, Here is a fine proof of thy boasted strength, O Fenris. Let us bind this about thee, that we may see if thou canst break it asunder. Then the wolf gave a great grin with his wide jaw, and came and stood still that they might bind the chain about him for he knew what he could do. And it came to pass that directly they had fastened the chain, and had slipped aside from him, the great beast gave himself a shake, and the chain fell about him in little bits. At this the Aesas were much annoyed, but they tried not to show it, and praised him for his strength. Then they set to work again upon a chain much stronger than the last, and brought it to the Fenris wolf, saying, Great will be thy renown, O Fenris, if thou canst break this chain as thou didst the last. But the wolf looked at them askance, for the chain they brought was very much thicker than the one he had already broken. He reflected, however, that since that time he himself had grown stronger and bigger, and moreover that one must risk something in order to win renown. So he let them put the chain upon him, and when the Aesir said that all was ready, he gave a good shake and stretched himself a few times, and again the feathers lay in fragments on the ground. Then the gods began to fear that they would never hold the wolf in bonds, and it was old father Odin who persuaded them to make one more attempt. So they sent a messenger to Dwarfland, bidding him ask the little men to make a chain which nothing could possibly destroy. Setting at once to work, the clever little smiths soon fashioned a slender silken rope, and gave it to the messenger, saying that no strength could break it, and that the more it was strained, the stronger it would become. It was made of the most mysterious things. The sound of a cat's footsteps, the roots of a mountain, the sinews of a bear, the breath of fishes, and other such strange materials which only the dwarfs knew how to use. With this chain, the messenger hastened back over the rainbow bridge to Asgard. By this time, the Fenris wolf had grown too big for his yard, so he lived on a rocky island in the middle of the lake that lies in the midst of Asgard. And here the Aesas now betook themselves with their chain, and began to play their part with wily words. See, they cried, O Fenris, here is a cord so soft and thin that none would think of it binding such strength as thine and they laughed great laughs, and handed it to one another, and tried its strength by pulling at it with all their might, but it did not break. Then they came nearer, and used more wiles, saying, We cannot break the cord, though it is stronger than it looks, but thou, O mighty one, will be able to snap it in a moment. But the wolf tossed his head in scorn, and said, Small renown would there be to me, O Aza folk, if I were to break yon slender string. Save, therefore, your breath, and leave me now alone. Aha! cried the Aesas. Thou fearest the might of the silken cord, thou false one, and that is why thou will not let us bind thee. Not I, said the Fenris wolf, growing rather suspicious. 
but if it is made with craft and guile, it shall never come near my feet. But, said the Aces, thou wilt surely be able to break this silken cord with ease, since thou hast already broken the great iron fetters. To this the wolf made no answer, pretending not to hear. Come, said the Aces again, why shouldst thou fear? For even if thou couldst not break the cord, we would immediately let thee free again. To refuse is a coward's piece of work. Then the wolf gnashed his teeth at them, in anger, and said, Well, I know you, Aces, for if you bind me so fast that I cannot get loose, you will skulk away, and it will be long before I get any help from you, and therefore am I loath to let this band be laid upon me. But still the Aces continued to persuade him, and to twit him with cowardice, until at length the Fenris wolf said, with a sullen growl, have it your own way, then, but as a pledge that this is done without deceit, that one of you lay his hand in my mouth while you are binding me, and afterwards while I try to break the bonds. Then the Asa folk looked at one another in dismay, for they knew very well what this would mean. And while they consulted together, the wolf stood gnashing his teeth at them with a horrid grin. At length, Tear the Brave hesitated no longer. Boldly he stalked up to the wolf and thrust his arm into his enormous mouth, bidding the Aces bind fast the beast. Scarce had they done so, when the wolf began to strain and pull, but the more he did so, the tighter and stiffer the rope became. The gods shouted and laughed with glee, when they saw how all his efforts were in vain. But Tear did not join in their mirth, for the wolf in his rage snapped his great teeth together and bit off his hand at the wrist. Now, when the Aces discovered that the animal was fast bound, they took the chain which was fixed to the rope, and drew it through a huge rock, and fastened this rock deep down in the earth, so that it could never be moved. And this they fastened to another great rock, which was driven still deeper into the ground. When the Fenris wolf found that he had been thus secured, he opened his mouth terribly wide, and twisted himself right and left, and tried his best to bite the Aza folk. He uttered, moreover, such terrible howls that, at length, the gods could bear it no longer. So they took a sword, and thrust it into his mouth, so that the hilt rested on his lower, and to point against his upper jaw. And there he was doomed to remain until the end of all things shall come, when he, freed from the chain, shall range the earth. End of chapter 1, part 7 Recording by film. Chapter 1, Part 8 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Stories from the Northern Sagas, Part 8. The Story of Balder the Beautiful by E. M. Wilmot Buxton Fair beyond all the sons of Odin was Balder the Beautiful, Balder of the snow-white brow and golden locks, and he was well beloved not only by the Asa folk, but also by the men of the earth below. Of all the twelve friend Odin's throne, Balder the Beautiful alone, the sun-god, good and pure and bright, was loved by all, as all love light. Baldur had a twin brother named Hodur, who was born blind. Gloomy and silent was he, but nonetheless he loved his bright sun brother best of all in heaven or earth. The home of Baldur was a place with silver roof and pillars of gold, and nothing unclean or impure was allowed to come inside its doors. Very wise in all magic charms was this radiant young god, and for all others save himself he could read the future but to keep his own life safe and see the sun was not granted to him. Now there came a time when Baldur's bright face grew sad and downcast, and when his father Odin and his mother Frigga perceived this, they implored him to tell them the cause of his grief. Then Baldur told them that he had been troubled by strange dreams, and since 
In those days men believed that dreams were sent as a warning of what was about to happen. He had gone heavily since these visions had come to him. First he had dreamt that a dark cloud had arisen, which came before the sun and shut out all brightness from the land. The next night he dreamt again that Asgard lay in darkness, and that her bright flowers and radiant trees were withered and lifeless, and that the Asa folk, dull and withered also, were sorrowing as though from some great calamity. The third night he dreamt yet again that Asgard was dark and lifeless, and that from out of the gloom one sad voice cried, Woe, 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 for Baldur the Beautiful is dead, is dead. Odin listened to the recital of this story with heavy heart, and at its conclusion he mounted his coal-black horse and rode over many a hard and toilsome road till he came to the dark abode of Hela. And there he saw to his surprise that a great banquet was being prepared in the gloomy hall. Dishes of gold were set upon the table, and all the couches were covered with the richest silken tapestry, as though some honoured guests were expected. But the throne that stood at the head of the table was empty. Very thoughtfully, Odin rode on through these dim halls, till he came to one where dwelt an ancient prophetess, whose voice no man had heard for many a long year. Silent he stood before her, until she asked in a voice that sounded as though it came from far away, "'Who art thou, and from whence dost thou come to trouble my long rest?' Now Odin was fearful that she would not answer him did he give his real name, so he told her that he was the son of Valtum, and asked anxiously for whom the grim goddess of death was preparing her banquet. Then, to his great grief, the hollow voice of the prophetess replied that Baldur was the expected guest, and that he would shortly be sent thither, slain by the hand of Hodur, the blind god of darkness. "'Who, then,' asked Odin, in sorrowful tones, "'shall avenge the death of Baldur?' And she answered that the son of the earth goddess, Vali by name, should neither comb his raven hair, nor wash his visage in the stream, nor see the sun's departing beam, till he on Hodur's course shall smile, flaming on the funeral pile." And learning thus of the fate of his two favourite sons, all father Odin went sadly back to Asgard. Meantime, Mother Frigga had not been idle. Filled with anxiety for her darling son, she decided to send her servants throughout the earth, bidding them exact a promise from all things, not only living creatures, but plants, stones, and metals, fire, water, trees, and diseases of all kinds, that they would do harm in no way to Baldur the Beautiful. Theirs was an easy task, for all things loved the bright sun god, and readily agreed to give the pledge. Nothing was overlooked save only the mistletoe, growing upon the oak tree that shaded the entrance to Valhalla. It seemed so insignificant that no one thought it worth while to ask this plan to take the oath. The servants returned to Frigga with all the vows and compacts that had been made, and the mother of gods and men went back with heart at ease to her spinning wheel. The Asa folk, too, were reassured, and, casting aside the burden of care that had fallen upon them, they resumed their favourite game upon the plains of Eidevold, where they were wont to contend with one another in the throwing of golden discs. And when it became known among them that nothing would hurt Baldur the Beautiful, they invented a new game. Placing the young sun-god in their midst, they would throw stones at him, or thrust at him with their knives, or strike with their wooden staves and the wood or the knife or the stone would glance off from Baldur and leave him quite unhurt. This new game delighted both Baldur and the Aza folk, and so loud was their laughter that Loki, who was some distance away pursuing one of his schemes in the disguise of an old woman, shook with rage at the sound. For Loki was jealous of Baldur, and, as is usual with people who make themselves disliked, nothing gave him such displeasure as to see a group of the Azas on such happy terms with each other. Presently, in his wanderings, Loki passed by the house of Fensalir, in the doorway of which sat Frigga, at her spinning wheel. She did not recognize Red Loki, but greeted him kindly and asked, Old woman, dost thou know why the gods are so merry this evening? And Loki answered, They are casting stones and throwing sharp knives and great clubs at Baldur the Beautiful, who stands smiling in their midst, daring them to hurt him. Then Frigga smiled tranquilly, and turned again to her wheel, saying, 
Let them play on, for no harm will come to him whom all things in heaven and earth have sworn not to hurt. Art thou sure, good mother, that all things in heaven and earth have taken this vow? Aye, indeed, replied Frigga, all save a harmless little plant, the mistletoe, which grows on the oak by Valhalla, and this is far too small and weak to be feared. And to this Loki replied in musing voice, nodding his head as he spoke. Yeah, thou art right, great mother of gods and men. But the wicked Asa had learned what he desired to know. The instrument by which he might bring harm to Baldur the Beautiful was now awaiting him, and he determined to use it to the dire sorrow of Asgard. Hastening to the western gate of Valhalla, he pulled a clump of the mistletoe from the oak, and fashioned therefrom a little wand or stick, and with this in his hand he returned to the plain of Eidevold. He was far too cunning, however, to attempt to carry out his wicked design himself. His malicious heart was too well known to the Asa folk. But he soon found an innocent tool. Leaning against the tree, and taking no part in the game, was Hodur, the blind god, the twin brother of Baldur, and to him he began. Hark to the Asas, how they laugh! Do you take no share in the game, good Hodur? Not I, said Hodur gloomily, for I am blind, and know not where to throw. I could show you that, said Loki, assuming a pleasant tone. "'Tis no hard matter, Hodur, and methinks the Asas will call you proud and haughty if you take no share in the fun. "'But I have nothing to throw,' said poor blind Hodur. "'Then Loki said, "'Here, at least, is a small shaft. "'Twill serve your purpose.' "'And leading innocent Hodur into the ring, he cunningly guided his aim. "'Hodur, well pleased to be able to share in a game with his beloved brother,' boldly sped the shaft, expecting to hear the usual shouts of joyous laughter, which greeted all such attempts. There fell instead dead silence on his ear, and immediately on this followed a wail of bitter agony. For Baldur the Beautiful had fallen dead without a groan, his heart transfixed by the little dart of mistletoe. So on the floor lay Baldur dead, and round lay thickly strewn swords axes darts and spears which all the gods in sport had idly thrown at boulder whom no weapon pierced or clove but in his breast stood fixed the fatal bow of mistletoe which loki the accuser gave to holder and unwitting holder threw against that alone had boulder's life no charm dreading he knew not what holder stood in doubt for some moments but soon the meaning of that bitter wail was borne in upon him piercing the cloud of darkness in which he always moved. He opened wide his arms, as though to clasp the beloved form, and then with, I have slain thee, my brother, despair seized him, and he fell prostrate in utter grief. Meantime, the Asa folk crowded round the silent form of Baldur, weeping and wailing, but, alas, their moans and tears could not bring Baldur back. At length, all father Odin, whose grief was too deep for lamentations, bade them be silent and prepare to bear the body of the dead Asa to the seashore. The unhappy Hodor, unable to take part in these last offices, made his way sadly through Asgard, beyond the walls and along the seashore, until he came to the house Fensalir. Frigate was seated upon her seat of honour before the fire against the inner wall, and standing before her, with bent head and woeful sightless gaze, Hodor told her of the dread mishap that had befallen. Tell me, O oh mother, he cried in ending, and his voice sounded like the wail of the wind on stormy nights. Tell me, is there aught I can do to bring my brother back? Or can I make agreement with the dread mother of the underworld, giving my life in exchange for his? Woe crowded upon woe in the heart of Frigga as she listened to the story. The doom was wrought that she had tried so vainly to avert, and not even her mother's love had availed to safeguard the son so dearly cherished. On Baldur, death had laid her hand, not thee, my son, she said. Yet though we fail in the end, there is much that may be tried before all hope is lost. Then she told Hodor of a road by which the abode of Hela could be reached, one which had been travelled by none living save Odin himself. Who goes that way must take no other horse to ride, but sleep near Odin's horse alone. Nor must he choose that common path of gods, which every day they come and go in heaven, o'er the bridge Bifrost, where his Heimdall's watch. 
but he must tread a dark untravelled road which branches from the north of heaven and ride nine days nine nights towards the northern ice through valleys deep engulfed with roaring streams and he will reach on the tenth morn a bridge which spans with golden arches jewel stream then he will journey through no lighted land nor see the sun arise nor see it set and he must fare across the dismal ice northward until he meets a stretching wall barring his way and in the wall a grate but then he must dismount and on the ice tighten the girths of sleep near odin's horse and make him leap the gate and come within there in that cheerless abode dead balder was enthroned but said frigga he who braves that dread journey must take no heed of him nor of the sad ghosts flitting to and fro like eddying leaves first he must accost their gloomy queen and entreat her with prayers telling her all that grief they have in heaven for balder whom she holds by right below a bitter groan of anguish escaped from hodur when frigga had finished her recital of the trials which must be undergone mother a dreadful way is this thou showest no journey for a sightless god to go and she replied thyself thou shalt not go my son but he whom first thou meetest when thou comest to asgard and declares this hidden way shall go and i will be his guide unseen meantime the Asa folk had felled trees and had carried to the seashore outside the walls of asgard a great pile of fuel which they laid upon the deck of baldur's great ship ringhorn as it lay stranded high upon the beach seventy ells and four extended on the grass the vessel's keel high above it gilt and splendid rose the figurehead ferocious with its crest of steel then they adorned the funeral pyre with garlands of flowers with golden vessels and rings with finely wrought weapons and rich necklets and armlets and when this was done they carried out the fair body of balder the beautiful and bearing it reverently upon their shields they laid it upon the pyre then they tried to launch the good ship but so heavily laden was she that they could not stir her an inch the mountain giants from the heights afar had watched the tragedy with eyes that were not unpitying for even they had no ill will for balder and they sent and told of a giantess called Herokan, who was so strong that she could launch any vessel, whatever its weight might be. So the Asa sent to fetch her from giant land, and she soon came, riding a wolf for steed, and twisted serpents for reins. When she alighted, Odin ordered four of his mightiest warriors to hold the wolf, but he was so strong that they could do nothing until the giantess had thrown him down and bound him fast then with a few enormous strides herokan reached the great vessel and set her shoulder against the prow sending the ship rolling into the deep the earth shook with the force of the movement as though with an earthquake and the Asa folk collided with one another like pine trees during a storm the ship too with its precious weight was well nigh lost at this thor was wroth and seizing his hammer would have slain the giantess had not the other Asas held him back bidding him not forget the last duty to the dead god. So Thor hallowed the pyre with a touch of his sacred hammer, and kindled it with a thorn twig, which is the emblem of sleep. Last of all, before the pyre blazed up, all father Odin added to the pile of offerings his magic ring, from which fell eight new rings every ninth night, and bending he whispered in Baldur's ear. But none to this day know the words that Odin spake thus in the ear of his dead son then the flames from the pyre rose high and the great ship drifted out to sea and the wind caught the sails and fanned the flames till it seemed as though sky and sea were wrapped in golden flame and while they gazed the sun went lurid down into the smoke-wrapped sea and night came on but through the dark they watched the burning ship still carried o'er the distant waters but fainter as the stars rose high it flared and as in a decaying winter fire the charred log falling making a shower of sparks so with a shower of sparks the pile fell in reddening the sea around and all was dark and thus did balder the beautiful pass from the peaceful steeds of asgard as passes the sun when he paints the evening clouds with the glory of a setting note most of the poetical extracts throughout this chapter are taken from Matthew Arnold's Balder Dead. End of chapter 1, part 8. Recording by phone.
Chapter One, Part Nine of Junior Classics, Volume Two: Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, Volume Two: Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Stories from the Northern Sagas, Part Nine: The Wonderful Quern Stones by Julia Goddard. Once upon a time there was a king of Denmark, or Gotland, as it was then called, whose name was Frothi. He was a great-grandson of the god Thor, and a very mighty king, and wherever the Danish language was spoken, there was Frothi's name honoured and respected. Among his treasures were two quern stones, nothing much to look at, simply two common millstones in appearance, and no one who did not know what they could do would think of taking any notice of them. Nevertheless, these quern stones were of more worth than anything that King Frothy had, for they could produce anything that the grinder of the quern or handmill wished for. They would bring gold, silver, precious stones, anything and everything. And besides this, they could grind love, joy, peace. Therefore, it is not too much to say that these stones were worth more than all the treasures of the king put together. At least, they would have been if he could have made use of them, but they were so heavy that few could be found to turn the quern, and just at the time of which I am speaking, there was no one at all in the land of Gotland able to work away at the quern handle. Now the more King Frothy pondered over his wonderful quern stones, the greater became his desire to use them, and he sought throughout the land from north to south, from east to west, if perchance he might find someone strong enough to help him in his need but all to no purpose, and he was utterly in despair when, by good luck, he happened to go on a visit to Fjolnir, king of Sweden, and to hear of two slave women of great size and strength. Surely, thought Frothy, these are just the women to grind at my corn grotty, for so it was called. And he asked King Fjolnir to be allowed to see them. So King Fjolnir ordered the slaves to be brought before Frothy, and when Frothy saw them his spirits rose, for certainly Menia and Fenia were strong-looking women. They were eight feet in height, and broader across the shoulders than any of Frothy's warriors, and the muscles of their arms stood out like cords. And they lifted heavy weights, threw heavy javelins, and did so many feats of strength that Frothy felt quite sure that they would be able to turn the quern handle. "'I will buy these slaves,' said he, "'and take them with me to Gotland.' Menia and Fenia stood with their arms folded and their proud heads bowed down, while Frothy counted out the gold to the seller. They were slaves, with money had they been bought, with money were they sold again. What cared Frothy who was their father, or how they had come into the land of Sweden? And he took them home with him and bade them grind at the quern. Now he should be able to test the power of the wonderful stones. Grind, grind, Menia and Fenia. Let me see whether you have strength for the work. So spake the king Frothy, and the huge woman lifted the heavy stones as though they had been pebbles. What shall we grind? asked the slaves. Gold, gold, peace and wealth for Frothy. Gold, gold, the land was filled with riches. Treasure in the king's palace, treasure in the coffers of his subjects. Gold, gold. There were no poor in the land, no beggars in the streets, no children crying for bread. All honour to the quern stones. Peace, peace, no more war in the land. Frothy is at peace with everyone. And more than that, there was peace in all countries where Frothy's name was known, even to the far south. And everyone talked of Frothy's peace. Praise be to the corn stones. Wealth, yes, everything went well. Not one of the councils of King Frothy failed. There was not a green field that did not yield a rich crop. Not a tree but bent beneath its weight of fruit. Not a stream that ran dry, not a vessel that sailed from the harbours of Gotland that came not back, after a fair voyage, in safety to its haven. There was good luck everywhere. Grind on, grind on, Menia and Fenia. Good fortune is mine, said King Frothy, and the slaves ground on. When shall we rest, when may we rest, King Frothy? It is weary work toiling day and night. No longer than whilst the cuckoo is silent in the spring. 
Never ceasing is the cry of the cuckoo in the groves. May we not rest longer? Not longer, answered King Frothy, than whilst the verse of a song is sung. That is but little, sighed Minia and Finia, and they toiled on. Their arms were weary and their eyes heavy. They would fain have slept, but Frothy would not let him have any sleep. They were but slaves who must obey their master, so they toiled on, still grinding peace and wealth to Frothy. To Frothy and his queen, joy and peace, may plenty in the land still increase. Frothy and his queen, from dangers keep, may they on beds of down sweetly sleep. No sword be drawn in Gotland old, by murderer bold. No harm befall, the high or low, to none be woe. Good luck to all, good luck to all. We grind, we grind, no rest we find, for rest we call. Thus sang the two giant women, then they begged again, Give us rest, O Frothy. But still Frothy answered, Rest whilst the verse of a song is sung, or as long as the cuckoo is silent in the spring. No longer would the king give them. Yet Frothy was deemed a good king, but gold and good luck were hardening his heart. Minia and Finia went on grinding, and their wrath grew deeper and deeper, and thus at last they spoke. First said Finia, Thou wert not wise, O Frothy. Thou didst buy us, because, like giants, we towered above the other slaves, because we were strong and hardy and could lift heavy burdens. And Minia took up the wail. Are we not of the race of the mountain giants? Are not our kindred greater than thine, O Frothy? The quern had never left the grey fell but for the giant's daughters. Never, never should we have ground as we have done had it not been that we remembered from what race we sprang. Then answered Minia, Nine long winters saw us training to feats of strength, nine long winters of wearisome labour. Deep down in the earth we toiled and toiled, until we could move the high mountain from its foundations. We are weird women, O Frothy. We can see far into the future. Our eyes have looked upon the quern before. In the giant's house we whirled it until the earth shook, and hoarse thunder resounded through the caverns. Thou art not wise, O Frothy. O Frothy, thou art not wise. But Frothy heard them not. He was sleeping the sweet sleep that the quern stones had ground for him. Strong are we indeed, laughed Finia sorrowfully. Strong to contend with the puny men, we whose pastime in Sweden was to tame the fiercest bears, so that they ate from our hands, we who fought with mighty warriors and came off conquerors, we who helped one prince and put down another. Well we fought, and many were the wounds we received from sharp spears and flashing swords. Frothy knows not her power, or he would scarce have brought us to his palace to treat us thus. Here no one has compassion upon us. Cold are the skies above us, and the pitiless wind beats on our breasts. Cold is the ground on which we stand, and the keen frost bites our feet. Ah, there are none to pity us. No one cares for the slaves. We grind forever an enemy squirn, and he gives us no rest. Grind, grind, I am weary of grinding. I must have rest. Nay, returned Minia, talk not of rest until Frothy is content with what we bring him. Then Finia started. If he gives us no rest, let us take it ourselves. Why should we any longer grind good for him who only gives us evil? We can grind what we please. Let us revenge ourselves. Then Minia turned to handle quicker than ever, and in a wild voice she sang, I see a ship come sailing, with warriors bold aboard. There's many a one that in Danish blood would be glad to dip his sword. Say, shall we grind them hither? Say, shall they land to-night? Say, shall they set the palace afire? Say, shall they win the fight? Then called Finia, in a voice of thunder through the midnight air, Frothy, frothy, awake, awake! Wilt thou not listen to us? Have mercy, and let us rest our weary limbs. But all was still, and Frothy gave no answer to the cry. Nay, answered Minia, he will not hearken. Little he cares for the worn-out slaves. Revenge, revenge! 
and Frothy slept, not dreaming of the evil that was coming upon him. And again Phineas shouted, Frothy, Frothy, awake! The beacon is blazing, danger is nigh, wilt thou not spare? But Frothy gave no answer, and the giant women toiled on. O oh, Frothy, Frothy, we cannot bear our weariness! And still no answer came. Frothy, Frothy, danger is nigh thee! Well-manned ships are gliding over the sea. It is Masinger who comes. His white sail flutters in the wind, his flag is unfurled. Frothy, Frothy, awake, awake! Thou shalt be king no longer. And as the giant women ground, the words they spake came to pass. They were grinding revenge for themselves, and brought the enemy nearer and nearer. Ho! Hearken to the herald! Frothy, Frothy, the town is on fire! The palaces will soon be ruined heaps. Grind, Menia, ever more swiftly, until we grind death to Frothy. And Menia and Phenia ground and ground, till Mesinger and his followers landed from the ships. They ground until they had reached the palace. To arms, to arms, shouted the warder, but it was too late. The Gotlanders armed themselves, but who could stand against the army that the slave women were grinding against them? Not long did the struggle last. Frothy and his Gotlanders fought bravely, but the Sea King and his allies were mightier, for the giantesses were in giant mood, and turned to handle faster and faster, until down fell the cornstones. Then sank Frothy, pierced with wounds, and the fight was over. The army that Menia and Phenia had ground to help Mesinger vanished, and Mesinger and his men alone were left conquerors on the bloody field. They loaded their ships with treasure, and Mesinger took with him Menia, Phenia, and the Quernstones. But, alas, Mesinger was no wiser than King Frothy had been. Gold, however, was not his first thought. He had enough of that, but he wanted something else that just then was more to him than gold. There was no salt on board the Sea King's vessels, so he said, Grind salt. And Menia and Phenia ground salt for Mesinger. At midnight they asked if they had ground enough, and Mesinger bade them grind on. And so they ground and ground until the ship was so heavy with salt that it sank, and the Sea King and all his men were drowned. Where the quernstones went down there is to this day a great whirlpool, and the waters of the sea have been salt ever since. End of chapter 1, part 9. Recording by phone. Chapter 2, Part 1 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angela Bodwin. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 2, Part 1. Brunhilde and the Magic Sword by Constance Maud. On the summit of a rocky mountain peak, a beautiful maiden lay sleeping. On every side rose the tall, dark pine trees, like huge giants on guard. A circle of magic fire formed a glowing wall around her rocky couch. The sun rose and set. Night succeeded day. Winter and summer came and went, but the maiden slept on still. From head to foot she was encased in shining armor. On her breast lay a shield. On her head glistened a warrior's helmet and at her side a spear. For on a long day past, it had been decreed that thus this maiden should sleep, till awakened by the kiss of one who would dare the flames for her sake and claim her as bride. Many a night, hearing of the beautiful sleeper, had thought to win his way to her, but no sooner did he see the angry fire darting out on all sides, and feel the scorching heat of the great flames, than the bravest fell back discouraged. Time was when this fair warrior had dealt with the gods and goddesses in Valhalla, for she was none other than Brunhilda, favorite daughter of Wotan the king. She had eight sisters, each one beautiful as the dawn, and knowing neither fear nor weakness. But among them all, Brunhilda was fairest, bravest, and strongest. These nine maidens were known as the Valkyrie, and each was a warrior perfect in the art of war. Chief among their duties was to attend all battles on earth. 
riding on their winged horses, they would hover over the battlefield and, when a hero fell, swoop down and bear his lifeless body to Valhalla, where he would awaken to live among the gods and be from henceforth one of the chosen bodyguard of Wotan. Now it happened on a day in these times long past that Wotan called to him Brunhilda and charged her that she should defend Sigmund the Volsung in a deadly combat he was about to engage in with the grim and savage hunting. Wotan had reasons for wishing to grant Sigmund a special favor. The father of the gods had once struck a mighty sword into the heart of an ancient ash tree, decreeing that it should belong to him alone who could pluck it out. Many a valiant knight had tried to win the sword, but all in vain. Buried deep in the ash stem it remained till Sigmund came and with one powerful wrench drew forth the weapon. Then Wotan rejoiced that a man had been found strong enough to win his sword, and he loved Sigmund the Volsung greatly. But Wotan hated hunting, for he was a tyrant and a bully. With all his strength and bluster, he had never been able to pluck out the sword, though many a time he had tried, grinding his teeth savagely over his failure. Now, the cause of strife between Hunding and Sigmund was this. Hunding had a beautiful wife, Sieglinda by name, whom he had married sorely against her will. With her whole soul she loathed and hated the cruel Hunding, and only longed to escape from him. So it befell one day she fled with Sigmund the Volsung. For the first moment they met, these two loved one another. And Sieglinda said to herself, It were better far to die with Sigmund than to live with Hunding. When Hunding discovered their flight, he set forth to pursue the lovers, uttering loud threats of vengeance which echoed through the forest for miles around. He called on Fricka, queen of Valhalla, to help him, for he knew this goddess to be the most stern in her view of the duties of wives. "'O oh, mighty goddess!' cried Hunding. "'Grant me thine aid. May thy justice and my righteous vengeance speedily overtake the miscreant. Let not the scoundrel Volsung turn the power of Wotan's sword to his own advantage.' for then would all men surely say that the god's favor rests on faithless wives. Fricka promised him her warm support, and also that of Wotan, whom she knew she could bend to her all-powerful will, however opposed he might feel. Scarcely had Brunhilde left the presence of her father when the goddess Fricka drove up in a car drawn by two fierce fleet-footed rams. With stern majesty she demanded that Siegmund should be given up to justice, and the magic sword he had won be broken against the spear of Wotan himself. "'It was for the honor of the gods in Valhalla,' cried Fricka, "'that Hunding's prayer for vengeance on his faithless wife and her lover be answered.' In vain did Wotan plead every excuse he could devise for his favorite Sigmund. Not until he had solemnly sworn on oath to cast off Sigmund and recall the order given to Brunhilde did the stern goddess take her leave. Wotan sank on the nearest rock a picture of utter dejection. In this sad state, Brunhilde found him shortly after. She listened in dismay, when in gloomy tones he said to her, Thou shalt fight today as Fricka desires, and thou shalt vanquish utterly Sigmund the Volsung. Heed well my words, my former order I now recall. Brunhilde could scarcely believe she heard aright. Nay, but thou lovest Sigmund, she cried in sore perplexity, and hunting dost thou hate. Ah, she continued as a new thought came to her, the second decree is not given with thy heart, rather I will abide by the first. Brunhilde spoke with good intent, but these were unlucky words. In many respects the mighty Wotan was not unlike a mortal man. How, froward child, dost dare dispute my word? he cried. Thou who art not but the blind tool used by my hand, wake not my wrath, but heed well my command. Sigmund dies in the fight with Hunding. I have spoken. Go. In sorrowful amaze, the warrior maiden took up her weapons and departed. She found the ill-starred lovers resting a while in their wanderings through the trackless forest. Siglinda's strength was utterly spent, and she had fallen into a deep swoon. Siegmund the Volsung, spoke Brunhilde in solemn tones. I come to call thee hence. Who art thou, so fair and stern, he asked. Only those already doomed to death may look upon my face, she answered. I am she who bears the fallen warrior to Valhalla. And will this, my love, come also to Valhalla? asked Siegmund, gazing tenderly at the pale face of the sleeping Siglinda. Nay, replied Brunhilde, such is not the will of Wotan. Siglinda must remain upon the earth, but thou shalt be with heroes, and the daughters of Wotan shall wait upon thee. 
If my love may not be there, I will have none of Valhalla's delights. I follow thee not, answered Sigmund fixedly. Thou hast looked on the face of the Valkyrie. Thou hast no choice but to follow her, said Brunhilda. By what warrior's hand must I fall? asked Sigmund. Hunding will fell thee in the fight today, answered the Valkyrie. But Sigmund laughed this prophecy to scorn. Seest thou this sword? he said, drawing forth the weapon of Wotan. It was made by one in whose name I am sure of victory. He who bestowed that sword now withdraws the charm and himself dooms thee to death, cried Brunhilde in terrible ringing tones. Hush, or thou wilt awaken my love, said Sigmund, bending tenderly over Sieglinda. If what thou sayest be true, woe and shame be to him who bestowed such a sword. If I must perish and desert her, he continued bitterly, never will I pass to the Valhalla of Wotan. What? cried Brunhilde in horror. Thou wouldst forego the glory of Valhalla for the sake of this poor feeble woman? If thou canst feel no pity, and canst give no help in my sore distress, then leave me at least in peace. Speak not of Valhalla's empty joys. How help this heroic lover without disobeying the order of Wotan, her father? Confide thy beloved to my care. I will protect her, noble Sigmund, she said earnestly. I thank thee, replied Sigmund. But none save I alone can protect my love. And if this sword, which a traitor fashioned, is to prove false in the fight, better it should take our two lives with one fell stroke. So saying, he drew his sword and held it over Siglinda. But Brunhilda seized his arm. Stay thy hand, reckless man. Thou shalt not die but live. Thou shalt not leave Siglinda. Sooner will I, Brunhilda, cancel the death lot. Doubt me not, my promise is spoken. Take up thy sword, it shall prevail, for I will aid thee. Speed now to meet thy foe. Hark to the sound of Hunding's horn. Farewell, Siegmund. With these words, Brunhilde sprang on her winged horse and soon vanished through the clouds. Siegmund gazed after her with grateful eyes, then, stooping, kissed Sieglinda, saying softly, Slumber in peace, my beloved, till the fight is over and peril past. The horn of Hunding sounded loudly in the distance, and Siegmund hastened away to meet him, leaving Siglinda still asleep. A terrible thunderstorm now broke over the forest. Thunderclouds rolled and clashed together. All was dark as night, no light save from the forked flashes which darted here and there in fiery streaks like the gleaming swords of an unseen enemy fighting in the clouds. Louder and louder called the hunting horns of Hunding and his followers. Presently a terrific thunderclap awoke Siglinda. She started up in wildest terror. Siegmund was no longer by her side. A dense darkness surrounded her, while nearer at hand rang the voice of Hunding, crying in tones of wrath. Ha, thou scoundrel Volsing, come down and fight, or my hounds shall hunt thee down. The voices now seemed to come from a rock over Siglinda's head. She listened in eager anxiety as they continued to shout to one another. Suddenly a flash of lightning showed them fighting desperately on the ridge of the rock. Siglinda rushed forward, forgetting all fears for herself in an agony for Siegmund's safety. Another blinding flash made her stagger backwards, dazed and giddy. For one instant, the whole mountain peak was lit up, and she saw, hovering over Siegmund in the air, a woman on a winged horse covering him with a shield as he fought. "'Now is the moment, Siegmund the Volsung!' cried a clear voice from above. "'Slay him with thy magic sword!' But as Siegmund aimed his deadly stroke at the heart of Hunding, a dreadful disaster befell. Wotan, standing unseen at Hunding's side, put forth his spear and received the thrust of Sigmund's sword. "'Back before my spear, be splintered, thou sword!' roared the voice of the god in tones of thunder. With a sharp sound, like a cry, the sword of Sigmund snapped and flew to pieces. Brunhilde fell back in dismay as the gleaming eye of Wotan met her own, and instantly Hunding plunged his sword into the heart of his defenseless foe. Sieglinda fell senseless to the ground. Brunhilde, gathering up the fragments of the sword, hurried to her side and, lifting her to the saddle, rode off at lightning speed through the clouds. Siegmund's lifeless body lay at the feet of Wotan. Remorsefully, he gazed upon the brave young warrior he would fain have spared. The sight of Hunding was more than he could bear. With a backward wave of his hand, Wotan cried fiercely, Go, knave, kneel before Fricka and tell her how well Wotan avenged her slight. And at these words, Hunding staggered and fell lifeless to the ground. 
for no mortal man could stand before the scornful wave of Wotan's hand unless he were of the race of heroes who know not fear. So Hunding died, but there was no Valkyrie to bear him to Valhalla. All his life he had been a tyrant and a bully, and such men, were they the best fighters in the world, could find no favor with the warrior maidens. "'Now for Brunhilde,' cried Wotan, his voice causing the very trees to quake and shiver. "'She who has dared to defy and disobey me. Terrible shall be her punishment, though she be my best-loved child.' He sprang on his warhorse and followed where the parted clouds showed Brunhilde's recent track. End of chapter two, part one. Recording by Angela Bodwin. Chapter two, part two of Junior Classics, volume two, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angela Bodwin. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 2, Part 2. Brynhilda's Sleep, Guarded by Loki's Fiery Arm, by Constance Maud. On the summit of a lofty mountain, the Valkyrie sisters met after the day's toil, to await their father Wotan and present him with the heroes they had gathered from the battlefields on earth. One by one they alighted from their winged steeds, shouting the Valkyrie's war cry greeting to each other, hey ha hey ha hey hoyo to ho From the north came Helmwiga and Gerhilda, well laden. The fierce Norsemen never failed to supply fresh recruits for Wotan's bodyguard. From east and west and every quarter came some tribute to Wotan, borne on the Valkyrie's saddle-bows. "'Where tarries our sister Brunhilde?' asked several eagerly. "'She is late tonight. Ah, see in the distance, who is that speeding hither like a cloud driven before the storm? Surely not so rides our queenly Brunhilde.' With the fainting Siglinda in her arms, it was indeed Brunhilde who came in sight at last, flying on the wings of the wind." "'Faster, oh, faster, Granny, my steed!' she cried to the panting horse. And Granny, his strong head downward bent, with his winged feet cleft the rolling hills till they hissed like water meeting fire, while his breath came in snorting gasps, and the foam flew from his mouth in big flakes like snow. Never before in his long service with his noble mistress had Granny been urged to flight, and he knew that dire indeed must be the danger which Brunhilde dare not stand and face. "'Well striven, good granny, faithful steed!' cried Brunhilde, as the horse alighted on the mountain and dropped exhausted to the ground. Lifting Siglinda, now fully conscious from the saddle, Brunhilde hastened toward her sisters. "'She brings no hero! It is not but a maiden!' they exclaimed in wonder and disappointment. "'Help me, O oh sisters! Shield me and this poor woman, I beseech you!' implored Brunhilde breathlessly. "'Why this furious haste?' "'From whom fleest thou?' asked the Valkyries, crowding round her in amazement. "'I fly from our father. In terrible wrath he hunts me down.' "'Thou fliest from our father?' cried all the sisters, horror-struck. "'What hast thou done that thou should fly from him?' Brunhilde poured out her tale in eager haste. From one to another she looked for pity or sympathy, but in vain. Sternly, the Valkyries eyed her as she knelt and implored them to shelter her and the unfortunate Siglinda from the wrath of Wotan. "'Woe to thee, most unworthy sister! How durst thou disobey the sacred command of Wotan our father? Not but disaster can follow!' And now, from the north, raging storm clouds came sweeping toward them. One of the Valkyries mounted to the topmost peak and, looking across the sky, called out, he comes, Wotan the wrathful father, flying furiously in the storm clouds on his snorting steed. Who will lend me a horse? Granny is spent. See, he cannot even stand. Rosvisa, my sister, have pity. Lend me thy racer, Brunhilde implored, turning to a stately Valkyrie whose magnificent steed was at her side. My racer never yet fled our father in fear, and never shall, replied Rosvisa coldly. To each one Brunhilde went, beseeching a horse. We stand by our father, the Valkyries all answered her. Brunhilde was in despair. Then Siglinda, who had watched the scene in gloomy silence, came forward and spoke. Sorrow not for me, noble maiden, O oh, why didst thou not leave me to die with Sigmund? If thou hast indeed pity on me, stretch forth thy sword and pierce me now to the heart. Nay, that must not be, answered Brunhilde. 
"'Thou must live still, Siglinda, for thou shalt have a son, who will one day be the greatest hero in the world.' Heed now what I say. To the eastward there lies a mighty forest. There Votan will not pursue thee, for he abhors the spot. It is the dwelling of Fafnir the dragon, his mortal foe. Thither haste thee. I will remain here to face the god's wrath, and hinder him till thou hast escaped far on thy journey. Fly then, Siglinda, cried Brunhilda. Speed to the east. Faint not and fear not, whatever betide. Live for thy son, and call him by this name from me. Siegfried the victor. Give him these shattered pieces of his father's sword. From the field of death I took them. One day he shall weld them into a mighty weapon. Farewell, Siglinda. It was none too soon. Another minute, and with a crash the angry god descended in the midst of the dismayed Valkyries. Where is Brunhilde the rebel? he roared in tones of fury. Let her come forth. Dare any to shelter her. They shall share the same doom. The Valkyrie sisters had closed round Brunhilde in the vain hope of hiding her, but at these words she came out from their midst, her face pale and set. "'Here am I, my father, to suffer my sentence,' she said firmly. Votan was not prepared for such calm fearlessness. "'I sentence thee not,' he answered. "'Tis thine own misdeed condemns thee.' Then, with gathering wrath, he continued. I made thee a Valkyrie, highest in honor and favor. Thou hast forsworn thy noble calling, and played traitor to thy father. No longer mayest thou dwell in Valhalla as my child. Never more will I send thee for my dead heroes. Never again shalt thou fill my cup at the feast. Degraded and exiled art thou forever. Brunhilda stood as though turned to stone. The Valkyries burst into loud lamentations. Woe, woe, alas, our unhappy sister! Then Brunhilda cried aloud in great agony of mind, O oh, father, disown me not! Take not from me all thy gifts! Leave me not to utter desolation! But Wotan was not to be appeased, and the worst part of the sentence was yet to come. Thou thyself hast called down my curse, and here where we now stand it shall strike thee, he answered. A deep, dreamless sleep shall overpower thee, and to that man who first awakens thee shalt thou belong from henceforth. At this grim sentence all the Valkyries lifted their voices in a wail of horror and dismay, crying, O oh, terrible father, recall thy curse! Let not our sister be degraded to such a shameful fate. Each one of us shares in her disgrace. Brunhilde's woe was too great for any cry. I have spoken once. My words abide forever, retorted Wotan. Thy treacherous sister, he continued, no longer belongs to the glorious troop of Valkyries. Her godhood is forfeit. The doom she has earned is now to wed a mortal man. At this picture of her future, poor Brunhilde sank with a deep groan to the earth. Wotan turned to the eight sisters, who looked on in deep distress. If ye desire not a like doom, forbear to pity the outcast. Away now, be gone, every one of ye. Haste, lest I hurl the same woe on your heads. The earth quaked and trembled as Wotan passionately stamped his foot, and fiery gleams shot from his eyes. With a last despairing look at Brunhilde and a wild cry of woe, the Valkyries sprang on their horses and fled in hot haste. They knew if their stern father spared not his favorite Brunhilde, still less would he spare them. The storm had now ceased. Brunhilde lay prostrate on the ground. Wotan stood motionless in silent gloom. His rage seemed spent, like that of the storm. Then Brunhilde rose slowly from the ground and spoke in deep, sorrowful tones. Was my deed verily so shameful that such shame would fall upon me? Was it so base an act to fulfill thy first command? Speak, O my father, and soften thy wrath toward me. Thou didst willfully disobey my sacred order. The first command I recalled, replied Wotan bitterly. But not of thine own will. T'was Fricka who made thee false to thy nobler self, and because I held in my heart thy true wish, I dared to slight thy second order. The mention of Fricka brought an angry flash from the eyes of Wotan. For that rebellious act the curse now falls on thee, he answered. But I knew how well thou lovedst Sigmund, pleaded Brunhilde, and when I found him in the forest and told him of thy death decree, he revealed to me a wondrous thing I had never before known. 
for in his strong courage and his undying devotion to Siglinda, I learned what love could be, and I resolved, whether victory or death come of it, to serve one so noble. In acting thus, O father, I was faithful to thee, even when disobeying thereby thy command. Votan groaned. Thou knowest not of what compelled my action. Dark clouds are gathering on every side. The day of doom threatens Valhalla. I dared not follow what my heart desired. But all this woe I kept from thee, that thy life might be happy and free from care. And thou, my favorite, my beloved child, hast turned thy hand against me and proved false to my trust. Never again may I behold thy face. Since love proved thy undoing, follow now that man whom thou perforce must love. If indeed I am banished forever, at least, she pleaded, grant me one parting boon, O stern father. If I must wed a mortal man, let not thy Valkyrie fall a victim to some worthless poltroon when fetters of sleep bind her fast. In this one thing, O father, hear my prayer. At thy command, let magical fires spring up in a glowing wall around my couch, that the flames may scare and scorch the timid, and none save a hero stout of heart may dare to approach me. Votan, stern and unbending though he was, could not refuse this one last petition. Farewell, he said. Thou who wert once the light of my eyes, I grant thee this last parting boon. Tongues of flame will I set around this place. With their terrible fury shall they scare the faint-hearted. Only one shall awaken the bride, he whose strength and freedom is greater than that of Votan. With a cry of grateful joy, Brynhilda threw herself into her father's arm. Tenderly he looked at her, and slowly kissed her on both eyes. A profound slumber instantly fell on Brunhilde, and Wotan, taking her in his arms, laid her on a mossy mound overshadowed by a great fir tree. "'Farewell forever, my beloved, beautiful child,' he murmured sadly, as he closed her helmet visor and covered her with the long steel shield of the Valkyries. Then, going to a rock nearby, he struck it three times with the point of his spear, commanding in a loud voice, Loki, fire spirit, come forth. Spread me thy flames around this fell. Here, keep thou guard as I decree. Loki, appear. And at his word, out sprang from the rock a long tongue of flame, which quickly spread to a mighty river of fire circling round and round the mountain where Brunhilde lay sleeping. Then Wotan, holding aloft his spear, cried in ringing tones, only he whose spirit quaileth not before the spear of Wotan shall pass this fiery bar. With these words he vanished into the clouds, and the night fell. Such was the story of Brunhilde's long sleep. End of chapter 2, part 2. Recording by Angela Bodwan. Chapter 2, part 3 of Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angela Bodwan. Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 2, Part 3 How Siegfried Killed the Dragon by Constance Maud. When Sieglinda fled from the wrath of Wotan, she went eastward as Brunhilde directed. For long days and nights she journeyed, and came at length to the country of the Nibelungs, where dwelt the great dragon Fafnir. Now the Nibelungs were a race of ugly dwarfs, who lived underground, burrowing in the depths of the earth for gold and treasure. They cared nothing for the free forest life, the sunshine, trees, and flowers, or pleasures of the chase. Like prisoners in a dungeon, they chose rather to pass their lives digging and toiling in the dark for gold, and hoarding it up with anxious care. A vast heap of this treasure, including a magic ring stolen from the mermaids of the Rhine and a wishing cap of strange powers called the Tarnhelm, had fallen into the hands of Fafnir the giant, who, in order the better to guard these precious possessions, transformed himself into a huge dragon, the terror of all the country round. Siglinda lived a sad, lonely life in the forest. She avoided the caves where Fafnir dwelt, and as the dwarves seldom came above ground, she saw nothing of them. There was one, however, whom it was fated she should meet. His name was Mimi, and of all the dwarves of the Nibelung race, he was the ugliest and the meanest. 
Notwithstanding this, he was a very skillful blacksmith who could also do fine work in gold, silver, and steel. Like all the Nibelungs, he had a great dislike to fresh air, so he built his forge in a cave half sunk underground, with a great chimney in the roof. Mimi was working at his anvil one day, when he heard a deep groan outside the cave. On going out, he saw a woman with a baby in her arms lying on the ground. She was dying, and Mimi had only found her in time to hear her last words. "'Have pity!' cried poor Siglinda, for it was she. "'Thy goodness shall be rewarded. I am dying. Take this, my son, and bring him up. Call his name Siegfried, for one day he will be the greatest hero in the world. Keep for him this broken sword. It was Sigmund his father's. Needful, he called it.' Now Mimi was not a kind-hearted person, and nothing would have induced him to take care of a strange baby out of pity. But when Siglinda said that her child was the son of the famous hero Sigmund the Volsung, and would one day himself be the greatest hero in the world, then a grand idea struck Mimi. He would bring up the boy as his own son, and when Siegfried was full grown, he should be sent forth to kill Fafnir and win for his foster father all the dragon's treasures. So Mimi answered Siglinda in a cracked voice, which he tried to make pleasant. "'Be comforted, poor woman. I will take the child out of the kindness of my heart and do my best for him.' Siglinda died with a blessing on her lips, and Mimi took the little Siegfried to dwell with him in his cave. But the dwarf soon found he had no easy task in bringing up this son of a hero. Never was such a daring, fearless, mischievous infant. Many a time would Mimi have turned him adrift, or put an end to him with a blow from his smith's hammer, but for the thought that this bold young imp was just the sort to delight in slaying a dragon, and pay no heed as to who took the treasure. As soon as he could walk, the boy would escape into the forest and there run wild all day, chasing the bears and foxes, feeling no fear of any living creature. He grew so fast that in a few years he was bigger and stronger than Mimi, whom from the first he disliked, perceiving the dwarf to be false and cowardly in all his actions. Mimi always told the boy he was his father, and this was a great trouble to Siegfried. How he would have loved a father who was noble, fearless, and brave. But Mimi feared everything. He trembled and turned pale did a wolf but howl, or the thunder roll. He feared not only giants, but ordinary huntsmen and woodcutters, and always hid when they came in sight. He feared even Siegfried, so the boy soon became his master and led him a sorry life. But creatures too small and weak to excite his fear, Mimi would cruelly oppress and kill, and this, more than anything else, made Siegfried hate the very sight of him. Time went on, and Siegfried grew into a tall, strong youth, with fair locks shining in the sun like burnished gold, and fearless blue eyes, which laughed danger in the face. At last the day came when Mimi hoped to be repaid for all his trouble with the good-for-nothing cub, as he called the boy. Siegfried had ordered him in a lordly way to make a sword fit for his use. "'One that does not snap in two at the first stroke,' he said, and strode off to the forest for his day's hunt. Mimi had undertaken the task more than once lately, for he was anxious on his own account that a sword should be fashioned strong and tough enough to slay the dragon. But as yet every weapon he welded had snapped in two at the first trial of its strength by Siegfried. With mighty effort Mimi hammered and wrought at his anvil all that day. A stouter sword I never shaped. It would defy a giant, he said at last, looking on his day's work. Yet I sorely fear, when grasped by that fiery youth, it will twist up like a straw. Mimi sat down exhausted and despairing. Ah, me! What is to be done? he sighed. If only Sigmund's splintered sword could be welded together again. But no power on earth can do that. Never saw I such mighty steel. All my craft is powerless to melt it. The thing is magic. Oh, ho, come on, friend Bruin, cried a voice from without, and Siegfried burst into the cave, driving a great grizzly bear, which he held in tow with the rope. Mimi started up in terror and hid behind the forge, shrieking, Take away the fearsome brute! Siegfried burst into peals of laughter at Mimi's fear. Mr. Bruin is a friend of mine. He has come to ask for the sword. Is it not finished yet? Yes, it is finished. There it lies yonder. Take away the beast, panted Mimi. Siegfried seized the sword eagerly. Go now, friend Bruin, he said, loosing the rope, and the bear gladly escaped. See how nice and bright is the sword, said Mimi, creeping out of his hiding place. 
"'To what purpose is a sword bright if it is not hard?' asked Siegfried with scorn. He struck it on the anvil, and the sword instantly flew to pieces. "'What silly toy hast thou palmed off on me here?' he cried, flinging it away in disgust. "'Dost call that a sword? Why talk to me of battles and giants and deeds of daring, if thou canst shape me no better weapon than that? Right well dost thou deserve that I break it on thy crazy old head.' "'Ungrateful boy, think of all my goodness to thee, when a wretched, troublesome cub, who was it warmed, clothed, and fed thee? Who patiently taught thee all thou knowest? And what is my reward, naught but abuse and hate?' Mimi pretended to wipe away a tear, as though overcome by grief, but he had done this once too often. "'No doubt thou hast taught me much, and told me many lies,' answered Siegfried, who was in no mood for polite speeches." "'But there is one thing,' he continued, "'thou hast never taught me, and which I am now determined to know. Who and from whence are my father and mother? Long have I felt thou art no kin of mine. I see in the forest all the young resemble their parents, but thou and I are no more alike than a toad and a bright shining fish.' Mimi did not like the comparison. His eyes gleamed with hate. "'Tell me the truth, or I will shake it out of thee,' cried Siegfried, seizing him by the throat." "'Let loose, or thou wilt murder me, wretched boy!' screamed the dwarf in terror. "'I will tell thee all!' Then, trembling and quaking, he told Siegfried all he knew of his unhappy parents, with many comments on his own exceeding kindness, to which Siegfried listened impatiently. Finally, in proof of his tale, which for a wonder was true, Mimi produced the two pieces of splintered sword, saying dolefully, "'Behold, as reward for all my toil and trouble,' This had I from thy mother, a broken sword thy father died while wielding. Needful, they called it, a foolish name, since it failed in time of need. Siegfried rejoiced at learning that he sprang from a noble race. He thought with tenderness of his unfortunate parents, and wished he could have brought some comfort to his poor brave mother. Eagerly he seized the broken pieces of his father's sword. "'To me it shall be well named Needful,' he cried." "'If thou hast any craft, show it now, Mimi. Up and forge me these fragments. My father's sword I will wield to-day, and with it go forth into the world.' So saying, he went out of the cave, leaving Mimi looking disconsolately at the broken sword. "'No furnace can melt this hard steel. No hammer can bend it. Yet this is the sword which alone can slay Fafnir.' When Siegfried returned, Mimi had still done nothing. He seemed to have just awakened from some bad dream." "'Ho, lazy fellow, hast finished the sword?' he shouted. Mimi crept up slowly from behind the anvil, looking round cautiously, lest Siegfried had brought some wild beast with him. "'The sword!' he exclaimed in dismal tones. "'How can I mend such steel? But hark ye, boy!' And Mimi came close up, peering into his face. "'Hast ever known fear?' "'Whom meanest thou by fear? Never have I heard of him,' Siegfried answered impatiently. Alone in the forest on a dark night, near some gloomy spot, when a sudden rustle or roar startled thee close at hand, hast never felt grisly shuddering, thy heart beating and bursting in thy breast? The little dwarf's description of his unknown feeling interested Siegfried greatly. He even forgot to be angry about the sword. Right strange and wondrous must that be, he cried. My heart is ever firm and steady. How I long to feel sensations so new and curious— this shivering and shaking and beating and bursting? Tell me then, Mimi, how can I learn to know fear? I will tell thee, said Mimi, delighted. There is one I know of who will not fail to teach thee. A monstrous dragon is he, Fafnir by name. I will guide thee to his hole. Where is it? Let us be gone at once. Give me the sword, I will mend it myself. Verily, thou art but a bungling smith. Heaping a mass of wood on the fire, Siegfried blew it up till the flames roared like hungry lions. Then, fixing the sword splinter in a vice, he proceeded to file them to powder. Mimi watched in wonder and envy. Now and then he timidly offered his advice, to which Siegfried paid as much heed as though it were the squeaking of a mouse. Working away with a will, Siegfried performed the mightiest feats of strength with no more exertion than if he were shaping a toy for a child. When the sword was all in power, he put it in a pot on the forge. Then, blowing up the flames afresh, he sang in a voice, strong as a clarion, a joyful song of freedom and victory. The steel sword of his father seemed to understand the song, 
for it bubbled and spluttered all liquid in the pot, as though it would leap out for very joy. Mimi listened too, but he did not enjoy the song. His wily brain was hard at work planning his own ends. That Siegfried should remake the sword was very well, for without it Fafnir could not be slain. But supposing he took the ring, the gold, and all? What then would become of poor Mimi? So he prepared a wondrous draught of such powerful poisons that one drop was enough to make a giant fall senseless to the ground. "'When he comes home weary from his fight with the dragon, I will give him this refreshing cup,' said Mimi with a malicious chuckle. Meanwhile, Siegfried poured the molten steel into a mold, which he forthwith plunged hissing into a tank of cold water. "'Ha ha, Mimi!' he cried. "'So you have turned cook and brew sances while I brew swords!' "'Methinks,' he added to himself, "'I would rather taste of my cooking than his.' The dwarf's sharp little eyes glistened with hate as he stirred the potion, and crooned low his song of hope and vengeance. "'So the pupil puts the craftsman to shame, does he? Only let him wait till this draught is duly prepared. "'Now, Needful, come forth, and see what the hammer can do for thee,' cried Siegfried. He took the sword hard and cold from the water, and thrust it in the red-hot coals till it glowed like a sword of flame." Then, with a huge smith's hammer, he beat it out on the anvil. The sparks flew right and left like fireflies, and Siegfried sang again, Ha, Needful, so do I tame thy spirit. At my command thou glowest fiery red. Then in the water I cool thine anger till thy sides gleam steely blue. Now, with stalwart strokes, I beat thee out. Needful, my famous sword, so does my spirit enter thee. Soon thy cold blade shall glow red again with the blood of traitors. Dead didst thou lie, but I, Siegfried, give thee life once more. Needful, come forth. Brandishing the sword, Siegfried brought down a mighty stroke across the anvil. With a crash, it split from top to bottom, giving Mimi such a shock he nearly upset his precious pot. So the sword was remade, and Siegfried forthwith started out, guided by Mimi, to find the dragon. Darkness had fallen, but Siegfried was too impatient for his first lesson in fear to wait till morning. All night they tramped through the forest. At every rustle of the branches, every snapping of a twig, Mimi started as though he were shot. Siegfried watched him with scorn. His mocking laughter re-echoed through the stillness. And the dwarf's hatred grew more bitter with every step. Many a time he longed then and there to force down Siegfried's throat the draught he carried so carefully under his cloak. On they went, Siegfried scarcely heeding the way. So high bounded his heart with thoughts of adventure to fight and conquer giants and dragons, to go out into the wide world and be as free as air, free from the false cowardly Mimi, free to choose brave and noble companions whom he could honor and love. What unknown joys might not life be waiting to give him who dared to win them? Day was dawning when at length they reached some rocky caverns at the foot of a mountainous chain. This is the spot, said Mimi in a trembling whisper. Seest thou yonder dark yawning hole? Inside lies Fafnir. Day and night he guards his treasure, the gold, the ring, and the Tarnhelm. So he is the master who will teach me fear, cried Siegfried joyfully. Thou canst leave me now, Mimi. I need thee no more. Ungrateful boy, sighed the dwarf. But I will not go far. My heart will be toying with anxiety for thy safety. Fafnir is no common foe. With a single snap he could swallow thee whole. Siegfried laughed. I shall be careful not to thrust myself down such a wide throat. Eh, but his very breath is potent poison, continued Mimi. And the foam of his mouth, if it but touch thee, will shrivel up both flesh and bones on the spot. While as to his tail, tis like a huge snake, which, once thou art in its coils, will grind thy limbs as though they were powdered glass. Mimi hastened away, muttering to himself, Would that the dragon and the boy might slay one another. Siegfried threw himself down under the trees to wait for Fafnir. A bird began to sing in the branches overhead. Siegfried listened and wished he could understand the bird's language. Perchance, if I but knew it, he sings to me of my mother and of all I wish to know. Siegfried gazed up between the leaves at the bird, which paused for a moment and fixed on him a pair of little black eyes, then started afresh, gurgling forth his liquid notes and trills. "'The language of the birds may be learned, so I have heard tell,' cried Siegfried, and swinging up he went down to the stream and cut a reed with his sword. With much trouble he fashioned a pipe, and returning to his friend in the tree, tried to imitate his music. 
The bird stopped to listen, much surprised. But it was a sorry performance, and though this bird was too polite to laugh, Siegfried distinctly heard a tittering and fluttering from other listeners. Much disheartened, he flung away the reed. It is no use, he cried. I alone in all the world have no friend, no companion with whom I can speak. Well, at least I will try if there is anyone will understand this language. He took the silver horn slung round his neck and blew a ringing challenge. It was answered in a moment by a low roar from the distant cave, followed soon by slow crashing steps and deep-drawn snorts coming nearer and nearer. Presently, Siegfried beheld an enormous wriggling mass of shining scales advancing toward him. "'So my call has awakened this lovely creature,' he laughed as the hideous monster came in full view. "'What is that?' asked a thick, guttural voice, and the dragon paused to gaze in wonder and contempt at the youth who faced him with such bold laughing eyes. "'So thou hast the gift of speech, Mr. Dragon, that is well,' remarked Siegfried lightly. "'I have come to learn from thee what is fear.' "'Overbold art thou,' growled the voice, while from enormous jaws issued a volume of fire and smoke, filling the air with a noisome vapor." "'Bold or overbold, here am I to learn my lesson, so teach me without delay,' answered Siegfried. Fafnir opened his yawning jaws, and showed two rows of jagged, pointed teeth, enormous in size. "'Verily thou hast a fine row of grinders, Mr. Dragon,' laughed Siegfried. "'A most dainty little mouth.' "'I open not my jaw for senseless gabble, but for food,' growled Fafnir, and gave his tail a sudden switch round." which would certainly have caught Siegfried in its toils, had he not sprung alertly to one side. Oh, ho so that is the game, is it? Come on, then, Mr. Dragon. And Siegfried drew needful sharply from the scabbard. Bah! Come on, thou boasting young cub. I will give the lesson thou cravest. Fafnir drew himself together and sent forth from his nostrils a venomous steam. Whatever it touched, whether trees or grass, shriveled up instantly, as though scorched by fire. But again Siegfried was too quick for him, and Fafnir, who hoped to see a burnt-up body in the ground, was enraged to hear a cheerful voice from behind him. "'Look out, old growler! The boaster is upon thee!' Then Fafnir set to work in good earnest, and Siegfried found that after all it was no child's play to fight a dragon." But though blinded and well-nigh choked with the poisonous smoke and steam, Siegfried fought on, nothing daunted. The only vital spot was, he knew, the dragon's heart, the back and side of his huge carcass being entirely covered with scaly armor. Nearer and nearer they closed on one another, till at last Fafnir with a sudden twist caught Siegfried in his serpentine tail. But before the coils had time to tighten round him, Siegfried had pierced Needful through a joint of the scaly tail. Fafnir sent up a howl of rage and pain, and for a moment relaxed his grip. With a bound, Siegfried leapt on the back of his foe. Fafnir instantly prepared to roll over on one side and so crush Siegfried with his mountainous weight. But in turning, his breast for a brief moment was exposed, and in the twinkling of an eye down swept the sword of Siegfried, burying itself up to the hilt in the dragon's heart. With a terrific groan, Fafnir rolled over while Siegfried sprang lightly to one side, crying, "'Lie there, old growler, with needful in thy heart!' In great puffs of smoke and fire, like an overturned steam engine, came Fafnir's dying breath. His eyes rolled horribly, fixing them at last on Siegfried. He gasped, "'Who art thou, clear-eyed youth?' "'In truth,' replied Siegfried, "'I know but little of myself or of my kin.' "'A strange fate is mine,' groaned the dragon." I, the great giant Fafnir, to die by the hand of a youth unknown even to himself? Young hero, heed well the dying words of him whom thou hast slain. The treasure I guarded is accursed. Death it brought to my brother, and now to me. If thou touch aught of it, the curse rests also on thee. Heed what I say. Oh, tell me more, wise monster, Siegfried entreated. "'Tell me of my parents and the race from which they sprang. Siegfried is my name.' Fafnir heaved himself upwards in a last effort to speak. "'Siegfried,' he began, gasped for breath, and then with a deep groan fell back dead. As he rolled over on his side, Siegfried drew the sword out of his breast. He felt sorry for the giant was dead, and had now quite a kindly feeling for him. Those last words had shown him to be a wise and thoughtful monster.' 
But still, Siegfried was not sure he would take his advice. In drawing out the sword, some of the dragon's blood chanced to touch Siegfried's hand. It burnt like a red-hot coal, and he put it quickly to his mouth. As he did so, the song of the bird again fell on his ear. He listened in amazement, for now every note was a word which he understood. This was what the bird sang in his sweet piping voice. Hey, Siegfried! Siegfried the victor has slain the dragon. Now to him belongs the gold, the ring, and the tarnhelm. With these he can conquer the world if he will. Thanks, little feathered friend, for thy good news. I will go and seek for these treasures. And nodding to the bird, Siegfried descended into Fafnir's dark cave. Mimi, from a safe hiding place in the trees, had watched the fight between Fafnir and Siegfried. He now crept out and anxiously peeped after Siegfried as he disappeared into the dragon's hole. Grant, O ye gods, that he take only the gold and leave the ring and the cap for me, prayed Mimi fervently. Little did he guess how the singing bird had told Siegfried all he desired to keep most secret. He thought, the bright glittering gold will be sure to attract the youth more than a plain simple ring and a small cap of wrought chain. Presently Siegfried came out of the cave. Mimi crawled stealthily back to his hiding place and peered out through the leaves. A curse on him! he muttered, grinding his teeth with rage. The ring is on his finger, and the cap hangs from his belt. Siegfried looked round for his piping friend. Perched on the branch of a lime tree, the bird awaited him. Hey! Siegfried has now both ring and cap. Siegfried the victor. But, oh, he must beware of the treacherous dwarf. The dragon's blood will reveal to him the hidden meaning of all words, both true and false. His thoughts shall Siegfried hear when the dwarf Mimi speaks. Carefully carrying his poisonous draught, Mimi now approached. Thou art tired after thy mighty conflict. See what I bring to restore thee. Take but a sip, and all I have worked and waited for will be mine, sword, treasure, and all. Mimi thought he was saying something very pleasant. He smiled and cringed as he offered the drinking horn. But these were his thoughts as Siegfried heard them, in virtue of his newly gained power. So thou wouldst rob me of everything, even of life? asked Siegfried sternly. How falsely dost thou distort my kind words, replied Mimi in an injured tone. Yet I give myself much trouble to disguise my true thoughts. Dear heart, thee and thy kin have I ever hated. Mimi here looked lovingly at Siegfried. All these years I fostered thee, that thou mightest win for me the dragon's hoard. Come, now take the draught. Thou wert ever easy to fool. Siegfried looked at the little dwarf and smiled ominously. I should be right glad of a goodly draught, he said. Of what didst thou make this? Only drink and see, dear Sonny. Trust to my skill. Soon wilt thou be lying in a deathly swoon at my feet. Then with thine own brave sword off goes thy head, and Mimi will rest in peace with the horde. So I am to be murdered in my sleep? asked Siegfried. What folly dost thou talk? Who spoke of murder? All I thought of doing was just to chop off thy head when thou liest insensible. A small return for the shameful treatment I have so long suffered at thy hands. Come drink and die, thou hateful Volsung cub. And Mimi, still smiling and leering, thrust the drinking horn near Siegfried's lips. Taste thou my sword, false snake, cried Siegfried. With a sudden movement of disgust and fury, he struck at the dwarf with his sword. The next instant, Mimi lay dead on the ground. Siegfried threw his body inside the dragon's cave, crying, Lie there with the gold thou so lovest. I make thee a parting gift of it. And here is a famous watchdog to scare away all thieves. With this, Siegfried dragged the body of the dragon to the mouth of the cave, thereby entirely blocking up the entrance. Then he turned away from the spot with a sigh of relief and went back to the lime tree where first the bird had sung to him. Throwing himself down under the shady branches, he called to his little friend, Come, sing to me, happy bird. Alone am I in all the world. Never have I known a comrade save the hateful dwarf yonder. Tell me, O wise little prophet, where shall I find one I can love? All was stillness in the forest. The sun was now at its height. Only the soft, low hum of insect life filled the drowsy air. Suddenly a flutter of wings overhead, and the clear note of the woodbird piped out once more, Hey, Siegfried the victor, he has slain the treacherous dwarf. Now a glorious bride awaits him. But he must go through the flames to win and to wake her, for Brunhilde sleeps fast, guarded by Loki's fiery arm. 
Siegfried started to his feet. Oh, sweetest song, how it fills my heart with joy and longing. Say, dear bird, how shall I find this bride and break through the fire? Then the bird sang again. Only he who knows not fear can awaken and win the sleeping bride. At this, Siegfried laughed aloud with delight. For had not even Fafnir failed to teach him fear? Perchance from Brunhilde shall I learn to know what is fear, he cried gaily. Fly on before, sweet bird, point thou the road, I follow thee. The bird fluttered his wings joyfully and flew on ahead, Siegfried following with bounding step. End of chapter 2, part 3. Recording by Angela Bodwin. Chapter 2, Part 4 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angela Bodwin. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 2, Part 4 How Siegfried Finds Brunhilde by Constance Maud. For many a day Siegfried journeyed, keeping the bird always in sight. At night he slept under a tree, and the bird rested in a branch above. But with the first whisper of dawn, Siegfried would start up, impatient to be off again. Over mountain and valley, across river and lake, Siegfried followed as though his feet were shod with invisible wings, never flagging, never weary. He came at length one evening to a narrow pass in the mountains. The way seemed to lead upwards, but daylight was fading, and Siegfried could see nothing clearly. All at once the bird circled rapidly over his head, sang a few sweet half-plaintive notes, and then, soaring upwards, vanished out of sight. In the same moment a deep voice spoke close at hand. Halt! What seekest thou here? Siegfried went forward, and standing in the narrow way he saw a tall, dark form. I seek for the fire-girt mountain where the beautiful maiden sleeps, answered Siegfried fearlessly. Canst thou tell me the way? Who told thee of such a maiden? demanded the stranger sternly. A singing bird gave me the good news, said Siegfried. By tasting the blood of a dragon, I learned the language of the birds, and I know my birds spake true. He was getting impatient at so many questions and anxious to go on his way. So, thou hast slain old Fafnir. And with what weapon did strike the death blow, bold youth? The stranger was in no hurry, evidently. With my father's splintered sword, which I wielded together again, said Siegfried with pride. But who first shaped that mighty sword? asked the stranger. That I neither know nor care. T'was a mighty useless weapon till I took it in hand, that I know, answered Siegfried. If thou canst not direct me on the road I seek, hold thy peace and let me pass on my way. Softly, young sir, thou dost not know with whom thou speakest. I know that this path leads onwards to my lady, for thither pointed the bird before he left me. So make way and let me pass, returned Siegfried angrily. The bird fled to save its life. The way it pointed thou shalt never pass, presumptuous youth. Ha ha! And who art thou to arrest my steps? laughed Siegfried scornfully. I am the guardian of yon mountain, where sleeps the maiden Brunhilde. A wall of flame encircles her, which even to approach would scorch thee to death. Be gone, then, rash fool, for to win the way one step further, thou must first overcome the mountain's guardian. Placing himself in the middle of the road, the stranger loomed above Siegfried, gigantic and immovable as the rock itself. But Siegfried remained unawed. Be gone thyself, old boaster, he cried irreverently. Think not to scare me with such tales. I love the fire's blaze, so out of my way, for I haste to where Brunhilde sleeps. Thou fearest not the fire, retorted the stranger. Then fear this my spear, for it shall bar thy way, this spear which once already has shattered thy father's sword. The sky had now become lurid. A terrific tempest was gathering. At the stranger's words, Siegfried sprang forward and, drawing needful from the scabbard, shouted exultingly, Have I then found my father's foe? Thanks be to the gods for letting me avenge his death. Then, falling on the powerful form that barred his way, he hewed with long, swift strokes at the spear, which, had he hesitated for one moment or made one false step, would have struck him dead. There was a rushing sound of wings in the storm clouds overhead. Anxious faces peered down on the scene. 
The warrior maidens, hovering above on their war horses, trembled and paled as they beheld the spear which once had been the terror of the world hewn to pieces, while their father, recoiling at last before the fiery youth, cried half triumphantly in spite of his defeat, Advance! I cannot bar thy way! For Wotan's heart never failed to rejoice in a real hero, even though he fought against him. A terrific clap of thunder followed, and a dark cloud swept over the fighters. When it rolled away, Siegfried looked in vain for his mysterious foe. He had vanished. Now through the fire to win my bride, cried Siegfried joyously, and leapt up the mountainside. A ruddy glow soon told him he was nearing the fiery wall, and gusts of hot air swept across his face. Taking his silver horn, Siegfried blew a call which echoed far and near. To greet my sleeping love, he cried. And now the fire was all about him, bursting up under his feet, pouring down from the skies, rushing round on every side. Aha, this is glorious, shouted Siegfried, plunging eagerly onwards and laughing. The fierce flames which had scared so many nearly to death did not scorch even a hair of Siegfried's head. For the magic fire injured only those who retreated. He who dashed fearlessly onward remained unharmed. Higher and higher up the mountain went Siegfried. Emerging at last from the flames, he found himself on the summit of a rocky peak, clad with tall, dark pine trees. He looked around him, and rejoiced for very joy to be alive in such a fair world. The stillness was wonderful. Not a sound could be heard, for the wood bird will not build his home so near the sky, and the fire had kept out all wingless intruders. Presently Siegfried saw, standing motionless under the trees, a stately horse. On going nearer, he was astonished to find that on his feet were wings. His eyes were closed in a profound sleep. Siegfried stroked his flowing mane. Awake, good steed! The sun has arisen! This is no time for sleeping! His voice rang out clear as his silver horn, and with a start, Granny awoke. But Siegfried looked around in vain for the bride, Brunhilde. Suddenly the rising sun struck with its glittering light on an object under a distant pine. Siegfried hastened forward, and with the wonder beheld a sleeping form clad from head to foot in shining armor. Here is some warrior for sure, cried Siegfried. This heavy helmet must press sorely on his head. I will loosen it for him. He stooped, lifted the shield, and then carefully unfastened the helmet. As he removed it, the sleeper's hair rolled out in long, curling locks of burnished gold. Siegfried started. Never had he seen anything so fair as that calm, proud young face, framed in the wavy, shining curls. So still lay the sleeping warrior, so motionless, Siegfried bent down and listened anxiously for the deep, slow breathing. This coat of mail must weigh heavily on him. I will open it, he said. But in vain he sought to find a fastening. Everywhere the iron rings closed tightly round. To Siegfried, who had never seen a soldier, and knew of no weapon save a sword, this iron garment seemed a terrible inconvenience, almost as cumbersome as old Fafnir's scales. He determined to free the young warrior, that he might at least sleep in comfort. So, taking out his sword, he carefully cut through the rings of mail down each side, and then lifted off the corslet and greaves. As he did so, great was his astonishment to see lying before him a maiden in soft flowing garments. He started back. His heart beat wildly. This must be none other than the maiden Brunhilda, than he who had never before known fear who laughed in the face of the terrible dragon, quailed not before Wotan the mighty god, and dashed fearlessly through fire, sank down trembling and afraid before the sleeping maiden. What is this feeling? Can this be fear? he cried. Awake, awake, O oh beautiful maid, he cried, kneeling at her side. Still, she did not stir. Bending over Brunhilde, Siegfried pressed his lips to hers. Slowly she opened her eyes. Siegfried started back. She sat up dazed and wondering. Then her eyes rested on him. For a moment, neither moved. But the silence between them said more than words, and though only a few brief instants went by, much happened in the time. For Siegfried passed from boyhood to manhood, and Brunhilde passed from the land of dreams and shadows back to the warm living earth. At last she spoke. Hail, thou sunshine and light and lovely daytime! Long has been my sleep. Then, 
fixing shining eyes on Siegfried. And who art thou? she asked. Who hast awakened me out of my sleep? I am Siegfried. Through the flames I won my way to thee. My sword, it has cut through thy armor, O most glorious maiden. Brunhilde gazed at him in wonder and delight. Siegfried, so thou art indeed Siegfried who hast awakened me? Siegfried, of whom in times long past I dreamed. My son art thou, awakening me out of night and darkness. These words made Siegfried happier than ever. Never had his highest hopes or wildest dreams pictured one so fair and noble as this goddess made. For her sake, what would he not do or dare? But Brunhilde was now gazing sadly at her cast-off armor and shield on the ground. Slowly the words of her father's curse were coming back to her. Never more to ride free through the heavens. To be a mortal woman wedded to a mortal man. Gently and sadly she pushed Siegfried from her side and tried to turn his thoughts from herself. See there my faithful steed, she said, pointing to Granny. He also has been awakened by Siegfried the sun god. Once he bore me through the heavens and shared my life among the gods of Valhalla. With me also he slept. See how joyfully he has come back to life. Alas, cried Brunhilde, growing ever more melancholy. Siegfried, my hero, it is through you I forfeit my glorious estate. Brunhilde the Valkyrie is no more. She is dead indeed. Siegfried saw that a harder task yet remained to him than dashing through fire or cutting through steel. But he went on undaunted, for he felt his newfound love strong and great enough to carry him through all difficulties. Thou sleepest still, my beloved. I have but opened thy glorious eyes. Awake and rejoice that thou livest. So spake Siegfried and his passionate pleading turned at last as a magic key the locked door of Brunhilde's proud heart, which to no god or man had yielded before. She turned to him, and as Siegfried clasped her to his heart, Brunhilde renounced forever all she had counted most dear, all longings for the old free Valkyrie life, all dreams of bygone glory with the gods in Valhalla. Now that her heart was won, Brunhilde gave it all, once and forever, and a great and noble gift it was, worth any hero's winning at any cost. End of chapter 2, part 4. Recording by Angela Bodwan. Chapter 3, part 1 of Junior Classics, volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 3, The Story of Lohengrin, Part 1, The Plot Against the Beautiful Elsa of Brabant by Constance Maud. Once upon a time there lived, in the ancient city of Antwerp, a beautiful maiden called Elsa. She dwelt in a grand old palace. The walls were thick as any fortress, and the towers looked proudly down on the town. Elsa's father was the Duke of Brabant, a noble prince who for long years had faithfully served his liege lord, the King of Germany, and had won much honor to Brabant. Elsa had an only brother, the young Prince Godfrey, and these two loved each other more than any other brother and sister in the world. One day, the Duke was taken ill, so ill that he could no longer attend to the affairs of state, and a few days later, all Brabant knew that their beloved Duke lay dying. As their mother had been dead many years, and they had no near relatives, the Duke then sent for his kinsman, Count Talramund. This man was imperious and hot-tempered, with manners uncouth as a bear, but he was brave as a lion, and the duke had full confidence in his good heart and knightly honor. The count hastened to obey the royal summons. My trusted friend and kinsman, Frederick of Telramund, said the duke, I am dying. With my last breath I confide to thy care my beloved children, Elsa and Godfrey. Watch over them. Protect them from all ill, till Godfrey be of an age to reign, and Elsa is married to a husband she loves. Until then, I appoint thee as regent and protector in Brabant. 
Count Tellerman knelt by the side of the dying duke and swore solemnly to fulfill the trust and, if needs be, to lay down his life for the young prince and princess. Thank heaven, murmured the duke, and now, my cousin, is there aught that I can do for thee in return for so great a service? he asked. O oh, most noble prince, there is one boon I would ask. Were it not so great a gift, I scarce dare even to name it, answered the count. Whatever thy wish, cousin, it is granted, if it be in my power to bestow it, said the duke readily. What is thy request? Most gracious sovereign, stammered the count, growing red to the roots of his tawny beard. I love the princess Elsa. Wilt thou give her to me to be my wife? Elsa started. Without stirring and her face deadly pale, she listened breathlessly for her father's reply. Gladly I would give my child to thy safe keeping, noble cousin, but in this matter I must leave the maiden free to choose for herself. If she accept thy hand, thou hast my full consent and blessing. More than this I cannot say. The count knelt and pressed his lips to the hand of the dying duke, who, blessing Tellermund, sank back exhausted and bade him farewell. Shortly after, the good prince died, at peace with all. Elsa, heartbroken at her father's death, found her only consolation in her young brother, Godfrey. For a long time she refused to see anyone else. Count Tellerman often sought opportunity to speak with her, but she avoided him with dread. Then Tellerman changed his tone and demanded her hand as his right, the dying bequest of her father, the duke. My father left me free, answered Elsa, indignant. Never would he wish me to give my hand where I could not give my heart also, Sir Count. No woman and very few men had ever dared to contradict his wishes. Sooner or later, he vowed, she would be his. Now there was a wicked lady of a tall, commanding figure, dark and handsome, or Truda by name. She was very learned and had studied all manner of sorceries, which enabled her to exert the magic power of a witch. Her forefathers had once been mighty princes, who reigned over Brabant and all the countries round. She regarded Elsa and Godfrey as usurpers, holding what rightfully belonged to her, and she hated them with a bitter hatred. Also, there was another and a deeper cause for her hatred towards Elsa, and that was that she herself had long wished to marry Count Tellramund. One day, Tellramund came to Ertruda and told her how Elsa had dared to despise his love and reject his hand. That he should confide in her pleased Ertruda well. Also, that Elsa should refuse the Count, though she loved her none the more for doing so. The impertinent minx to take on such airs! Tellramund found comfort in Ertruda's indignation. His heart was set on marrying Elsa, and he was willing to wait long if only he might win her in the end. When Ortruda saw this, she laid a deep plot by means of which she hoped to turn his love from Elsa. In the depths of the forest was a lonely tower. Here Ortruda was wont to retire and study sorcery for long days and nights together. She became at last so practiced that she could by enchantments change people into different birds and beasts. One day Elsa and Godfrey were roaming together alone in the forest. Ortruda always on the watch, followed them unseen at a distance. After a while, they sat down to rest by the side of a pool, whose still depths, it was said, no one had ever fathomed. Presently, Elsa and Godfrey were startled by hearing a piercing, pitiful cry, like that of some animal caught in a trap. Godfrey started up, crying, I must go and free that poor beast. Rest here a while, Elsa. I will return shortly. He sprang lightly through the thickly growing bushes and trees, and was soon hidden from sight. Elsa waited by the pool, thinking of all the happy plans she and Godfrey had been making for the future, when he would reign as duke. The trees overhead rustled strangely, and Elsa, looking up, saw a great white swan circling round, and waving his wings wildly, as though in distress. Then, with a sad cry, he flew away. Elsa grew uneasy. Surely an hour must have passed. Yet Godfrey had not returned. She called aloud, Godfrey, Godfrey, where art thou? But there was no answer, save the echo of her own voice, which rang through the wood as though mocking her anxious cry. 
Then, in deadly fear, she started up and tried to trace his steps, but the dense thicket left no track. Pale and trembling, Elsa returned at last to the palace and told how Godfrey had mysteriously disappeared. That night, the forest was searched from end to end with torches and lanterns, and all the following day the search continued, but not a trace of the missing boy could be found. Two days after Godfrey's disappearance, Ortruda came to Telramund. She appeared in deep distress, saying she had something to reveal and dared no longer keep silence. Alas, replied Ortruda, what I know is well nigh too terrible to be spoken. Who will credit my dark tale? Listen, she continued, thy search for Godfrey is useless. Two days ago I sat alone meditating in my tower in the forest, when I espied Elsa and Godfrey sitting together by the pool, that awful pool where, tis said, a drowning man may sink for a thousand years, yet never touch the bottom. On a sudden I heard a cry, and looking saw Elsa, aided by a stranger whose face was turned to me, push her young brother backward into the dread pool. Horrible, most horrible, cried Telramund. Thou sawest this with thine own eyes? I saw it with these same eyes, that I will swear, though it were with my last breath, replied Ortruda. Who could dream that such black sin dwelt in one so young and fair? I, said Ortruda, eyeing him askance, and knowing that thou lovest her, I would have kept silence, but when thine enemies whispered that thou, being next of kin, might thyself have caused the lad's disappearance, then my love for thee made me bold to speak the dread secret. I thank thee, Ortruda, thou hast ever shown thyself my faithful friend, said Telramund. It were better had I given my love to thee, instead of wasting it on one so unworthy. My father's house once ruled in this land, and, in justice, should be ruling still. Ah, were poor or true to queen, with what joy would she lay her kingdom at thy feet, noblest and bravest of men. Thou art worthy to be a queen, cried Telramund, and that shalt thou be, noble and wise or true for here do I swear to make thee my wife, instead of her in whom I have been so woefully deceived. As for the murderess, her cruel deed shall be brought to light. She shall be tried by our king, Henry of Germany, and both she and her base lover will assuredly be condemned to death. In obedience to Tellerman's orders, Elsa was then put under arrest and placed in a dark prison cell to await her trial before the king. She was kept a close prisoner, no one save the followers of Tellerman and Ortruda being allowed to come near her. In her grief and despair, she knelt one night and prayed, one long, bitter cry for help. And all at once her prayer seemed taken up, as though on angels' wings, above the narrow prison cell, up, up, till it pierced the utmost heights of the sky above. Elsa listened till she heard the faint echo fade away far overhead, and as she wondered what it might mean, a gentle sleep closed her eyes. She dreamt, and in her dream she saw a noble knight in shining silver armor. Swiftly through the air he came, and descending to her prison cell, stood by her side. No word did he speak, but with looks and signs he bade her banish all fear and sorrow and trust in him, for he was sent by heaven in answer to her cry. When Elsa woke, the bitterness of her grief had passed, the vision had departed, but she felt assured her prayer was heard, and that, sooner or later, the heaven-sent night of her dream would come and bring her deliverance. End of Chapter 3, Part 1 Recording by Myra Parker Chapter 3, Part 2 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Junior Classics, Volume 2. Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 3. The Story of Lohengrin. Part 2. The Knights of the Holy Grail by Constance Maud. 
far away in the mountains of spain there dwelt a holy band of knights vowed to the service of all those in distress or need the famous knight parsifal was at this time king of the order and under his reign the knights of the holy grail were unsurpassed for valor and truth when any cry of distress went up to heaven the great bells of the grail temple would commence to swing slowly to and fro and at this sign the knights assembled in their temple whatever the hour day or night there the holy grail would reveal to them in letters of fire what service was required the same night on which Elsa knelt in her prison cell, far away in Antwerp, the mighty bells of Mount Salvat suddenly broke the stillness of the peaceful night. With Parsifal at their head, the brothers of the Holy Grail hastened to the temple. Among them was one Lohengrin, a young knight of most noble fame, son of Parsifal, the king. Round the altar knelt the knights, while the king mounted the steps and took from a golden shrine the miraculous crystal cup, known as the Holy Grail. A dazzling ray of light instantly streamed down from the dome above the altar, lighting up the cup, which then began to glow with letters of fire written round the brim. Parsifal held the cup aloft, that all might read the message. There is one falsely accused, in sore need and trouble, the Princess Elsa of Brabant so read the writing on the holy grail the glowing letters slowly faded and vanished but while the knights discussed among themselves which of them should at once depart for brabant the cup again glowed with another message let lohengrin the son of parsifal make ready and depart he it is appointed to be her champion lohengrin rejoiced greatly at being chosen kneeling before his father he craved a blessing before setting out on his journey then, buckling on his armor and his sword, a golden horn slung round his neck, he mounted his black charger and rode off into the silent forest. On he rode. The tall, dark pine trees met over his head. The silver moon peeped between the branches, lighting him on his way. All the forest slept. At length, he came to the river which marked the boundary of the Grail Dominions. He was about to ford the stream when, to his amazement, he beheld a boat drawn by a snow-white swan evidently awaiting him lohengrin dismounted and recognized the swan as a bird which had not long since appeared among them and taken up his abode with the knights as a white swan had always been held in good omen by the knights the bird received a hearty welcome and the more so when shortly after his arrival the grail revealed that the bird was none other than a youth of noble birth, the innocent victim of a wicked enchantment. Round the swan's neck was a fine gold chain of curious workmanship, with neither clasp nor fastening, so that no man could remove it without injury to the bird. From the day he appeared, the swan attached himself specially to Lohengrin. He would follow him about like a dog, and often gazed into his face as though he longed to speak with him seeing this faithful bird awaiting him lohengrin asked him wilt thou that i go with thee dear swan the bird instantly bent his graceful head and spread wide his white wings as though impatient to start lohengrin then dismissed his horse bidding him return to mount salvat stepped into the boat and the swan sailed away joyfully with him down the river they floated swiftly the swan seemed quite sure of his way even when they came at last to the sea, he never paused, but steered a steady course right out of the bay and away across the wide ocean. End of chapter 3, part 2. Recording by Myra Parker. Chapter 3, part 3 of Junior Classics, volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 3 The Story of Lohengrin. Part 3 Lohengrin, the Champion of Elsa of Brabant. By Constance Maud. In the city of Antwerp, great preparations were going forward. 
king henry of germany had arrived in state and had summoned all the ministers and chief nobles of brabant to appear before him elsa in her prison cell had wakened early with the news that she would be tried this day before the king in face of all the people she heard as though it scarce concerned her since the vision of the knight in shining armor she no longer seemed to dwell in the dark prison her thoughts were far away and she cared nothing for what took place around her it was noon when the king with his heralds outriders and a numerous retinue proceeded in solemn state to the judgment oak mid the cheers and blessings of the people he ascended a gorgeous throne prepared for him count tellerman bowed low before the king then in a clear ringing voice told his story and made his accusation against elsa princess of brabant of whose horrible crime he said he had alas convincing proof he then claimed the kingdom of brabant for himself as next of kin to the late duke and also in right of his noble wife ortruda whose fathers once ruled in that land now o most noble king thou hast heard me fully he concluded not have i spoken but the truth my oath upon it be thou our judge the crowd shuddered with horror at the story of elsa's crime their own princess so gentle and fair the cruel murderess of her brother impossible yet who dare dispute it since count tellerman whose honor no man could doubt himself swore to the fact what terrible accusation dost thou bring bid the accused appear cried the king the trial shall forthwith begin the herald blew his trumpet and proclaimed the king's order there was a stir in the crowd all eyes turned toward her as elsa appeared followed by her ladies slowly she walked to the foot of the throne gazing before her like one in a dream art thou elsa of brabant asked the king elsa bowed her head dost thou know the charge that is brought against thee he demanded sternly again elsa assented dropping her head sadly but without speaking what answer canst thou make dost admit thy guilt the king inquired she gazed around her with a bewildered air as though trying to remember something long forgotten alas she sighed my poor brother the people murmured tis marvellous what can it mean speak elsa urged the king wondering at her strange behavior dost thou not trust in thy king then elsa spoke in a low gentle voice as to herself when alone in the prison in my misery i knelt one night and besought god's aid my woeful cry seemed all at once caught up to the highest heaven i listened wondering then peace fell on my spirit and a gentle sleep came over me the king thought elsa's mind was certainly affected whether from brooding on her crime or in her innocence and the injustice of her imprisonment he could not tell come elsa he said in a rousing tone defend thyself now before the judge but Elsa appeared neither to hear nor understand, and continued her dream with a look of rapture. Born through the air he came, a knight of such perfection and nobility never yet I saw. Clothed in glittering armor, in his hand a sword, slung round his neck a golden horn. No word he spake, but gazed on me tenderly. Peace and comfort came to me with his look. That knight will be my champion and deliverer. The king was sorely perplexed. This dreamy maiden hardly seemed like a criminal. Looking at the sad, fair face of the prisoner, he could not find it in his heart to believe her guilty. Yet he held the count as a true and honorable knight, incapable of falsehood, one who had, besides, risked his life for king and country. Turning to the count, he then asked solemnly, Frederick of Tellermond, wilt thou in mortal combat let heaven's ordeal decide thine accusation as true or false yea that will i o king answered tellermond with proud confidence and thee also i ask elsa of brabant wilt thou abide by heaven's decree in the mortal combat that shall be fought for thy cause elsa's eyes were fixed in the far distance yea that will i she replied slowly what champion shall defend thee asked the king that knight whom heaven sent me he and none other shall be my champion replied elsa and this is the reward i offer 
he shall wear my father's crown and high honor i shall deem it to give him my land my wealth and my hand a prize worth fighting for murmured the people their hearts beat true to their princess in spite of appearances against her let the summons go forth cried the king the heralds and trumpeters then marched to the outposts and proclaimed the challenge so that all might hear it far and near let him who will fight in mortal combat for elsa of brabant now appear there was a long pause and breathless silence followed the echo of the trumpet's blast died away into the distance but no one appeared in answer to the call elsa listened looking round on all sides with anxious expectant gaze o gracious king implored elsa i beseech thee let the call go forth once again to summon my knight he dwells so far he has not heard let the summons go forth yet once more he ordered again the heralds proclaimed the challenge there followed a longer pause and a longer silence no one stirred the people scarcely seemed to breathe so great was the suspense and expectation elsa fell on her knees while her maidens closed round as though to protect her o oh lord she cried send my knight speedily i beseech thee once at thy command he came to me o oh, send him now again tell him of my sore need she implored in despair her women knelt also weeping and praying suddenly a cry went up from the people standing near the river bank see a wondrous sight a swan a swan drawing a boat and standing in the prow behold a knight in shining armor lo he comes with utmost speed all rushed forward eagerly to see the king from his throne looked towards the river and beheld the amazing sight elsa on her knees listened spellbound in a transport of joy frederick of telramund struck dumb with awe and astonishment looked at ortruda her face had turned an ashen hue her glittering eyes were dull as though the light within had suddenly gone out she gazed at the swan with greater terror than had he been a dragon tis a miracle a miracle of heaven exclaimed the men the women on their knees cried joyfully o oh god be thanked who hast heard our prayer hail to the heaven-sent one who comes to save the guiltless the boat had now reached the bank lohengrin stepped lightly to land and then turned lovingly to the swan my thanks to thee beloved swan he said return now o'er the waters to the blessed land from whence we came faithfully hast thou fulfilled thy task farewell beloved swan he gazed sadly after his faithful companion as the swan slowly turned and swam away the crowd made way for him eagerly as lohengrin advanced to the king's throne and bowed low as he raised his head elsa turned and uttered a cry of joy at beholding no other than the knight of her vision hail royal henry may the blessing of heaven ever rest on thee said lohengrin welcome sir knight replied the king graciously surely by a miracle divine thou art come to this land i have been sent o king to fight for the honor of an innocent maiden in sore need and distress answered lohengrin then going before elsa he asked her wilt thou trust thy cause to me o elsa of brabant wilt thou take me for thy champion without doubt or fear elsa raised her eyes to his my deliverer my knight with my whole heart do i trust thee she answered lohengrin knelt and taking her hand in his asked and if with heaven's help i win this fight for thee wilt thou consent to be my bride i am thine thine only my knight all i have i give thee gladly said elsa with shining eyes one promise wilt thou give me to thee i will promise anything elsa answered readily then if thou desirest as i that nothing part us ever that thy people and thy country become from henceforth my people and my country never shalt thou ask of me my name and race or whence i come said lohengrin earnestly never will i seek to know thy secret thy love is enough for me naught else do i desire but elsa think well what it is i ask urged lohengrin never must thou desire this knowledge and never must this secret between us cause thee sadness 
Elsa was troubled that Lohengrin repeated his request. There was nothing in the world she would not gladly grant him, her champion, her deliverer. Thou hast never doubted my innocence, she answered. Dost thou not trust in me? And shall not I also trust in thee, my knight, whate'er thou askest of me? Then Lohengrin stood forth, and in a ringing voice that all might hear proclaimed, Hear now, all ye people and ye nobles of Brabant. I hereby declare before heaven and before all men, by my honor as a knight, that free from every shadow of guilt is the maiden Elsa, princess of Brabant. False and unfounded is thy black charge, Frederick of Telramund, and that will I prove by heaven's ordeal. Telramund advanced with angry mien and flashing eyes. What magic brought thee here, sir stranger, I know not. Thy talk is bold enough, but my answer is not in words. This, my good sword, shall defend mine honor. May victory be to right and truth, say I. Lohengrin turned towards the throne. We await thy command, O king, to commence the combat. The king ordered the fighting ring to be measured, and this being done, he then besought heaven that in this fight victory might be, not as in other fights, to skill and strength, but to the one on whose side was right. And all the people fervently echoed the good king's prayer scarce a breath could be heard every eye was fixed on the gleaming swords as they cut the air like flashes of lightning and clashed with sharp ringing strokes a few intense moments which seemed to elsa's beating heart a very eternity then a crash of falling armor a wild shout from the people and the fight was over telramund had fallen over him like an angel of judgment stood lohengrin through heaven's victory thy life is mine he cried i give it thee again that thou mayest use it for repentance victory victory hail to the hero shouted a thousand glad voices the victory i owe to thy innocence alone said lohengrin to elsa all that thou hast suffered shall now be atoned to thee then Lohengrin and Elsa were lifted to the shields of the nobles, and all the people marched round them in a triumphal procession, shouting a hymn of joyful thanksgiving, in which the good King Henry himself joined lustily. Only Ertruda and the defeated Telramund stood sullenly apart. Woe is me! Mine honor and fame are undone, muttered the Count. It would seem indeed that heaven is against me. Ortruda, with clenched hands, asked herself in dismay, Who can this be, before whom even I feel my powers weaken? Who, and from whence? End of chapter 3, part 3 Recording by Myra Parker Chapter 3, part 4 of Junior Classics, volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 3 The Story of Lohengrin, Part 4 Ortruda plots for revenge by constance maud the stars came out in the deep blue sky of night waiting for the summer moon the stately walls of the royal palace of antwerp threw mysterious shadows all around and in the darkness of these shadows crept two figures stealthily they seated themselves at length under a tree which faced the windows of the princess elsa's apartments looking up they saw a light still burning then they talked together earnestly in muffled tones by and by the moon arose and cast her silvery light about shifting the shadows according to her royal pleasure the two dark figures a man and a woman moved with the shadows still keeping close to the palace they took no thought of rest or sleep that night the man looked at the woman and shuddered the woman turned to the man, a scornful light in her eyes. She was for action, and despised useless regrets and groans. Frederick of Telramund, why dost thou mistrust me? she asked quietly. 
why he cried wrathfully was it not on thy false word that i accused the guiltless and condemned an innocent maid thou who didst swear that thine own eyes beheld her murder the youthful godfrey dost thou know who is this mysterious hero drawn hither across the sea by a wild swan she asked nay i know not he answered hearken now to me said ortruda it is forbidden him to reveal either his name or country that his own words aloud the reason i will tell thee should he do so all his magic power instantly vanishes there is but one person who can tear his secret from him she whom he so strictly forbade to ask him ha elsa she must be made to do this cried telramund eagerly ortruda looked at him and smiled her smile was very terrible if thou wilt be but silent and watchful thou shalt taste the sweets of revenge but hist the window opposite opened softly ortruda and telramund drew back farther into the shadow a white-robed figure came out on the balcony ortruda whispered in telramund's ear go thou and leave her alone with me and frederick withdrew elsa cried a wailing miserable voice Elsa started. Who calls me? Is my voice so strange to thee? Answered Ortruda piteously. Wilt thou repulse one in sore distress? Ortruda, thou, what doest thou here, and at this hour, unhappy woman? Asked Elsa in surprise. Ah, woe is me, moaned Ortruda. What have I done that such dark trouble should fall on me? How different thy fate! After a brief time of trouble, every cloud has vanished, and life smiles gloriously before thee. Most unworthy should I be of my great happiness, could I spurn one in misery such as thine, Ortruda. Come, I myself will open the door to you. Ortruda, where art thou? called the gentle voice of Elsa, opening the door. Here at thy feet, replied Ortruda, throwing herself down before the white-robed figure kneel not to me i beseech thee ortruda cried elsa much distressed thou whom i have always beheld in pride and magnificence freely i forgive thee and if in aught thou hast suffered through my fault i pray thee pardon me in like manner how can i thank thee for such gracious favor returned ortruda in tones of great humility and for thy husband telramund continued elsa i will beseech my noble bridegroom on the morrow that he show him grace and pardon so let me see thee once more restored to happiness arrayed in thy robe of state come thou with me to the minister where our marriage will to-morrow be celebrated before god and all men thou loadest me with chains of gratitude said ortruda only one way is there in which i may perhaps repay thee by my knowledge of the hidden arts i may be able to protect thy life and warn thee should grave danger arise what meanest thou asked elsa in astonishment trust not thy happiness too blindly replied ortruda darkly lest some evil entrap thee unawares ortruda drew closer and lowered her voice dost know by what magic art he came to thee end of chapter three part four recording by myra parker chapter three part five of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 3, The Story of Lohengrin, Part 5. The Departure of Lohengrin, by Constance Maud it was princess elsa's wedding day the sober city of antwerp had blossomed out in colors gay as a spring garden with banners ribbons garlands of flowers and triumphal arches not a burgher or a prentice but kept holiday royal weddings were not an everyday sight more especially when the bride was a princess of such beauty and virtue and the bridegroom a knight who had risked his life for her sake 
every maid in antwerp would gladly have gone through fire and water just for a sight of the knight in silver armor greatly were those envied who had seen him arrive drawn by the snow-white swan the bells of the old cathedral rang out a joyful chime from every quarter came a stream of people all hurrying to secure the best places from which to see the bridal procession guarding the entrance of the cathedral on either side were stationed knights and nobles in full court dress ablaze with medals and decorations helmets and waving plumes she comes she comes make way for the bride sang a chorus of voices and elsa appeared more beautiful than a spring morning little children clad in white strewed her path with flowers maidens of high degree followed bearing her bridal train never had a fairer happier maid passed through the ancient doorway to become a bride smiling and bowing graciously elsa ascended the cathedral steps when suddenly her way was barred by a tall commanding figure who pushed through the astonished crowd and stood before her it was ortruda back i say she cried wrathfully thinkest thou that i am going to follow thee like a serving maid no longer will i suffer it the time has come when thou shalt bow before me the attendants and courtiers stood aghast the woman must be mad they exclaimed to one another elsa could scarce believe that this was the same ortruda who a few hours before had knelt in the dust at her feet pale and trembling she cried ortruda is it possible what has happened to change thee thus terribly ortruda gave a mocking laugh thinkest thou she answered that because i foolishly forgot my high position and my worth for one short hour i must forever after approach thee crawling my lord was first in all the land not a foe but feared his sword not a tongue but spake his praise but thy hero no man ever heard of him thou thyself canst not even give him a name the people murmured indignantly will no man silence this slanderous woman but all trembled remembering her reputation as a witch and not daring to brave her wrath fortunately at this moment appeared the king's outriders followed by the royal bodyguard and king henry himself riding side by side with the bridegroom what ho cried the king looking at the threatening figure standing across the bride's path who dares to make stripe on a wedding morn lohengrin hastened to elsa's side what do i see why is this terrible woman near thee he asked oh my deliverer protect me from her pardon me that i forgot thy warning seeing her in misery at my door last night i took her in behold now how she turns on me and mocks me for my trust in thee lohengrin stood between ortruda and the trembling elsa be gone thou fearful woman he cried carry elsewhere thy poison here is no soil in which it can take root hold there cried a loud harsh voice o king here can i pray greatly hast thou been deceived the combat was no heaven's ordeal for by the evil power of magic justice was turned aside here before all men i challenge him the impostor to declare his name and race and from where he came drawn hither by that unholy bird if he dare not say methinks it looks bad for his knightly truth and honor i appeal to thee illustrious prince demand thou a reply from this unknown hero he will scarcely dare to call thee unworthy of his answer lohengrin confronted the wrathful telramund all honor would i ever show to his most illustrious majesty but there is one only to whom i am bound to reveal my secret that one is elsa my bride lohengrin feared for one dread moment that the wicked ortruda's poison had after all begun to work one moment only then to his joy elsa raised her head and shaking off all doubt she cried what he keeps secret that he does in wisdom she whom he has saved shall she not trust him and the king added heartily my hero pay no regard to evil speakers thou art too far above them for such to tarnish thy spotless fame the nobles then pressed round lohengrin assuring him of their trust and devotion even though he should never see fit to reveal his name and the wedding procession entered the cathedral in solemn state 
when the wedding feast was over and the wedding guests had gone elsa and lohengrin sat at the window looking out on the starlit night elsa sighed a tiny cloud crept over her heart at the thought that she knew no name by which to call her love lohengrin noticed it and strove to turn her thoughts from the dangerous subject but elsa continued as though forced to return to it ah show thou thinkest me worthy of thy trust now that we are alone tell me thy secret and let it be buried in my heart safe where never the world can reach it have i not shown thee highest trust answered lohengrin i have trusted in thy promise now my greatest joy is in thy love it is the only reward i ask for all i have left behind for not out of night and sorrow did i come to thee but out of light and glory alas cried elsa then art thou farther removed and i yet more unworthy than e'er i dreamt any day may rob me of thee ere long thou wilt surely regret thy humble choice and long after thy departed glory tears blinded her eyes lohengrin saw too late that what he had told her but increased her doubt and unhappiness she longed now more than ever to be trusted with his secret the fear lest thou depart will haunt me day and night who is this unknown one whence comes he no peace now for elsa day or night until she can answer alas she cried it was by a miracle thou camest here thy path is hidden like thyself in mystery thy life is divided from mine by a cloud ah look she cried clutching wildly lohengrin's arm see the swan he comes there down the river he brings the boat thou hast called him oh elsa cease this madness cried lohengrin in despair nothing can give me peace again till i know even though it cost me my life who thou art and whence thou comest alas groaned lohengrin covering his face with his hands so absorbed were they both that they did not hear the stealthy tread upon the stair nor the low muffled voices outside the door suddenly there was a crash the door was broken open and a group of dark figures cloaked and masked barred the passage while one of the number rushed towards lohengrin drawing his naked sword it was the work of an instant lohengrin had but time to seize his sword when the stalwart figure closed with him in the flickering torchlight he parried the foe's first deadly thrust and before he had time for a second the trusty sword of lohengrin had pierced to his traitorous heart with a deep groan he fell back and elsa beheld as she suspected the face of frederick of telramund hearing the noise elsa's attendants and guards now crowded into the room the dark masked figures had fled on seeing their master fall lohengrin turned to the guards and bade them bear the body of telramund before the king's judgment seat then to elsa's attendants who supported their fainting mistress he said sadly make her ready to appear before the king there i will meet her and answer her question who i am and from whence i come at noon next day king henry held a review of his troops before leaving antwerp the king desired to collect forces for a war against the savage drones who were threatening the peace of germany the king counted greatly on lohengrin's help for never had he seen one more fitted to command and lead his troops but now the appointed hour had come and still the king waited for the arrival of the night presently all were startled by the appearance of a solemn procession bearing in their midst the body of a dead man make way whispered the crowd awestruck these are the followers of telramund close on them followed elsa and her ladies alas how changed from the happy bride of yesterday ah here he comes our hero cried the people as lohengrin at length appeared welcome sir knight said the king we look to thee to lead these brave troops on to victory alas my lord the king answered lohengrin it is not possible for me now to lead thy soldiers as i hoped heaven help us what means this cried the king dismayed not only at lohengrin's words but by his sad solemn bearing first i ask thy righteous judgment before all the people concerning this man he pointed to the body of telramund in the middle of the night he fell on me unawares was i right in that i slew him 
thy hand was but the instrument of a just heaven in so slaying him replied the king sternly regarding the dead traitor ye heard all how she my bride gave me her promise that never would she ask who i am or from whence i came now alas she has broken that promise she has listened to traitorous counsel now hear all ye people whether my secret is one to be ashamed of before king nobles and the world lohengrin raised his voice till it rang on all sides like a clarion in the distant land far from hence is a mountain named mount salvat in the midst stands a temple none on earth can compare with its magnificence therein is guarded a sacred treasure brought thither years ago by an angel host it is the holy grail the knight who serves the grail derives divine strength from the power of its might before him evil flies and death itself is vanquished even when far away in distant lands so long as the knight remains unknown the grail still renews his strength but the working of the holy grail must ever remain veiled once the source of mystery is revealed the blessings granted must be withdrawn such is the grail's command i was hither sent to you by order of the grail my father is parsifal the king i am his warrior lohengrin elsa listened like one hearing her death sentence had not her lady supported her she must have fallen oh elsa he cried mournfully why didst thou tear my secret from me now alas we are parted for ever the swan the swan cried a chorus of voices near the bank of the river elsa turned to look and there sailing swiftly towards them came the snow-white swan drawing the small boat in which the shining knight had arrived oh my elsa he said the grail has sent for me i dare not tarry one year only and i might have had the joy of seeing thee again united to thy long-lost brother for he is not dead and by the might of the grail he was then to be restored to thee now hearken should he return give him these my sword and horn and ring the sword will bring him victory in battle the horn will bring him help in time of need and the ring he shall wear in memory of me farewell my beloved bride farewell forever end of chapter three part five recording by myra parker Chapter 3, Part 6 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Myra Parker. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 3. THE STORY OF LOHENGRIN PART Six, THE WOOING OF THE DAUGHTER OF THE KING OF IRELAND FROM THE GUDRUN LAY When Hedel, the young king of Denmark, but newly crowned, was minded to take him a wife, he sent and gathered together his high vassals and lieges to his palace in Heigelingen to give him counsel and morung of niflund said to the king there is one maiden that for comeliness surpasseth all others in the world that is hilda daughter of wild hagen king of ireland and she is peerless that may be so answered the king but hagen is waxed so proud that there is no dealing with him by fair words and many kings and jarls which sought to carry her off by strength of arm now sleep the sword sleep because of her then spake the sweet-voiced horrent full well i know the maiden she is radiant as the soft new snow beneath the dawn stern as her father and cruel as the north wind that tears the clouds and breaks the sea and shakes the pines in his fists wherefore if the king must send a messenger let him not choose me fruit spake also neither am i fain to go upon this errand but let the king send and summon jarl wait of sturman he is more reckless than any man and heedeth no living thing but when jarl wait was come before the king and understood what was required of him he was but ill-pleased and said 
i ween horrent and fruit to have counselled thee in this and to have done in no friendly wise toward me howbeit i am not the man to pick an enterprise that hath no peril in it i will go but since horrent and fruit esteem my life so lightly they shall go likewise then Uralt of ortland and morung said it is well spoken and inasmuch as it behoveth none to hang back when brave men take their lives in their hands we also will go with them so the king made ready a great ship of cypress wood in fashion like a dragon it was all aglow with golden scales the anchor was of silver and the steering paddle overlaid with gold within he furnished it abundantly with victual for the voyage with armor and raiment and presents of great price then jarl wait and morung horrent and fruit and jarlt entered into the ship with seven hundred of their men they drew aloft the embroidered sail a fair wind arose and bore them out of harbor for many days they tilled the barren sea-fields until weary of sea toil they saw the welcome land and steered in for castle balian where hagen the king kept court being come to shore horrent and Uralt took precious jewels in their hands worth many thousand marks and leaving their men hidden in the ship came to king hagen saying behold we have voyaged from a far country where we have heard of thy fame and we pray thee take these presents at our hands hagen looked at the jewels and marvelled at their great worth he said what kings are ye and whence have you come with all this treasure horrent answered saying banished folk are we hast thou not heard of haddle who is king in heigelingen and of his might and majesty of the battles he has fought and the riches he has gathered together he despiseth such as we and being well befriended careth nothing for his men wherefore a few of us weary of his overbearing ways have left him seeking service then said hagen ye shall abide with me and he commanded to make ready lodgings for them in the city but horrent and Uralt gave gold away so lavishly to all within the city that the people said of a truth these must be the richest kings of the earth and the fair hilda hearing of it desired greatly to see these strangers wherefore her father bade them to a feast the danish knights came at his bidding arrayed most sumptuously and the feast being over and the wine outpoured the queen and hilda left the table desiring that the guests might be brought to them in the inner chamber first jarl wait went in a huge and burly man with a great rough beard and brawny hands but when the queen bade him sit between her and the princess he blushed and stammered and then blundered shamefaced to the seat thou art strangely ill at ease in company of ladies said the queen ay mistress said jarl wait i am not over smooth of tongue i am not skilled to lisp about the weather what shall i say this seat is soft enough i never mind me to have sat so soft before nor to have wrought so hard in doing it by my life good ladies he cried upstarting a good day's battle with a brisk enemy never wearied me so much or made me deem myself so great a fool hilda and her mother laughed pleasantly at his bluff behavior and sought to put him at ease but wait would have no more he strode off to the hall among the king and his men and in an hour or so became himself again for the king won on him hagen's big voice his battle knowledge and his love of fight opened jarl wait's heart and the two were soon made friends but for the women there was none in their esteem like the sweet-voiced horrent he was fair to look upon as a woman yet had no lack of courage in the battle time his wit was quick and when he talked his face was in a glow at sight of the strange pictures in his mind whereby he likened things to one another in curious sort so that all which heard him wondered and were glad now hagen spake much with weight concerning sword-play and the mystery thereof so presently jarl wait besought the king to appoint him a master of fence to teach him a little of it because fencing after their manner was a thing in which he was little learned 
Then King Hagen sent for the best fence-master that he had, and set him to teach Jarl Waite the rules of sword-play, but quickly losing patience at the long list of early rules which the fence-master laid down, Hagen caught the foil from out of his hands, crying, Away with you! Why all this stuff? In four strokes I will teach this man to use a sword. So the king fell to with weight whom however he very soon found an exceeding skilful master of fence thereat being somewhat angry he struck in fiercely and they both carried on the sport till the buttons flew off the foils yet neither gat the better of the other then hagen throwing down his foil cried in sooth never saw i youth learn so quickly and Uralt said there is very little wherein the serving men of our lord's country are not already learned so as jarl waite and his fellows abode continually at the king's court and feasted with him every day it befell once on a time when night was past and the day had begun to dawn that horrent arose and tuned his voice to a song the birds waking in the hedges had begun to sing but hearing music sweeter than theirs they held their peace ever higher and sweeter Horrent lifted his song till it rang about the palace, and all the sleepers dreamed of Baldur and his home in Gansblick in the sky. Soon they woke, nor were they sorry to lose their dreams at hearing Horrent's song. Hagen heard it and rose up from his bed. Hilda and her maidens heard it and arose. Men and women came thronging to thank the singer, but when they came, the song was done yet none the more would the birds begin their lays they had lost their notes from wonder then hilda besought her father that by any means he should constrain horrent to sing again and hagen being no less crazed with the song recked not for aught else and he promised the singer a thousand pounds of gold by weight if he would sing again at eve at evening horrent sang the people filled the hall and flocked about the castle for a great space. The sick came thither and remembered their pains no more. The beasts in the forest and the cattle in the fields left their food. The worms forgot to go in the grass and the fishes left swimming in the sea. And when the song was done and the folk went their ways, they heard the minster choirs and the chiming of the bells, but took no more pleasure in them hilda sent twelve purses of gold to horrent entreating him to come and sing to her in her chamber the singer came and sang the song of a meal the like whereof no man had ever heard save on the wild flute no gold was ever so good the maiden laid her hand within the singer's and bade him choose whatever he listed for a song gift he said i pray thee give me but the girdle from thy waist that i may take it to my master she asked who is thy master he answered no banished men are we but servants of hedel king of denmark come to woo thee for his bride then hilda said so thou couldst always sing to me at morn and eve i would not care whose bride i were horrent said lady within my master's courts abide twelve minstrels better far than i and yet with all the sweetness of their singing my lord sings best of all and hilda said if that be so i fain would follow thee and be king hedel's bride but i know not how my father will give me to no suitor with his good will i would go but i durst not horrent answered her since thou wouldst be it ours to dare we ask no more then Horrent and his comrades got ready their ship for sea, and afterward they came to Hagen, saying, The time for our departure draweth nigh, and we must sail to other lands. But before we go, we pray you bring the queen and your fair daughter, that they may see the treasures which we have within the ship. So on the next day after mass, King Hagen came down to the beach with his queen and the fair Hilda and her maids with them went a thousand good knights of ireland the ship was swung to a single cable the anchor aboard the sail tackle free upon the sands were spread the danish treasure chests filled with costly raiment embroidered with gold and jewels there was a crowding round the chest to see jarl waite was there and fruit and horrent and in the crowding hilda was parted from her mother 
Hagen and his knights saw nothing for the crowd, and the queen forgot her daughter at beholding the glories of the raiment. But suddenly they heard a shout, and looking up, beheld Jarl Wait leap on the bulwarks with fair Hilda in his arms. The next moment Horrent and Fruit sprang on board with two other maidens. Jarl smote at the cable with his axe. It parted. The sail was hauled aloft, and twenty oars shot out from either side to lift the ship along. Hagen and his knights ran quickly down into the sea, but the rowers rowed hard, and armed men in the ship arose, seven hundred strong, and laid about them. Short was the fight, and soon the vessel reached deep water. Loud laughed the Danes, to see on the fading shore the angry crowd, the weeping queen, and Hagen, raging like a madman up to his waist in the sea fast sped the ship and the wind was fair the danes made hagelingen in ten days and hedel was wed to hilda with great joy but while they yet sat at the marriage feast hagen's warship bore down upon their coast quickly the danes rose from the tables put their armor on and ran down to the shore Hagen drave his ship upon the sand and leaped into the water with his men. A shower of arrows thick as hail was his greeting. Hedel rushed foremost to withstand him. There was fierce fighting between the two for a little space. Then Hedel fell, sore wounded, and over his body Hagen and his knights pressed on and hewed their way to land. Fast fell the men, both Danes and Irelanders. Then Jarl Waite encountered Hagen, and the battle anger fell on both the men. They fought like wild beasts of the wood, till, Waite being wounded on the head, Hagen's war-pike break at the next blow he struck. Meantime, the battle raged furiously. The Irelanders kept their footing, but could not drive back the Danish men. The numbers slain on either hand were equal, man for man. Then, Hedel's wounds being bound up, the Danish king cried out to Hagen, Of what avail shall it be to you or me to fight this battle out? For every man of mine that falls, a man of thine goes down. When it is done, there will be an end to Danes and Irelanders alike. But if thou must needs prolong the fight, I will now meet thee. And if Hilda weeps for a dead husband, she shall mourn a dead father too. Then Hagen cast down his sword and called off his men, and he said to Hedel, Give me thy hand, for in sooth my child has married a brave man, and had I half a score more daughters, they should all come to Hagelingen. So the kings made peace together, and the marriage feast was all begun again, and kept for twelve days in King Hedel's palace. Moreover, a wise woman brought forth herbs and roots and healed the warriors of their wounds. And after the feasting, Hagen and his men were loaded with gifts, and they entered into their ship and departed to Ireland. End of chapter 3, part 6. Recording by Myra Parker. Chapter 4, Part 1 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folktales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folktales and Myths, by William Patton. Three Tales of the Rhine, Part 1, The Lady of Kynast, by Xavier B. Saintine. The Lady of Kynast owned a large domain, and on this domain a ruined old tower which stood on the summit of a steep high rock surrounded on all sides by a deep abyss. Rich, young, and beautiful, eagerly sought for by a number of admirers, the Lady of Kynast did not think, in her desire to keep them from becoming too pressing, of undertaking an endless piece of embroidery like Penelope. She did not embroider, in fact she looked with contempt and almost with disgust, upon every kind of work that was done by women. She told her admirers that she was betrothed to Kynast, this was the name of the old tower, and that any one who thought of winning her good graces would first have to compete with her betrothed. To do this, nothing was required but to climb up the rock in the tower, and having reached the battlements, 
to make a complete round not on foot however or assisted by the hands and knees but on horseback without other assistance than the bridle the flock of lovers took flight instantly only two remained two brothers who had completely lost their heads after having cast lots the first one attempted the task and seemed on the point of being successful but that was all he had no sooner reached the crenellated top of the old tower than he was seized with vertigo and instantly fell into the abyss the second brother in his turn climbed to the top and actually succeeded in riding some distance along the battlements but soon his horse feeling the stone slipping from under its hoofs and the whole tower rocking under the weight refused to go on determined to carry through the undertaking he encouraged his horse with his voice and with his spurs but the poor animal remained immovable apparently wedged in between the large stones of the tower in the morning both horse and rider had disappeared for quite a while no other claimants appeared to woo the fair lady when suddenly one day a third lover presented himself and asked leave to attempt a trial she did not know who it was and this surprised her for how could he have fallen in love with her he might possibly have seen her on her balcony or at some royal feast perhaps he was only allured by a great reputation however there was nothing to lose by accepting the offer for some days a thick heavy fog had shrouded the castle and the old tavern from top to bottom so as to make the ascent impossible the simple laws of hospitality required therefore that the lady should offer her castle to the newly arrived knight he proved to be a handsome man with a fine commanding figure and the large number of his servants bespoke his high rank and large fortune during three days he spent almost all his time with the young lady but as yet he had not dared say a word of his love on her side however the young lady felt herself gradually conquered by a feeling which had until now been unknown to her heart when the dense veil of mist was at length torn aside and the kindness shone forth in its full splendour she was on the point of telling the knight that she would not insist on the trial in his case when the moment came the lady of kynast felt her heart fail her she shut herself in she wept and she cried and prayed that he might be successful loud clamours were heard below and as she thought the spectators were bewailing the death of her last lover she fainted away cries of joy and triumph roused her again the knight had successfully accomplished the task overcome she rushes to meet him and in her excitement she forgets that all eyes are upon her and breathlessly cries out my hand is yours but he draws himself up to his full height and haughtily and harshly he replies with a proud smile have i ever asked you for your hand i only came to avenge my two brothers whom you have killed and i have done it for i do not could not love you and yet you love me farewell that same evening the wretched lady had herself conducted up to the top of the tower from whence she wished she said to watch the setting sun she was never seen alive again end of chapter four part one recording by phone chapter four part two of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phone junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton three tales of the rhine part two the guardian angel by xavier b st time a white figure appeared before the young girl as she awoke i am your guardian angel then you will grant me the wishes which i shall mention i shall carry them to god's throne you may count upon my assistance what are your wishes oh white angel i am tired of continually turning the spindle and my fingers are getting to be so hard by constant work that yesterday at the dance my partner might have imagined he was holding a wooden hand your partner was that fine-looking gentleman from hesse did he not tell you that he adored blue eyes and fair hair and that he would make you a baroness if you would go home with him if you would wickedly run away white angel make me a baroness 
The evening of that day a young peasant came and asked Louisa's mother for her daughter's hand. The mother said yes. White angel, deliver me from this poor man. I want to be a baroness. The mother, who was a sensible woman, and a widow, had good sense enough and energy enough for two. The white angel did not appear again, and Louisa married the peasant, and she kept on turning the spindle. One day her husband, who was a hard-working man, had overexerted himself and was taken ill. In the meantime, Louisa had seen her handsome gentleman again. "'White angel,' she said, "'he loves me still. He has sworn he would marry me if I were a widow.' She dared not say more. The husband recovered from his illness. The white angel still turned a deaf ear to her wishes. She lost all hope of ever becoming a baroness. Later her husband became more successful, so that his work alone supplied all their wants. Two beautiful children had come to gladden their lives, and now, when Louisa worked at the spindle, it felt quite soft in her fingers. One evening, when she was only half asleep, the white figure appeared once more, and a gentle voice whispered in her ear this story. A little fish was merrily swimming about in the water, and looking seriously at a pretty black cap which first circled around and around in the air, and then alighted on a branch of a willow, which grew close to the bank of the river. Oh, said the little fish, how happy that bird is! It can rise up to the heavens and go high up to the sun to warm itself in its rays. Why cannot I do the same? The black cap, who was looking down at the fish, thought to himself, Oh, how happy that fish is! The element in which it lives furnishes it at the same time with food. It has nothing to do but to glide along. How I should like to sport in the fresh, transparent water! At that moment, a kite pounced upon the poor little fish, while a scamp of a schoolboy threw a stone at the bird. The black cap fell into the water, the fresh transparent water, and for a moment struggled in it before it died, while the little fish, carried aloft, could go up on high to the sun and warmed itself in its rays. Their wishes had been granted. End of chapter 4, part 2. Recording by phone. Chapter 4, part 3. Of Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Three Tales of the Rhine, Part 3 The Giant Who Laughed at a Dwarf by Xavier B. St. Time. An old duke of Bavaria had at his court a dwarf named Ephesim, and a giant named Grummelund. The giant laughed at the dwarf, and the dwarf threatened to box his ears. Grummelund laughed a big hoarse laugh that seemed to come up from his toes and dared Ephesim to go ahead. The dwarf accepted this challenge at once, and the duke, having been a witness of the scene, ordered that a field for a single combat should be gotten ready. Everybody expected to do as the giant had done, and laugh at the pygmy, as the poor little fellow was hardly two feet high, and would have had to climb a long way before reaching the giant's ears. The dwarf began by walking all around the giant, as if to take his measure. The good-natured giant, standing up immovable, looks down upon him and quietly laughs till his sides shake, but while he is holding his hands to his sides, the dwarf unties his shoestrings and then worries him by kicking and pinching his calves. Grummelund laughs more loudly than ever, thanks to the tickling, takes a few strides, steps on his loose shoestrings, nearly stumbles, and at last, with thoughtful presence of mind, stoops down to tie the strings. Ephesim was watching for this. He quickly slapped the giant's cheek so vigorous and sounding a smack that the duke and all the lords of the court looked up in astonishment. The poor giant was so shamed and humiliated that he hurriedly shambled off the field, and sought refuge in the mountains where, it is said, he hid himself and refused to come out. End of chapter 4, part 3. Recording by phone.
Chapter 5 of Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Lisa Bodker. Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. By William Patton. Chapter 5 The Legend of St. Christopher by Lillian M. Gask. There was once a man named Ophero, so tall and strong that he stood among his fellows as a sturdy oak in a grove of saplings. His eyes were keen and clear as some great eagle's. His lips spoke nothing but gentle words and his heart was as pure and tender as a little child's. His spirit was brave and fearless, and while he was yet in the prime of his strength, he resolved to devote it to some good purpose. My friends, he said, when he had called together his companions, I must leave you now, for something within me whispers, that I was born to serve a king so great that fear is unknown to him, a king to whom all men bow. Then he strode away into the forest and was seen by them no more. For many a day he traversed valley and mountain, inquiring of all he met who was the greatest king. At last he came to a splendid country where reigned a monarch of high renown. His armies were vast and powerful, and his fleet of warships was like a flock of birds bearing death on their grim brown wings. When he was told that Ophero desired to serve him, he welcomed him gladly, and liked the young man so well that he soon made him his trusted counselor and friend. It was Ophero's pride to see how all men trembled at his master's frown and he could not believe that there lived a monarch greater than he. One day, however, when the king was present, a courtier made some remark about the evil one. His majesty's august brow grew pale, and Ophero could have sworn he saw his stern lips quiver. Pained and surprised, he humbly asked the king why he was troubled. "'I am afraid of the devil,' said that monarch, although I fear no mortal man. He is the king of Hades, and more powerful even than I. Then I must leave you, O king, cried Ophero with haste, since I have vowed to serve none other than the most powerful monarch in existence. And sorrowfully he turned away. Where is the devil? he asked the first man he met. He is everywhere, returned the traveler, looking round uneasily. And this was the usual answer that a pharaoh received to his inquiry. Wherever he went, men looked uneasy at the devil's name, but would not say where a pharaoh was most likely to meet with him. He found him at last among a group of idle men and maidens on the village green, and hailed him as his master. The devil was glad to have so strong a follower and amused himself by showing the astonished giant his power over rich and poor. There seemed no limit to his might. He swayed the nobles in their velvet robes and the peasants in their tattered garments. He is indeed master of the world, sighed a pharaoh, and though he liked not the devil's ways, he stifled his distaste that he might keep his word. One day his master led him through the outskirts of the town into the open country. "'We are going to visit a hermit,' he said with a burst of laughter. "'He has left the town to be quit of me, but he will find me in his cave.' Before Ophero could ask him what he meant to do with the good hermit, they came to a turn where four roads met. A rough wind swayed the branches of the trees, and a peal of thunder echoed among the lofty hills. 
It was neither wind nor thunder, however, that made the devil tremble, but the sight of a wooden cross which some pious folk had erected here. With gaunt arms pointing east and west, it stood immovable. The rain beat down on it mercilessly, as if to cleanse it from the roadside dust, and turning his head away that he might not see it, the devil hastened past. Not until it was far behind them had Ophero an opportunity of asking why he had trembled. I was afraid, answered his grim companion with another shudder. Afraid? repeated Ophero in puzzled tones. Why, what was there to be afraid of? Did you not see the crucifix? cried the devil impatiently. The figure on it is that of the Christ, and that is why I trembled. The giant had never heard that holy name before, and felt more perplexed than ever as he demanded, Who is this Christ whom you so fear? He is the King of Heaven, was the reluctant reply. Is he more powerful then than you? persisted Ophero, planting himself in the center of the pathway so that his master could not pass on. He is more powerful even than I, admitted the devil, his eyes becoming points of fire. Then I shall serve him, and him only, the giant cried, and turning on his heel, he left the devil to go on his way alone. When Ophero reached the cross once more, a man was kneeling before it in prayer. As he rose from his knees, Ophero asked him the way to heaven. I cannot tell you, said the man. The way is long and hard to find. Tis well that Christ is merciful. Ophero met with like answers from many wayfarers whom he questioned, but at last came one who advised him to consult the hermit. He is a holy man, he assured him earnestly, and has retired from the world that he may give his time to prayer and fasting. He thinks he can serve Christ this way better than any other. So Ophero sought the hermit and learned from him many things. He heard of the grandeur and goodness of Christ and of the greatness of his kingdom. All that he said made Ophero more eager to serve him than ever. And when the hermit explained that no one could enter the heavenly kingdom until he was summoned there by Christ himself, he bowed his head in disappointment. How then can I serve this new master, he said, unless I can see him and hear his commands? Do as I do, replied the hermit. Give up the world and fast and pray. If I were to fast, said Ophero shrewdly, I should lose my strength, and then, when he called me to work for him, I should be useless. And although the hermit tried to persuade him, he would not stay, but set off again on his journey, determined to find the way to heaven. Presently he met a company of pilgrims. They were dusty and travel-stained and very footsore, but their faces shone with joy. There were men and women and little children. Some came from distant lands and some from near, but one and all they were filled with a deep content. Who are you and whence do you travel? Ophero asked them wonderingly. We are the servants of Christ, they answered, and we are marching towards heaven. The path is rough and the way is long, but his many mansions await us. I will come with you and be his servant too, said Ophero, and they welcomed him gladly. The way was long, as they had said, but to the giant the days passed quickly. He was learning so much that he could scarcely sleep for the wonder of it, and his face also shone with happiness. He grew very grave when he heard of the swift-flowing river that they all must cross before they could hope to reach the kingdom of heaven. There is no bridge to span it, 
said an aged pilgrim, whose tottering limbs were now so feeble that but for a pharaoh's support they would hardly have borne him along. The trembling woman, the little child, must cross it alone in the gloom and darkness, for though they call, no friendly boatman appears in sight. When Christ has need of us, his messenger will appear. He is clothed in raiment, white as snow, and although his voice is always gentle, it is as clearly heard in the rush and roar of the tempest as on a summer's day. At length the pilgrims came to the river bank, and as the giant gazed at the foaming current and saw the waves dashing against the shore, he marveled greatly at what he had been told. Surely, he thought, no feeble woman or little child could breast its waters and reach the other side. Even as he mused on this, the white-robed messenger called to an ailing girl who was almost too weak to move. Her master had need of her, he said, and in the fair courts of heaven she would be strong again. What joy was hers when she heard his voice! But alas, when she crept to the edge of the bank and saw the river that swept beneath it, her heart grew sick with fear. She quivered and shook from head to foot and moaned that she dare not venture. An exceeding pity moved a pharaoh to go to her help. Do not weep, he said, but trust to me and taking her tenderly in his arms, he lifted her on to his shoulder and bore her tenderly across. In spite of all his strength, the pitiless current nearly swept him off his feet, and he fought with the icy waters as he had fought no mortal foe. The girl tried in vain to thank him as he placed her on the bank in safety, but he would not let her speak. Tell Christ, he said, that I am his servant, and that until he shall summon me to his side, I will help his pilgrims to cross the river of death. From henceforth this was his work. He had no time to wonder when his own call would come, for day and night there arrived at the banks of the river pilgrims from every clime, and since few had courage to face the dark waters alone, he crossed and recrossed it continually. In order that he might always be at hand, he built himself a rough log hut by the waterside, and here he made his home. One night, when the waves rolled fiercely and the wind blew high, Ophero laid him down to sleep. Surely, he thought, no one would dare to cross in such a storm. His eyes had scarcely closed, however, when he heard a knocking at the door. "'Who are you?' he cried as he threw it open. But there was no answer, and by the light of his lantern he saw a wistful child on the river bank. He was staring down at the rushing waters with piteous dread, but the tone of his voice was clear and firm as he turned and spoke to a pharaoh. "'I must cross to-night.' he said. O'Farrell looked at him with deep compassion. Poor child, he murmured. I am glad I heard you. With a tide like this, it will be difficult even for me, giant as I am. But you would be swept away. With gentle hands, he placed the boy on his shoulder and bidding him not to fear, set out for the opposite shore. He had not overestimated the difficulties he had to face. Time after time he was beaten backward, and the icy waters nearly engulfed them both. It took all his strength to bear up against them, and the weight of the child seemed greater than that of the heaviest man he had ever borne. When at last he climbed the steep high bank, he was bruised as well as breathless, for the hidden rocks had worked him grievous harm. "'Tell Christ,' he panted, and then he saw that the figure beside him was not that of a little child, but of a radiant being 
of kingly mien, with a crown of glory on his brow. The giant knelt before him, and the vision smiled. I am the Christ, he said, whom thou hast served so long. This night thou hast borne me across the river of death. Thou didst find me a heavy burden, for I bear the sins of the world. Then he named the giant of Pharaoh Christopher, meaning he who has carried Christ, and took him to dwell with him in his heavenly kingdom. End of chapter 5 The Legend of St. Christopher Recording by Annalisa Bodker Chapter 6 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 6 Prince Ivan and the Grey Wolf by Lillian M. Gask. In a far-off land surrounded by snow-capped mountains and watered by rivers that flowed swiftly down to the sea dwelt a mighty Tsar. His people loved as well as feared him, for the glance of his eagle eye was very kind, and he was ever ready to listen to their pleas for help or justice. When he rode abroad on the great white horse that was shod with gold, they flocked to bless him, and throughout the whole of his wide dominion there was not one discontented man, woman, or child. He had no foes to trouble him, since rival monarchs knew full well that their troops would be dispersed like mist in the sunlight before the charge of his victorious army, and his three sons, Dmitri, Vasily, and Ivan, were all that a father could desire. Yet the good Tsar's brow was clouded as he walked in his garden, and from time to time he uttered a deep sigh. This garden was his greatest pride. In days gone by, the forests had been rifled of their most splendid trees that they might spread their shade over the rare and lovely flowers that travelers brought him from every part of the globe. The perfume of his million rose trees was carried on the wind for fifty miles beyond the palace, and so wonderful were their colors that the eyes of those who beheld them were dazzled by so much brilliance. There were the gorgeous orchids which, in order that the garden of their beloved Tsar, might be the most beautiful in the world, men had risked their lives to obtain, and every imaginable kind of fruit hung in tempting clusters from the drooping boughs of the trees. To look at them was to make one's mouth water, and the sick folk in his kingdom shared with the Tsar the pleasures of taste and touch. The tree that gave him most pleasure bore nothing but golden apples. When spring came round, and tender buds appeared upon the whispering branches, the Tsar caused a net of fine white seed-pearls to be spread around it, so that the sweet-voiced choristers who filled his groves with music should not come near them. They might feast at will on every other tree in his garden, he said, but the golden apples they must leave for him, and as if in gratitude for his many kindnesses, even when the net of pearls was taken away, and the apples gleamed like fairy gold mid the emerald green of their shapely leaves, not one of the birds approached them. When cares of state pressed heavily upon him, the Tsar sought rest beneath the loaded branches, and forgot his troubles in watching the sunlight play on the golden balls. Now all was changed and the Tsar's deep sigh betokened feelings of deep annoyance. Morning after morning he found the apple tree stripped of its golden treasures, and its emerald leaves strewn on the ground. This was the work of the magic bird, who once upon a time had lived in the great cloud castles that gather in the west, but was now the slave of a distant king. The feathers of the magic bird were as radiant as the sun-god's plumes, and her eyes as clear as crystal. When she had wrought her will on the apple trees, she would fly blithely home to the garden of her own master, and try as they would, not one of the Tsar's head gardeners could even catch sight of her. The good Tsar meditated much upon the matter, and one windy morning in autumn he called his three sons to him. "'My children,' he said, "'the source of my grief is known to you, and now I entreat your help. Will you each in turn forego your sleep?' that you may watch in my garden for the magic bird. 
to him who shall capture her i will give the half of my kingdom and when i am called thence he shall reign in my stead willingly o my father answered each of his three sons and prince dmitri as the eldest claimed the right to the first watch the garden was flooded with moonlight as the prince threw himself down on a moss-grown bank that faced the tree and the fragrance of the roses soon worked its drowsy spell from a grove of myrtles came the song of a sweet-voiced nightingale gluck 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 she trilled and in listening to her the prince fell fast asleep when he awoke it was light again the tree had been once more despoiled and the magic bird had flown the same thing occurred when prince vasili took his turn in watching it is only fair to him to say that he did not fall asleep until the night was far spent but as the east began to quiver with light he too became overpowered with slumber the magic bird was watching her opportunity and yet again she robbed the tree when questioned by the tsar both princes solemnly assured him that no strange bird had visited the garden during the night but though he fain would have believed them he could not doubt the evidence of his eyes it was now prince ivan's turn to watch he was not nearly so good-looking as his brothers but he had a stout heart and a cool head and he made up his mind to keep awake at any cost instead of reclining on the ground he perched himself in the boughs of the tree and when the song of the nightingale threatened to lull him to sleep as it had done the elder princes he put his fingers into his ears that he might not hear it an hour passed slowly a second and then a third suddenly the whole garden was lit up as if with a burst of sunshine and with rays of light flashing from every shaft of her golden feathers the magic bird flew down and began to peck at the shining apples prince ivan scarcely daring to breathe stretched out his hand and caught as much of her tail as he could grasp with a startled cry the magic bird spread her beautiful wings and wrenched herself free leaving behind one glittering feather which the prince held firmly at break of day he took this to his father humbly apologizing for his ill success and not having caught the magic bird herself nevertheless you have done well my son said the tsar gratefully and he placed the feather which shone so brightly that at dusk it illuminated the whole room in a cabinet of cedar and mother of pearl the magic bird came no more to the palace garden and the precious tree was never again despoiled of its golden apples but the tsar was not content he sighed to possess the bird that had robbed him and once more he summoned his three sons my children he said i am sick with longing for the magic bird seek her i pray you and bring her to me what i have promised already shall then be yours the princes assented gladly each anxious to find the magic bird Prince Ivan alone wished to please his father. His brothers were only thinking of the riches and honors they would gain for themselves. So dear was this youngest son to the monarch's heart that he was loath to part with him when the time came. But the youth insisted. "'It will not be for long, dear father,' he cried. "'I shall soon return with the magic bird you sigh for.' So the Tsar blessed him and let him go. Prince Ivan took the fleetest horse in the imperial stables and rode on and on for many days. At last he came to a bare field set in the midst of a fair green meadows, and in the center of this stood a block of rough gray stone. Inscribed upon the stone in crimson letters was a strange verse. Hungry and cold shall that man be who rides in pride straight up to me. To ride from the left means death and sorrow though his horse shall live for many a morrow he who rides from the right shall have good things all but ere three days pass his horse shall fall prince ivan was greatly troubled at the thought of losing his horse but to ride from the right seemed the wisest course for him to pursue accordingly he did so and so swift was his horse's flight that he had soon left the gray stone far behind on the third day, as he was passing the borders of a gloomy forest, a big gray wolf sprang out from a thicket, and, flying at his horse's throat, threw him on the ground and killed him in spite of Ivan's gallant attempt to beat him off. Ivan would now have run the gray wolf through with his jeweled dagger his father had given him as a parting present, but before he could rise from the spot where he had been thrown, the creature spoke. "'Spare me, wise prince,' he entreated humbly. 
I have but done what I was commanded. My death will not give you back your horse, while if you spare my life, I will be your friend for ever, and will carry you over the world. Prince Ivan saw that he would gain nothing by being revengeful, and mindful of his quest, accepted the wolf's offer to be his steed. "'Tell me where you wish to go, dear master,' said the grey wolf, "'and it shall be as you will.' And true enough, when he heard the object of Prince Ivan's journey, he galloped even more swiftly than the horse had done, till toward nightfall he came to a standstill behind a thick stone wall. "'On the other side of this wall,' he said, "'is a terraced garden, and there, in a golden cage, is the magic bird.' The garden is empty now, so no one will stay you if you capture her, but if you touch her cage there will be trouble. Dismounting from the grey wolf's back, Prince Ivan climbed the wall without much difficulty, and quickly seized the magic bird. She fluttered so wildly, however, as he tried to hold her, though without uttering a sound, that he quite forgot the grey wolf's warning and hastened back for the cage. As he touched it, the stillness of the garden was broken by the pealing of bells and the clanking of armor, for the cage was connected with the palace courtyard by invisible wires. Before he could escape, Prince Ivan was surrounded by excited soldiers who quickly carried him before the king. "'Are you not ashamed?' the monarch thundered, noting the young man's rich attire, "'to be caught in my garden like a common thief. Where do you come from, and what is your name?' "'I am the son of a great Tsar, the young prince answered, "'and they call me Ivan. "'My father has a very beautiful garden "'in which grows a tree of golden apples "'that is the pride of his heart. "'Night after night your magic bird rifled this precious fruit "'until I all but succeeded in capturing her. "'She was too quick for me, however, and flew away, "'leaving one feather in my hand. "'This feather I took to my father.' Who admired it greatly, and ever since has longed to possess the magic bird. Tsar Dolmat looked less angry, though he still frowned. "'If you had come to me,' he said, "'and told me what you wanted, I would have made your father a present of the magic bird. As it is, I feel inclined to let all nations know how dishonorably you have acted.' Prince Ivan bowed his head in shame, and after a searching glance at him the Tsar continued his speech. "'You shall go forth free, young prince,' he said, "'if you will do me a service. "'In the realm of Tsar Afron, "'beyond the thrice-ninth kingdom, "'there is a gold-maned horse "'which belongs to him, "'and this I greatly covet. "'If you will procure it "'and bring it here to me, "'I will forgive your theft of the magic bird "'and present her to you "'as a mark of honor. Prince Ivan promised to do his best, but he did not feel very hopeful as he rejoined Grey Wolf, who was patiently waiting for him outside the wall. When Ivan had confessed the reason that led to his capture, the Grey Wolf patted his shoulder with one rough paw. "'It takes a wise man,' he remarked, "'to own himself in the wrong. So we will say no more about it. Jump on my back again, and I will take you to the far-famed realm of Saraphron.' beyond the thrice-ninth kingdom. The grey wolf ran so swiftly that Ivan could scarcely see the country through which they passed, and after travelling for many nights and days they reached at last their journey's end. The marble stables of the Tsar shone fair and stately in the morning light, and through a door which a careless groom had left half open, Prince Ivan made his way. The horse with the golden mane was feeding on the yellow pollen collected by the bees from the tall white lilies that edged the rose garden, and stared at Prince Ivan haughtily as he approached. Firmly grasping his golden mane, Prince Ivan led him out of the stall. The grey wolf had cautioned him more than once not to attempt to bring the golden bridle that hung above the door, but as he was leaving the stable the prince suddenly thought how useful this would be, and turning back stretched out his hand and touched it. Immediately he did so, bells pealed all over the palace, for, like the cage of the magic bird, the bridle was fastened to invisible wires. The stable guards came hurrying in, full of alarm, and when they saw Prince Ivan they seized him angrily and took him before their master. Tsar Afron was even more indignant than Tsar Dolmat had been at the prince's attempt to rob him. When he had questioned him as to his birth and station, his face became sterner still. 
Is this the deed of a gallant knight? he asked with withering scorn. I have a great regard for your father's name, and if you had come to me openly and in good faith, I would gladly have given you my gold-maned horse. But now all nations shall know of your dishonor, for such acts of yours must not go unpunished. This was more than Prince Ivan could bear, and with eager haste he protested his willingness to atone for his fault. Very well, then, said Tsar Afron. I will take you at your word. Go forth and bring me Queen Helen the Beautiful, whom I have long loved with all my heart and soul. I have seen a picture of her in my seer's white crystal, and she is more fair to look upon than any other maid. I cannot reach her, try as I may, since her kingdom is guarded by elves and goblins. If you can capture her for me and bring her here, in return I will give you anything you ask. Prince Ivan hurried away to the Grey Wolf, fearing that since he had disregarded his advice for a second time, he might refuse to help him in this new enterprise. Once more he humbly confessed that he had been at fault, and once more the Grey Wolf consoled him. "'One must buy wit,' he growled. "'Well, jump on my back, and I will see what I can do for you.' Then he ran so swiftly that it seemed as though his feet were winged, and the elves and goblins that guarded the kingdom of Helen the Beautiful scattered before him in all directions, thinking him to be a specter. When he came to the golden streamlet that bordered the queen's magic garden, he told Prince Ivan that he must now dismount. "'Go back by the road we came,' he commanded, "'and wait for me in the shade of that spreading oak tree we passed just now.' Prince Ivan did as he was told, and the great wolf crouched under a bush of juniper and waited until evening fell. As the light faded out of the sunset sky and the pale little moon rose slowly over the mountain tops, Queen Helen walked in her garden. She was so fair and sweet to look upon that even the heart of the gray wolf was moved to admiration, and he wished her a worthier mate than the stern Tsar Afron, who knew not how to be gentle even in his love. After a while she approached the streamlet, winding round her dainty throat a cloud of milk-white gossamer, that she might not feel the touch of the evening breeze. "'Do not fear, sweet lady. I will not harm you,' the grey wolf cried, as he sprang from his hiding-place and crossed the stream. Holding her tenderly by her flowing draperies, he leapt back to the other side and galloped with her to the prince who waited under the spreading oak. When the queen and prince beheld each other, it was as if a veil had fallen from their eyes. Never had the world appeared so beautiful, and as they gazed at each other in the soft twilight, the queen's fears fled. As for Prince Ivan, he knew from that moment that she was intended for his wife, and when they rode away together on the gray wolf's back, he already felt that she belonged to him. The journey was all too short, and soon Tsar Afrin's palace loomed before them. "'Why are you weeping?' the gray wolf inquired, as their tears splashed on his head. Queen Helen could make no answer, but Prince Ivan's words poured forth like a raging flood. "'How can we help it, Grey Wolf?' he cried. "'Since we love each other, and I must resign my beautiful queen to the stern Tsar Afron, or else be branded before all nations as a robber and a thief.' "'I have kept my promise, Prince Ivan,' said the Grey Wolf, "'and served you well, but I will do more for you still.' By means of magic known to myself alone, I, the Grey Wolf, will take the form of beautiful Queen Helen. You shall leave the real queen here in the shade of this grove of pine trees, and when you have taken Tsar Afron, his strange wolf bride, who will appear to him as a lovely woman with golden hair, he will give you the gold-maned horse. Bid him farewell as quickly as you can, and taking your queen behind you, ride swiftly toward the west." When I have given you time to journey far, I will ask Tsar Afron to let me walk with my maidens in the woods. Then, if you call me to your mind, I shall disappear from their midst, even as they watch me, and join you and your queen. Prince Ivan once more did as the Grey Wolf said, and great was the delight of the Tsar Afron as he beheld the tall and gracious woman whom the prince presented to him. She was even more beautiful than he had imagined from her picture and he would have given not only his gold-maned horse, but his crown as well to her captor, had he desired it. Prince Ivan, however, asked nothing but the gold-maned horse, and was soon speeding across the plains with the real Queen Helen nestling against his side. He rode toward the west, where lay the kingdom of Tsar Dolmat. 
Sar Afron was more than content with his wolfish bride, who was not alarmed by his fierce caresses, and only smiled when he threatened to kill her if her love for him should waver for a single instant. On the fourth day after their marriage feast, she complained of feeling stifled in the royal palace. "'If I might walk in the meadows,' she said, "'the breath of the cool fresh air would refresh my spirit, and I could once more laugh with my lord.' So the Tsar allowed her to walk with her maidens. Just at this time the thought of the grey wolf flashed into Prince Ivan's head. "'I had forgotten him,' he exclaimed remorsefully to his dear wife. "'What is he doing, I wonder?' I wish we had him here. He had no sooner spoken than there came a clap of thunder from the distant hills, and the grey wolf suddenly appeared. You must let the queen ride the gold-maned horse alone, he told the prince, and I will be your steed. Somewhat reluctantly, the prince accepted his suggestion, and in this matter they rode to the verge of Tsar Dolmat's capital. The kindly looks of the grey wolf emboldened the prince to ask him another favor. Since you can change yourself into a beautiful woman, and then back again into a grey wolf, could you not become for a time a gold-maned horse, so that I might give you to Tsar Dolmat, and keep the real one for my dear queen? The grey wolf readily assented, and striking his right paw three times in succession on a patch of bare earth, became the exact image of the gold-maned horse who bore the fair queen Helen. Leaving the real horse with his bride in a flower-strewn meadow outside the city, Prince Ivan rode on to the Tsar. He was greeted by that monarch with every sign of joy, for the mane of the grey wolf horse shone in the sunshine like purest gold. The Tsar kissed Prince Ivan on either cheek, and leading him to his palace, gave him a royal feast. For three whole days they reveled in the choicest wines and the richest viands the kingdom could supply, and on the third... Tsar Dolmat rewarded the prince with many thanks and the gift of the magic bird in her golden cage. Prince Ivan felt now that his quest was over, and quickly regaining Queen Helen's side, he fastened the cage of the magic bird round the neck of the gold-maned horse and rode with her toward his father's kingdom. Early the next afternoon they were joined by the grey wolf. Tsar Dolmat had ridden his newly acquired treasure in an open field and had been heavily thrown for his pains by the false horse, which had then galloped away. As the grey wolf had been so good a friend to him, Prince Ivan could not refuse his request when he asked to be allowed to carry him, so once more the queen alone sat on the gold-maned horse. Thus they rode on until they came to the place where the grey wolf had slain the horse which Prince Ivan had brought from his father's stable. Here the strange creature came to a sudden stop. "'I have done all that I said and more,' he told the prince. "'Now I am your servant no longer.' farewell, and he galloped back to the gloomy wood from which he had first come. Prince Ivan's sorrow at parting with him was very real, but in the pleasure afforded by the queen's company he soon forgot his loss. When he came within sight of his father's realm, he stopped by the shade of a belt of fir trees, and placing the cage of the magic bird and the golden bridle beneath their shade, he lifted down his beautiful queen and rested with her on a bank of fern. They were weary after their long journey, and soon, talking together softly as ring-doves coo in their nests, both fell asleep. Now Prince Dmitri and Prince Vasily had fared badly on their travels, and were returning to the palace empty-handed, and sadly out of temper, when they caught sight of the reclining forms of the two sleepers with the gold-maned horse browsing close beside them, as they stared in amazement an evil spirit of envy took possession of them and there presently entered into their minds the thought of killing their brother. Each looked at the other, and then Prince Dmitri drew his sword and ran it through Prince Ivan as he slept. He died without a murmur, and when the queen awoke, she found him lifeless. "'What is this you have done?' she sobbed to the guilty princes. "'If you had met him in fair fight and slain him thus, he might at least have struck a blow in self-defense.' but you are cowards and dastards, fit only for raven's food. In vain she wept and protested, as the princes drew lots for their dead brother's possessions. The queen fell to the keeping of Prince Vasily, and the gold mane horse was adjudged to Prince Dmitri. In a passion of tears the queen hid her face in her golden hair, as her would-be lord spoke roughly to her. You are in our power, fair Helen, he said. We shall tell our father that it was we who found you the magic bird, and the gold-maned horse. If you deny our words, we will instantly put you to death, 
so look to it that you hold your tongue, and keep our counsel. The poor queen was so terrified by his cruel threat that speech forsook her, and when they arrived at the palace she was mute as some marble statue, and could not contradict the wicked statements which she heard them boldly utter. Prince Ivan lay dead with his face to the sky, but the wood elves guarded his body, so that neither beast nor bird came near to devour it until the end of thirty days. Then, as the sun was sinking, a raven, seeking food for her young, hopped on his breast, and would have pecked at his eyes had not the grey wolf galloped up in the nick of time. He knew at once that the dead man must be Ivan, and pouncing upon one of the young birds would have torn it asunder in his rage. "'Do not touch my little birdling, O oh, fierce grey wolf,' entreated the mother piteously. "'It has done you no harm, and deserves no ill from you.' "'Then listen,' the grey wolf replied. "'I will spare the life of your birdling, if you will fly away beyond the thrice ninth lands, and bring me back the water of death and the water of life from the crystal stream whence they flow to the great forever. I will do what you wish, cried the raven, only do not touch my little son. And as she spoke she sped away. Three days and three nights had passed before she returned to the grey wolf, carrying two small vials. One held the water of life, the other the water of death and as the grey wolf took them from her he gave a cry of triumph. With a snap of his teeth he bit the young raven in two, tearing it to pieces before its mother's frantic eyes. This done, he broke one of the vials, and when he had sprinkled three drops of the water of death on the slain birdling, immediately its torn body grew together again. Then he touched it with a few drops from the second vial, and the little thing spread its wings and flew off rejoicing. Thus the grey wolf knew that the raven had served him well, and he poured what was left of the waters of life and death over the body of the dead prince. In a few moments life came back to him, and stumbling to his feet, he smiled at the grey wolf. "'Have I slept long?' he asked dreamily. "'You would have slept forever had it not been for me,' was the reply. And the prince listened with grieved surprise as the grey wolf told him all that had happened. "'Your brother is going to marry your bride to-day,' he ended by saying. "'We must hasten to the palace with all possible speed. "'Mount on my back, and I will carry you once more.' "'So they galloped to the palace of the old Tsar, "'and the grey wolf bade Prince Ivan farewell for the last time "'as he dismounted at the great gates. "'The prince hurried into the banquet hall, "'and there, looking like some fair statue "'that had been moulded from frozen snow, "'sat beautiful Queen Helen by Prince Vasily's side.' They had just returned from the wedding ceremony, and all the nobles were gathered round. When Queen Helen saw who had entered the hall, her speech came back to her, and she flew to her lover with a cry of rapture and kissed him on the lips. "'This is my own dear husband,' she cried. "'I belong to him and not to the wicked prince I have married to-day.' From the shelter of Ivan's breast she told the old Tsar all that had happened, and how it was to his youngest son that he owed the gold mane horse and the magic bird. The joy of the Tsar at his favorite son's return was tempered by his grief and amazement at the conduct of the elder princes. They were cast into prison, where they languish still. But Prince Ivan and the beautiful Queen Helen are as happy as the days are long, and the magic bird was allowed to return to her home in the Golden West. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven King Robert of Sicily of Junior Classics Volume Two Folk Tales and Myths This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org Junior Classics Volume Two Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton Chapter 7 King Robert of Sicily Retold from the poem by Henry W. Longfellow King Robert of Sicily was at church one evening attended as usual by a great train of gallant knights and trusty squires and ladies of the court. As he sat proudly in his high place, dressed in rich and beautiful robes, 
he thought not so much of the service as of his own importance and state. Not only was he a king himself, but he was brother to the Pope and to Valmond, Emperor of Germany. Presently his attention was attracted by the chant that the priests were singing. It was the Magnificat. Over and over again they repeated the words, Desposuat potentes de sede, et es exaltavit humilis. King Robert had heard the chant many times before, but now he found himself wondering what this particular phrase meant. A learned man was at his side, and the king spoke to him. What do these words mean? he asked. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree, replied the scholar. It is well that such words are sung in Latin, and only by the priests, muttered King Robert, scornfully. Be it known to both priests and people that there is no power that can push me from my throne. He leaned back in his seat, yawning, and soon fell asleep, lulled by the monotonous chant. Now it was St. John's Eve, and on that day strange and unlooked-for things happen. When King Robert awoke from his nap, it was night, and he was alone in the church. The service was over, and the priests and everyone else except himself had gone. The great building was dark, but for the little lamps which were kept burning constantly before the images of the saints. King Robert started from his seat and looked around in amazement. All was still. He groped his way down the long aisle to the door. He took hold of the handle and tried to turn it. The door was locked. He called and listened for an answer, but none came. He knocked and he shouted, but to no purpose. Growing angrier every minute, he cried out threats and complaints, and the sound of his own voice came back to him echoing from the roofs and the walls. It was as though he were being mocked by unseen hearers. After what seemed a long time, the knocking and the shouting brought the sexton to the church door. He came with his lantern, suspecting that thieves were in the church. Who is there? he called. Open the door at once, commanded the king, who was almost beside himself with rage. It is I, the king. The sexton trembled and waited to hear more before putting the great key in the lock. He thought that there must be a madman within. Art thou afraid? cried the king. It is a drunken vagabond, muttered the old man, and turning the key, he flung the door wide open. A figure leaped past him in the darkness. It was King Robert. But the sexton did not dream of that, for the figure was half naked and forlorn. The king's gorgeous robes had disappeared. His hat and his cloak were gone, and he did not look like himself at all. Without a word or a look at the sexton, he sped down the street. Bareheaded and breathless and splashed with mud, Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbane and of Valmont, Emperor of Germany, reached his palace gate, the gate that he had entered in triumph so many times. He thundered for admittance, boiling with rage and half mad with an overpowering sense of his wrongs. Through the gate he rushed, and across the courtyard, thrusting aside every one who stood in his way, upsetting pages and overwhelming guards, past them all and up the broad stairway he hurried, and then sped through the long halls. He paid no attention to the calls and the cries which pursued him, and did not pause until he reached the banquet room. There on the dais sat another king, wearing Robert's robes, his crown, and his signet ring. His features were like Robert's, 
and so was his form. But he possessed a majesty, and an exalted look which the real king lacked. The room, always well lighted, shone with an unusual brilliancy, and the atmosphere was full of fragrance. An angel had taken the place of the king, and although no one was conscious of the change, every one present vaguely felt the improvement. Robert stood speechless before the miracle. Then his surprise gave way to anger at seeing another in his place. The angel spoke first. Who art thou, and why comest thou here, he said benignly, meeting Robert's threatening look with one of almost divine compassion. I am the king, answered Robert indignantly, and I have come to claim my throne from the impostor who is on it. As he stood before the angel, Robert did not look at all royal, and his clothing made such a difference in his appearance that the courtiers did not notice even a resemblance to their king, and took him for a stranger. At his bold words they sprang angrily from their seats, and drew their swords to put him to death for his insolence. The angel was unmoved. He signed to the courtiers to sheathe the weapons that they had drawn in his defense. No, thou art not the king, he said to Robert. Thou art the king's jester, and henceforth thou shalt wear bells and cap in a scalloped cape and lead a monkey about by a string. Thou shalt obey my servants, and wait on my men. In those days every king kept a jester, or a fool, whose duty it was to amuse his master, and the court. Often the jester was not quite right in his mind, and for that reason said odd things, which would not have occurred to entirely sane people and he was allowed to make speeches which would have been rebuked if they had come from others. Thus the angel treated Robert's claim as a jest. The attendants were delighted with the new joke, paying no attention except laughter to Robert's cries and explanations. They thrust him from the banquet hall and down the stairs. A crowd of pages ran before him, throwing the doors wide open with mock ceremony, while the boisterous men-at-arms shouted, Long live the king! with noisy glee. How he got through the evening, King Robert hardly knew. He was so tired when he was shown, at last, to his comfortless straw bed, that he slept better than he had done many a night on his royal couch. The next morning he awoke with the day. What a curious dream I have had! he exclaimed sleepily. But it was no dream. Straw rustled as he turned his head, and by his side were the cap and bells which he was to put on. His room was bare, its walls were discolored, and presently he heard horses stamping in their nearby stalls. He was in a stable. The monkey was there too. King Robert saw the horrid thing, grinning and chattering in a corner. His past life seemed far away. He had to begin to live again, this time the butt and the jest of the palace. Days came and went, and the angel still sat on the throne. The island of Sicily prospered under his reign. The crops were good, the vintage was abundant, and the people were happy. King Robert yielded to fate, but he did not yield willingly. He became sullen and silent, and was a sorry jester in spite of his gay dress and his jingling bells and the chattering monkey. The courtiers mocked him in innumerable ways, and the nimble pages played pranks on him. He had to be content with scraps from the tables of his masters, and the monkey was his only friend. Sometimes the angel asked him, as though in jest, Art thou the king? And Robert, still defiant, replied haughtily, I am, I am the king. Almost three years passed. 
Then messengers came from Valmond, Emperor of Germany, to tell King Robert that their brother, Pope Urbane, summoned him to come on Holy Thursday to his city, Rome. The angel welcomed the ambassadors with fitting ceremony and gave them magnificent presents, embroidered vests, velvet mantles, rare jewels, and costly rings. Not only were his guests messengers from the great Valmond, but they were mighty nobles. As soon as he could get ready, the angel went with the ambassadors and a mighty train of followers over the sea to Italy. As the procession traveled along, crowds gathered to watch its progress. Never had there been seen a more gorgeous assembly. The angel and his courtiers and the ambassadors were dressed in splendid garments with gold and gems and lace and embroideries and velvets and satins and nodding plumes, each one according to his state, and their horses were resplendent with gold and silver and jeweled bridles. After them rode the servants, less fine, but equally gay, and among the lowliest of these was poor Robert, riding in mock state on an awkward piebald pony, as the ridiculous steed shambled along, his rider's cloak of foxtails flapped in the wind, and his bells jingled. The king was very unhappy, and his face showed it. But it was only a joke for a jester to look disconsolate, and people were no more sorry for him than for the solemn monkey who perched demurely by his side and aped his ways. In all the country towns through which they went, the gaping crowds stared at them and laughed. The Pope received the angel and the emperor with pomp. Trumpets sounded a welcome, and banners waved joyously as they met on St. Peter's Square. The Pope embraced and blessed his brothers, as he thought, for even he did not know that he was entertaining an angel, while prayers and rejoicing were at their height. Robert the jester burst through the crowd and rushed into the presence of the Pope and his guests. I am the king, he cried, addressing the Pope. Look and behold in me, Robert, your brother, king of Sicily. That man who looks like me and wears my robes and my crown is an impostor. Do you not know me? Does nothing tell you that we are akin? Robert was desperate. This seemed his last chance of regaining his rights. He was appealing to the highest authority in the world. The Pope looked troubled. He turned silently from Robert to the angel with searching glances. The angel met his scrutiny with perfect serenity. Valmond only laughed. It is a strange sport to have a madman for thy jester, he said to the angel, whom he believed to be his brother. The baffled jester was hustled back into the crowd. He was in disgrace and suffered punishment for his untimely joke. Holy Week went by in solemn state, and Easter Sunday came. On that blessed morning the city was radiant with light even before the sun rose. The angel's presence made Rome bright and filled men's hearts with love and goodness. They felt as though... Christ had indeed risen from the dead, and were ready to devote themselves to him with fresh zeal. Even the jester, as he opened his eyes to the marvelous light, felt within his heart a power that he had never felt before. What mattered it that his bed was straw? He fell on his knees beside it and prayed to the risen Christ. When the visit was ended, Valmont returned to Germany and the angel and his train once more flashed along the towns of Italy, and then set sail for Sicily. When they reached home, the angel occupied the throne as before. Robert could not understand it, but he was humbled, and no longer felt angry and bitter. One evening, when the convent bells were ringing for prayer, the angel beckoned to Robert to draw near, and signed to the attendants to leave the room. When they were alone, the angel turned to Robert and asked with less sternness than ever before, Art thou the king? King Robert bowed his head meekly 
and crossed his hands upon his breast. Thou knowest best, he said. I have sinned. Let me go away from here and spend the rest of my days in a convent cell. There, kneeling on stones, I will beg heaven to forgive my pride. The angel smiled, and the place was filled with a heavenly light. At the same moment, through the open windows, came the chant of the monks. He has put down the mighty from their seat, and has exalted them of low degree. King Robert understood it at last. Then above the measured tones of the singers rose another voice, one of heavenly sweetness. It said, I am an angel. Thou art the king. The king lifted his eyes. He was alone. No longer was he dressed in the motley attire of a jester, but he was in royal robes such as he used to wear, in velvet and ermine and cloth of gold. When the courtiers came back to the room, they found their king on his knees, absorbed in silent prayer. End of chapter 7 King Robert of Sicily Recording by Peter Strom, Sabatha, Kansas, on June 18th, 2018. Chapter 8, Part 1 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Stays. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 1 the riddle of the Finx, by elsie fenimore buckley long ago in the city of thebes there ruled a king named laius and his queen aracasta they were children of the gods and thebes itself men said had been built by hands more than mortal for apollo had led cadmus the phoenician the son of zeus to the sacred spot where he was to raise the citadel of thebes and Pallas Athene had helped him to slay the monstrous dragon that guarded the sacred spring of Ares. The teeth of the dragon Cadmus took and planted in the plain of Thebes, and from the sea there sprang up a great host of armed men, who would have slain him, but he took a stone and cast it in their midst, whereupon the serpent men turned their arms one against another, fighting up and down the plain, till only five were left. With the help of these five, Cadmus built the citadel of Thebes, and round it made a wall so wide that a dozen men and more might walk upon it. And so huge were the stones, and so strong was the masonry that parts of it are standing to its day. As for the city itself, the tale goes that Amphion, the mightiest of all musicians, came with his lyre, and so sweetly did he play that the hearts of the very stones were stirred within them, so that of their own free will they fell into their places, and the town of Thebes rose up beneath the shadow of the citadel. For many a long day did Laius and Anacasta rule over the people of Thebes, and all that time they had no children. For a dreadful curse lay on the head of Laius, that if he ever had a son by that son's hand he should die at last a boy was born to them and laius remembering the curse swore that the child should never grow to manhood and he bade iacasta slay him forthwith but she being his mother was filled with a great love and pity for the helpless child when it nestled in her arms and clung to her breast she could not find it in her heart to slay it and she wept over it many a bitter salt tear and pressed it closer to her bosom so she called a trusty house-slave who knew the king's decree and placing the child in his arms she said go take it away and hide it in the hills perchance the gods will have pity on it and put it in the heart of some shepherd who feeds his flock on distant pastures to take the child home to his cot and rear it farewell my pretty babe the green grass must be thy cradle and the mountain breezes must lull thee to sleep may the gods in their mercy bless thy childhood hours and make thy name famous among men for thou art a king's son and a child of the immortals and the immortals forget not those that are born of their blood so the man took the child from iacasta but he feared the king's decree 
he pierced its ankles and bound them together for he thought surely even if some shepherd wandering on the mountainside should light upon the child he will never rear one so maimed and if the king should ask i will say that he is dead but because the child wept for the pain in its ankles he took it home first to his wife to be fed and comforted and when she gave it back to his arms it smiled up into his face then all the hardness died out of his heart for the gods had shed about it a grace to kindle love in the coldest breast now cytherian lies midway between thebes and corinth and in winter time the snow lies deep upon the summit and the wild winds shriek through the rocks and clefts and the pine trees pitch and bend beneath the fury of the blast so that the men called it the home of the fairies the awful goddesses who track out sin and murder and there too in the streams and caverns dwell the naiads of the nymphs the wild spirits of the rocks and waters and if any mortal trespass on their haunts they drive him to madness in their echoing grottoes and gloomy caves yet for all that though the men called it dark cytherian the grass about its feet grew fine and green so that shepherds came from all the neighbouring towns to pasture their flocks on its well-watered slopes here it was that Laius's herdsman fell in with the herdsman of Polybus, king of Corinth, and seeing that he was a kindly man and likely to have compassion on the child, he gave it to him to rear. Now it had not pleased the gods to grant any children to Polybus, king of Corinth, and Merope his wife, though they wreathed their altars with garlands and burnt sweet savour of incense. And at last all hope died out of their hearts, and they said the gods are angry and will destroy our race and the kingdom shall pass into the hands of a stranger but one day it chanced that the queen saw in the arms of one of her women a child she had not seen before and she questioned her and asked if it was hers and the woman confessed that her husband the king's herdman had found an undim cytherian and had taken pity on it and brought it home then the queen looked at the child and seeing that it was passing fair she said surely this is no common babe but a child of the immortals his hair is golden as the summer corn and his eyes like the stars in heaven what if the gods have sent him to comfort our old age and rule the kingdom when we are dead i will rear him in the palace as my own son and he shall be a prince in the land of corinth so the child lived in the palace and became a son of polybus and merope and heir to the kingdom for one of a name they called him Oedipus, because his ankles, when they found him, were all swollen by the pin that the herdsmen had put through them. As he grew up he found favor in all men's eyes, for he was tall and comely and cunning withal. The gods are gracious, men said, to grant the king such a son, and the people of Corinth so mighty a prince, to rule over them in days to come. For as yet they knew not that he was a foundling and no true heir to the throne." now while the child was still young he played about the courts of the palace and in running and leaping and in feats of strength and hardihood of heart there was none to beat him among his playmates or even to stand up against him save one but so well matched were these two that the other children would gather round them in a ring to watch them box and wrestle and the victory they would carry on their shoulders round the echoing galleries with shouting and clapping of hands and sometimes it was oedipus and sometimes the other lad but at length there came a time when again and again oedipus was proved the stronger and again and again the other slunk home beat him like a dog that had been whipped and he brooded over his defeat and nourished hatred in his heart against oedipus and vowed that one day he would have his revenge by fair means or by foul but when merope the queen saw oedipus growing tall and fair and surpassing all his comrades in strength she took him up one day on to the citadel and showed him all the lovely land of hellas laying at his feet below them spread the shining city with its colonnades and fountains and stately temples of the gods like some jewel of the golden sands and far away to the westward stretched the blue corinthian gulf and she showed him the hills of arcadia the land of song and shepherds where pan plays his pipe beneath the oak trees and nymphs and satyrs dance all the day long away to the bleak northwest stood out the snowy peaks of mount parnassus and helicon the home of the muses who filled men's mind with wisdom and their hearts with love of all things beautiful then merope turned him to the eastward and the land of the dawning day and showed him the purple peaks of angina and the gleaming attic shores and she said to him oedipus my son seest thou how corinth lies midway twixt north and south and east and west a link to join the lands together and a barrier to separate the seas 
And Oedipus answered, Of a truth, mother, he who rules in Corinth hath need of a lion's heart, for he must stand ever sword in hand and guard the passage from north to south. Courage is a mighty thing, my son, but wisdom is mightier. The sword layeth low, but wisdom buildeth up. Seest thou the harbors on either side facing east and west, and the masts of the ships like a forest in winter, and the traffic of sailors and merchants on the shore? From all lands they come, and bring their wares and merchandise, and men of every nation meet together. Think not, my son, that a lion's heart and a fool's head therewith can ever be a match for the wisdom of Egypt or the cunning of Phoenicia. Then Oedipus understood and said, Till now I have wrestled and boxed and run races with my fellows on the sand the live long day, and none can beat me. Henceforth I will sit in the marketplace and discourse with foreigners and learned men, so that, when I come to rule in my father's place, I may be the wisest in all the land." And Merope was pleased at his answer, but in her heart she was sad that his simple, childish days were past, and she prayed that if the gods granted him wisdom, they would keep his heart pure and free from all uncleanness. So Oedipus sat in the marketplace and talked with the merchants and travelers, and he went down to the ships in the harbors and learned many strange things of strange lands, the wisdom of Egyptians, who were the wisest of all men in the south, and the cunning of the Phoenicians, who were the greatest merchants and sailors in the world. But in the evening, when the sun was low, and in the west and the hills all turned to amethyst and sapphire, and the snow mountains blushed a ruby red beneath his parting kiss, then along the smooth gold sand of the isthmus, by the side of the sounding sea, he would box and wrestle and run, till all the waves were darkened and the stars stood out in the sky. For he was a true son of Hellas, and knew that nine times out of every ten a slack body and a slack mind go together. So he grew up in his beauty, a very god for wisdom and might, and there were no questions he could not answer, nor riddles he could not solve, so that all the land looked up to him, and the king and queen loved him as their own son. Now one day there was a great banquet in the palace, to which all the noblest of the lands were bidden, and the minstrels played, and the tumblers danced, and the wine flowed freely around the board, so that men's hearts were open, and they talked of great deeds and heroes, and boasted what they themselves could do and Oedipus boasted as loud as any and challenged one and all to meet him in fair fight. But the youth who had grown up with him in rivalry and nursed jealousy and hatred in his heart taunted him to his face and said, Base born that thou art, and son of slave, thinkest thou that free men will fight with thee? Lions fight not with curs, and though thou clothe thyself with purple and gold, all men know that thou art no true son to him thou callest thy sire." And this he said, being flushed with wine, and because mirrored mouth rumor had spread abroad that the tale that Oedipus was a foundling, though he himself knew not thereof. Then Oedipus flushed red with rage, and swift as a gale that sweeps down from the mountain, he fell upon the other, and seizing him by the throat, he shook him till he had not a breath to beg for mercy. What sayest thou now, thou whelped? Be gone with thy lying tunt now, that thou hast licked the dust for thy falsehood." and he flung him out of the hall. But Merope lent pale and sat against the pillar, and veiled her face in her mantle to hide her tears. And when they were alone, Oedipus took her hand and stroked it and said, Grieve not for my fiery spirit, mother, but call me thy own son, and say that I was right to silence the liar who had cast dishonor upon my father's name and upon thee. But she looked at him sad and longingly, through her tears and spoke in riddling words the gods my child sent thee to thy father and to me in answer to our prayers a gift of god thou art and a gift of god thou shalt be living and dead to them that love thee the flesh groweth old and withereth away as a leaf but the spirit liveth on for ever and those are the truest of kin who are kin in the spirit of goodness and of love but oedipus was troubled for she would say no more, but only held his hand, and when he drew it away, it was wet with her tears. Then he thought in his heart, Verily my mother would not weep for naught. What if, after all, there be something in the tale? I will go to the central shrine of Hellas, and ask the god of truth, golden-haired Apollo. If he says it is a lie, verily I will thrust it back down that coward's throat, and the whole land shall ring with his infamy." And if it be true, the gods will guide me how to act. 
So he set forth alone upon his pilgrimage. He drew near to the sacred place and made due sacrifice, and washed in the great stone basin, and put away all uncleanness from his heart, and went through the portals of the rock to the awful shrine within, where the undying fires burn night and day, and the sacred laurel stands. And he put his question to the god, and waited for an answer. Through the dim darkness of the shrine he saw the priestess on her tripod, veil in a mist of incense and vapor, and as the power of the god came upon her she beheld the things of the future and the hidden secrets of fate. And she raised her hand towards Oedipus, and with pale lips spoke the words of doom. Oedipus, ill-fated, thine own sire shalt thou slay. As she spoke the words his head swam round like a whirlpool, and his head seemed turned to stone. Then, with a loud and bitter cry, he rushed from the temple through the thronging crowd of pilgrims down into the sacred way, and the people moved out of his path like shadows. Blindly he sped along the stony road, down through the pass to a place where three roads meet, and he shuddered as he crossed them, for fear laid her cold hands upon his heart and filled it with a wild, unreasoning dread, and branded the image of that awful spot upon his brain so that he could never forget it. On every side the mountains frowned down upon him, and seemed to echo to and fro the doom which the priestess had spoken. Straightforward he went like some hunted thing, turning neither to the right nor left, till he came to a narrow path where he met an old man in a chariot, drawn by mules, with his trusty servants round him. "'Ho! Oh, there, thou madman!' they shouted. "'Stand by and let the chariot pass!' "'Madmen yourselves!' he cried, for his sore heart could not brook the taunt. I am a king's son, and will stand aside for no man. So he tried to push past them by force, though he was one against many, and the old man stretched out his hand as though to stop him. But as well might a child hope to stand up against a wild bull, for he thrust him aside and fell him from his seat, and turned upon his followers, and striking out to the right and left. He stunned one and slew another, and forced his way through in blind fury. But the old man lay stiff and still upon the road. The fall from the chariot had quenched the feeble spark of life within him, and his spirit fled away to the house of Hades and the kingdom of the dead. One trusty servant lay slain by his side, and the other senseless and stunned, and when he awoke to find his master and his comrades slain, Oedipus was far upon his way. On and on he went, over hill and dale and mountain stream, till at length his strength gave way, and he sank down exhausted, and black despair laid hold of his heart, and he said within himself, Better to die here on the bare hillside, and be food for the kites and crows, than return to my father's house, to bring death to him, and sorrow to my mother's heart. But sweet sleep fell upon him, and when he awoke, Hope and the love of life put other thoughts in his breast, and he remembered the words with Merope the queen had spoke to him one day when he was boasting of his strength and skill. Strength and skill, my son, are the gifts of the gods, as the rain which falleth from heaven, and giveth life, and increase to the fruits of the earth. But man's pride is an angry flood that bringeth destruction on field and city. Remember that great gifts may work great good or great evil, and he who has them must answer to the gods if he use them well or ill and he thought within himself, "'Twere ill to die if, even in the uttermost parts of the earth, men need a strong man's arm and a wise man's cunning. Nevermore will I return to a far-famed Corinth, and my home by the sounding sea, but to far distant lands will I go, and bring blessing to those who are not of my kin, since to my own folk I must be a curse if I ever return.' So he went along the road from Delphi till he came to seven-gated Thebes, where he found all the people in deep distress and mourning, for their king Elias was dead, slain by robbers on the highway, and they had buried him far from his native land in a place where three roads met, and worse still, their city was beset by a terrible monster, the Sphinx, part eagle and part lion with the face of a woman, who every day devoured a man because they could not answer the riddle she sent them. All this Oedipus heard as he stood in the marketplace and talked with the people. What is this famous riddle that none can solve, he asked. Alas, young man, that none can say, for he that would solve the riddle must go up alone to the rocks where she sits. Then and there she chanced a riddle, and if he answers it not forwith, 
she tears them limb from limb, and if none go up to try the riddle, she swoops down upon the city and carries off her victims, and spares not woman or child. Our wisest and bravest have gone up, and our eyes have seen them no more. Now there is no man left who dare face the terrible beast. Then Oedipus says, I will go up and face this monster. It must be a hard riddle indeed if I cannot answer it. Oh, overbold and rash, they cry. Thinkest thou to succeed where so many have failed? Better to try and fail than never to try at all. Yet, where failure is death, surely a man should think twice. A man can die but once, and how better than in trying to save his fellows? As they looked at his strong limbs and his fair young face, they pitied him. Stranger, they said, who art thou to throw away thy life thus heedlessly? Are there none at home to mourn thee, and no kingdom thou shouldest rule? For, of a truth, thou art a king's son, and no common man. Nay, were I to return, and my home would be plunged in mourning and woe, and the people would drive me from my father's house. They marveled at his answer, but dared question him no further, and, seeing that none would turn him from his purpose, they showed him the path to the Sphinx rock, and all the people went out with him to the gate with prayers and blessings. At the gate they left him, for he who goes up to see the Sphinx must go alone, and none can stand by and help him. So he went through the Cranian gate and across the stream of Durs into the wide plain, and the mountain of the Sphinx stood out dark and clear on the other side. Then he prayed to Pallas Athene, the grey-eyed goddess of wisdom, and she took all fear from his heart. So he went up boldly to the rock, where the monster sat waiting to spring upon her prey. Yet for all his courage his heart beat fast as he looked upon her. For at first she appeared like a mighty bird, with great wings of bronze and gold, and the glancing sunbeams played about them, casting a halo of light around, and in the midst of the halo her face shone out, pale and beautiful as a star at dawn. But when she saw him coming near, a greedy fire lit up her eyes, and she put out her cruel claws and lashed her tail from side to side like an angry lion waiting for his prey. Nevertheless, Oedipus spoke to her fair and softly, O oh, lady, I am come to hear thy famous riddle and answer it or die. Full hardly manling, a dainty morsel the gods have sent this day, with thy fair young face and fresh young limbs. And she licked her cruel lips. Then Oedipus felt his blood boil within him, and he wished to slay her then and there, for she who had been the fairest of women was now the foulest of beasts, and she saw that by her cruelty she had killed the woman's soul within her, and the soul of a beast had taken its place. Come, tell me thy famous riddle, foul fury that thou art, that I may answer it and rid the land of this curse. At dawn it creeps on four legs, at noon it strides on two, at sunset and evening it totters on three. What is this thing, never the same, yet not many, but one? So she chanted slowly, and her eyes gleamed cruel and cold. Then thought Oedipus within himself, now or never must my learning and wit stand by me in good stead, or in vain have I talked with the wisest of men and learnt the secrets of Benicia and Egypt. And the gods who had given him understanding sent light into his heart, and boldly he answered, What can this creature be but man, O Sphinx? For a helpless babe at the dawn of life he crawls on his hands and feet, at noontide he walks erect in the strength of his manhood, and at evening he supports his tottering limbs with his staff, the prop and say of old age. Have I not answered aright and guessed thy famous riddle? Then a loud cry of despair, and answering him never a word, the great beast sprang up from her seat on the rock, and hurled herself over the precipice into the yawning gulf beneath. Far away across the plain the people heard her cry, and they saw the flash of the sun on her brazen wings, like a gleam of lightning in the summer sky. Thereupon they set up a great shout of joy to heaven, and poured out from every gate into the open plain, and some raised Oedipus upon their shoulders, and with shouts and songs of triumph bore him to the city. Then and there they made him king with one accord, for the old king had left no son behind him, and who more fitted to rule over them than the slayer of the sphinx and the savior of the city? So Oedipus became king of Thebes, and wisely and well did he rule, and for many a year long the land prospered in both peace and war. But the day came when a terrible pestilence broke out, and the people died by hundreds, so that at last Oedipus sent messengers to Selfi to ask why the gods were angry and sent a plague upon the land, and this was the answer they brought back. There is an unclean thing in Thebes, never has the murderer of Lias been found, and he dwells a pollution in the land. 
though the vengeance of the gods is slow yet it cometh without fail and the shedding of blood shall not pass unpunished then oedipus made proclamation through the land that if any man knew who the murderer was they should give him up to his doom and appease the anger of heaven and he laid such a terrible curse on any who dare to give so much as a crust of bread or a draught of water to him who brought such suffering on the land so throughout the country far and wide a search made to track out the stain of blood and cleanse the city from pollution but day after day the quest was fruitless and the pestilence raged unceasingly and darkness fell upon the soul of the people as their prayers remained unanswered and their burnt offerings smoked in vain upon the altars of the gods then at last oedipus sent for the blind seer teresius who had lived through six generations of mortal men and was the wisest of all prophets on earth he knew the language of the birds and though his eyes were closed in darkness his ears were open to hear the secrets of the universe and he knew the hidden things of the past and of the future but at first when he came before the king he would tell him nothing but begged him to question no further for the things of the future will come of themselves he cried Thou I shroud them in silence, and evil will it be for thee, O king, and evil for thine house, if I speak out the knowledge that is hidden in my heart. At last Oedipus grew angry at his silence, and taunted him, Verily, methinks thou thyself aid in the plotting of this deed, seeing that thou carest not for the people bow down beneath the pestilence in the dark days that are fallen on the land, so be it thou canst shield the murderer, and escape thyself from the curse of the gods. Then Tiresias was stung past bearing and would hold his tongue no longer. By thine own doom shalt thou be judged, O king, he said. Thou thyself art the murderer, thyself the pollution that stains the land with the blood of innocent men. Then Oedipus laughed aloud, Verily, old man, thou protest. What rival hath urged thee to this lie, hoping to drive me from the throne of Thebes? Of a truth, not thine eyes only, but thy heart is shrouded in a mist of darkness. Woe to thee, Oedipus, woe to thee, thou hast sight, yet seest not who thou art, nor knowest the deed of thine hand. Soon shalt thou wander, sightless and blind, a stranger in a strange land, feeling the ground with a staff, and men shall shrink back from thee in horror when they hear thy name and the deed that thou hast done. And the people were hushed by the words of the old man, and knew not what to think. But the wife of Oedipus, who stood by his side, said, Hearken not to him, my lord, for verily no mortal can search the secrets of fate, as I can prove full well by the words of the same man that he spoke in prophecy. For he it was who said that Laius, the king who is dead, should be slain by the hand of his own son. However, that poor innocent never grew to manhood, but was exposed on the trackless mountainside to die of cold and hunger. And Laius, men say, was slain by a robber band at a place where three roads meet. So hearken not to see a craft, ye people, nor trust in the words of one who proved a false prophet. But her words brought no comfort to Oedipus, and a, and a dreadful fear came into his heart, like a cold, creeping snake, as he listened, for he thought of his journey from Delphi, and how in his frenzy he had struck down an old man and his followers at a place where three roads meet. When he questioned her further, the time and the place that the company all tallied, save only that rumor had it that Laius had been slain by robber bands, while he had been single-handed against many. Was there none left, he asked, who saw the deed and lived to tell the tale? Ye, one faithful follower, returned to bear the news, but so soon as the sphinx was slain, and the people had made thee king, he went into distant pastures with his flocks, for he could not brook to see a stranger in his master's place, I'll bet he had saved the land from woe. Well. Go, summon him, said Oedipus, if the murderers were many as rumor saith, with his aid we may track them out, but if he was one man single-handed, ye though that man were myself of a truth he shall be an outcast from the land and that the plague may be stayed from the people verily my queen my heart misgives me when i remember my wrath and the deed that i had wrought at the crossroads in vain she tried to comfort him for a nameless fear had laid hold of his heart now while they were waiting for the herdsmen to come a messenger arrived in haste from corinth to say that polybus was dead and that oedipus was chosen king of the land for his fame had gone out far and wide as the slayer of the sphinx and the wisest of all kings of hellas 
When Oedipus heard the news, he bowed his head in sorrow to hear the death of the father he had loved, and turning to the messenger, he said, For many a long year my heart hath yearned towards him who is dead, and verily my soul is grieved that I shall see him no more, in the pleasant light of sun. But for the oracle's sake I stayed in exile, that my hand might not be red with the father's blood. And now I thank the gods that he has passed away in green old age, in the fullness of years and honor. But the messenger wondered at his words, Knewest thou not, then, that Polybus was no father to thee in the flesh, but that, for thy beauty and thy strength, he chose thee out of all the land to be the son to him and heir to the kingdom of Corinth? What sayest thou, bearer of ill news that thou art? cried Oedipus. To prove the same tale of thine a slanderous lie, I went to Delphi, and there the priestess prophesied that I would slay mine own sire. Wherefore, I went not back into my native land, but have lived in exile all my days." Then in darkness of soul hast thou lived, O king, for with mine own hands I received thee as a babe from a shepherd on dim Cytherion, from one of the herdsmen of Laius, who was the king before thee in this land. Woe is me, then, the curse of the gods is over me yet. I know not my sire, and unwittingly I may have slain him and rue the evil day. And a cloud of darkness hangeth over me for the slaying of King Laius. But lo, they bring the herdsman who saw the deed done, and pray heaven he may clear me from all guilt. Bring him forward that I may question him. Then they brought the man forward before the king, though he shrank back and tried to hide himself. When the messenger from Corinth saw him, he started back in surprise, for it was the very man from whom hand he had taken Oedipus on the mountainside. And he said to the king, Behold, the man who will tell thee the secret of thy birth, from his hands did I take thee as a babe on dim Cytherian. Then Oedipus questioned the man, and at first he denied it from fear, but at last he was fain to confess. And who gave me to thee to slay on the barren mountainside? I pray thee, king, ask no more. Some things that are are better and said. Nay, tell me and fear not. I care not if I am a child of shame and slavery stains my birth. A son of fortune the gods may have made me, and given me good days with evil. Speak out, I pray thee, though I be the son of the slave, I can bear it. No son of a slave art thou, but seed of a royal house, ask no more, my king. Speak, speak, man. Thou drivest me to anger, and I will make thee tell, though it may be by force. Ah, lay not cruel hands upon me, for thine own sake I would hide it from the queen thy mother I had thee, and thy father was Laius, the king. At the crossroads from Delphi didst thou meet him in his chariot, and slew him unwittingly in thy wrath. Ah, woe is me, for the gods have chosen me out to be an unwilling witness to the truth of their oracles. Then a great hush fell upon all people like the lull before a storm. For the words of the herdsmen were so strange and terrible at first they could scarce take in their meaning. But when they understood that Oedipus was Laius' own son, and that he had fulfilled the dreadful prophecy and slain his sire, a great tumult rose. Some saying one thing and some another, but the voice of Oedipus was heard above the uproar. Ah, woe is me, woe is me. The curse of the gods is upon me, and none can escape their wrath. Blindly I have done this evil, and when I was striving to escape fate, caught me in her hidden meshes. Oh, foolish hearts of men, to think that ye can flee from the doom of the gods. For lo, ye strive in the dark, and your very struggles bind you, but closer in the snare of your fate. Cast me from the land, ye people. Do with me what ye will, for the gods have made me a curse and a pollution, and by my death alone will the land have rest from pestilence. And the people would have taken him at his word, for fickle is the heart of the multitude, and swayed this way and that by every breath of calamity. They were sore stricken, too, by the pestilence, and in their wrath against the cause of it, they forgot the slaying of the sphinx and the long days of peace and prosperity. But the blind seer Treras rose up in their midst, and at his voice the people were silenced. Citizens of Cadmus, foolish and blind of heart, will ye slay the savior of your city? Have ye forgotten the man-devouring sphinx in the days of darkness? Verily prosperity blunteth the edge of gratitude, and thou, Oedipus, curse not the gods for thine evil fate. He that putteth his finger in the fire is burnt, whether he do it knowingly or not. As to thy sire, him indeed didst thou slay in ignorance, but the shedding of a man's blood be upon thine own head, for that was the fruit of thy wrathful spirit, which, thou lack of curbing, broke forth like an angry beast. Hadst thou never slain a man, never wouldst thou have slain thy sire. 
But now thou art a pollution to the land of thy birth, and by long exile and wandering must thou expiate thy sin and die a stranger in a strange land. Yet methinks that in the dark mirror of prophecy I see thy form, as it were, a guardian to the land of thy resting place, and in a grove of sacred trees thy spirit's lasting habitation, when thy feet have accomplished the ways of expiation, and the days of thy wandering are done. So the people were silenced, but Oedipus would not be comforted, and in his shame and misery he put out his own eyes, because they had looked on unspeakable things. Then he clothed himself in rags, and took a pilgrim's staff to go forth alone upon his wanderings. And the people were glad at his going, because the plague had heartened their hearts, and they cared nothing for his gray hairs and sightless eyes, nor remember all he had done for them, but thought only of how the plagues might be stayed. Even Ateocles and Polynice, his own sons, showed no pity, but would have let him go forth alone, that they might live on in the fatness of the land, for their hardness of hearts they were punished long after, when they quarreled as to which should be king, and brought down the flood of war upon Thebes, and fell each other by the other's hand in deadly strife. Of all his children, Antigone alone refused to let him go forth the solitary wanderer, and will listen to none of his entreaties when he spoke of the hardness of the way that would lie before them. "'Nay, father,' she cried, "'thinkest thou that I could suffer thee to wander sightless and blind in thine own age, with none to say thy feeble steps, or lend thee the light of their eyes?' The road before us is hard and long, my child, and no man can say when my soul shall find rest. The ways of the world are cruel, and men love not the curse of gods. As for thee, heaven bless thee for thy love, but thou art too frail and tender a thing to eat of the bread and drink of the waters of sorrow. Ah, father, thinkest thou that aught could be more bitter than to sit in the seat of kings while thou wanderest a beggar on the face of the earth? Nay, suffer me to go with thee, and say thy steps in the days of thy trial. Nothing he could say would dissuade her. So they two set out alone upon their wanderings. The old man bowed down beneath the weight of sorrow, and the young girl in the freshness of youth and beauty, with a great love in her heart, a bright burning love, which was the light by which she lived, and a light which never led her astray. At first Oedipus was filled with shame and bitterness, and cursed the day of his birth and his evil fate, but as time went on he remembered the words of Tiresias, at how his death he should be a blessing to the land of his last resting place. And hope sprang up in his heart that the gods had not forsaken him, but would wipe out the stain of his sin and make his name once more glorious among men. Daily this hope grew stronger and brighter, and he felt that the days of wandering and expiation were drawing to a close, and a mysterious power guided his steps he knew not whether, except that it was towards the goal of his release, and many a hero grave did they pass and many a sacred shine, for all along the road of men of old raised monuments to the undying glory of the dead and the heritage of honor which they left to unborn generations." and always Antigone tended the old man's feeble steps, and let him the light of her young eyes, till at length they came to white colonists and the grove of Eumendes. There she set him on a rock to rest his weary limbs, and the soft spring breeze played about them, and the clear waters of Cephasus flowed sparkling at their feet to the fertile plain below. In the dark coverts and the green glades the nightingale trilled her sweet song, and the glass was bright with many a golden crocus and white narcissus bloom. As he sat there, a great calm filled the old man's heart, for he felt that the day of his wandering were done. But while they were resting, a man from the village happened to pass, and when he saw them, he shouted out, Ho oh, there, impious wanderers, know ye not that ye sit on sacred land and trespass on hollowed ground? Then Oedipus knew more surely than ever that the day of his release had come. O oh, stranger, he cried, welcome is that, that which thou sayest, for here shall the words of the prophets be fulfilled. And when he said that in a grove of sacred trees, my spirit should find rest. But the man was not satisfied, and he called to a band of his countrymen who were in the fields close by, and they came up and spoke roughly to Oedipus, and asked his name and business, when he told them they were filled with horror, for all men had heard of the slaying of Laius, and they would have turned him out by force. But Oedipus raised himself from the rock on which he was seated, and in spite of his beggar's rags and sightless eyes, there was a majesty about his face and form that marked him as no common man. "'Men of Clonus,' he said, "'ye judge by the evil I have done, and not by the good. 
Have ye forgotten the days when the name of Oedipus was honored throughout the land? Of a truth the days of darkness came, and the stain of my sin found me out. But now is my wrathful spirit curbed, and the gods will make me once more a blessing to men. Go, tell your king Theseus, who rules in Athena's sacred citadel, that Oedipus is here, and bid him come with all speed if he would win a guardian for this land, an everlasting safeguard for his city in the days of storm and stress. So they sent off a messenger in hot haste, for there was a mysterious power about the aged wanderer that none could withstand, and soon Theseus arrived, himself a mighty hero who made Athens a great city and rid the country of many a foul pestilence, and he greeted Oedipus courteously and kindly as befitted a Greek prince, and offered him hospitality. But Oedipus said, The hospitality I crave, O king, is for no brief sojourn in this land. Nay, tis an everlasting home, I ask, for the hand of heaven is upon me, and full well I know that this day my soul shall leave this frail and broken body. And to thee alone is it given to know where my bones shall rest, to thee and thy seed after thee. As long as my bones shall remain in the land, and so long shall my spirit watch over it, and men shall call upon my name to turn the tide of battle, and to stay the flood of pestilence and war. Wilt thou come with me, O king, whither the gods shall lead, and learn the secret of my grave? Then Theseus bowed his head and answered, Show thou the way, and I will come. So Oedipus turned and led the way into the grove, and Theseus and Antigone followed after, for a mysterious power seemed to guide him, and he walked as one who could see, and his steps were strong and firm as those of a man in his prime. Straight into the grove did he go, till they came to the heart of the wood, where there was a sacred well beneath a hollow pear tree. Close by was a great chasm going deep down into the bowels of the earth, and men called it the Gate of Hades, the Kingdom of the Dead. When they reached the well... Oedipus sat down upon a rock and called his daughter to his side and said, Antigone, my child, thy hand hast ministered to me in exile and smooths the path for the wanderer's feet. Go now, fetch water, and pour a libation and drink offering to the gods below. It is the last thing thou canst do for me on earth. So Antigone fetched water from the well and dressed and tended him and poured libation to the gods. And when she had finished, Oedipus drew her to him and kissed her tenderly and said, Grieve not for me, my child, while I know thy heart will ache, for love hath made light the burden of toil. But for me life's day is done, and I go to my rest. Do thou seek thy brethren, and be to them as thou hast been to me. My child, my child, hard is the way that lies before thee, and my soul yearneth over thee for the evil day that shall come. But look thou to thine own pure heart, on which the gods have set the seal of truth that changeth not with passing years, and heed not the counsels of men. And he held her closely to him, and she clung weeping about his neck. As they sat, a hush fell upon the grove, and the nightingales ceased their song, and from the depths of the grove a voice was heard like the voice of distant thunder, Oedipus, Oedipus, why dost thou tarry? When they heard it, they were afraid, but Oedipus rose up and gently put his daughter from him, saying, Lo, the voice of Zeus, who calleth me, fare thee well, my child, thou canst go no further with me. For Theseus only is it meet to see the manner of my death, and he and I must go forward alone into the wood. With firm, unfaltering steps, he led the way once more, and Theseus followed after. And what happened there none can tell, for Theseus kept the secret to his dying day. But men say that when he came out of the wood his face was as the face of one who had seen things passing mortal speech. As for Oedipus, the great twin brethren sleep and death carried his bones to Athens, where the people built him a shrine, and for many a long year they honored him as a hero in the land of Attica. For though the sin that he had sinned in his wrath and ignorance was great and terrible, yet his life had brought joy to many men, and prosperity to more lands than one. For with wisdom and love he guided his days, and with sorrow and tears he wiped out the stain of his sin, so that, in spite of all he suffered, men loved to tell of the glory and wisdom of Oedipus and how he solved the riddle of the Sphinx. End of chapter 8, part 1「Chapter Eight: Myths of Greece and Rome, Part Two of Junior Classics, Volume Two, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Hatton. Chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome. Part 2 The Gift of Athene by Sir George W. Cox. Footnote in this greek tale the greek names are preserved in the latin mythology zeus is jupiter posidon is neptune athene is minerva artemis is diana herms is mercury hephaestos is vulcan dionysius is bacchus hestia is festa ars is mars and aphrodite is venus End of footnote near the banks of the stream kephasos erechthus had built a city in a rocky and thin-soiled land he was the father of a free and brave people and though his city was proud and humble yet zeus by his wisdom foresaw that one day it would become the noblest of all cities throughout the wide earth and there was a quarrel between posidon the lord of the sea and athene the child of zeus to see by whose name the city of erechtheus should be called so zeus appointed a day in the which he would judge between them in the presence of the great gods who dwell on high olympus when the day was come the gods sat each on his golden throne on the banks of the stream Cephasos. high above all was the throne of zeus the great father of gods and men, and by his side sat Hera the queen. This day even the sons of men might gaze upon them, for Zeus had laid aside his lightnings, and all the gods had come down in peace to listen to his judgment between Poseidon and Athene. There sat Phoebus Apollo with his golden harp in his hand. His face glistened for the brightness of his beauty, but there was no anger in his gleaming eyes, and idle by his side lay the unerring spear with which he smites all who deal falsely and speak lies. There beside him sat Artemis, his sister, whose days were spent in chasing the beasts of the earth and in sporting with the nymphs on the reedy banks of Eurotus. There by the side of Zeus sat Herms, ever bright and youthful the spokesman of the gods with staff in hand to do the will of the great father there sat hephaestos the lord of fire and hestia who guards the hearth there too was ars who delights in war and dionysius who loves the banquet and the wine cup and aphrodite who rose from the sea foam to fill the earth with laughter and woe before them all stood the great rivals awaiting the judgment of zeus high in her left hand athene held the invincible spear and on her shield hidden from mortal sight was the face on which no man may gaze and live close beside her proud in the greatness of his power poseidon waited the issue of the contest in his right hand gleamed the trident with which he shakes the earth and cleaves the water of the sea then from his golden seat rose the spokesman Herms, and his clear voice sounded over all the great council. Listen, he said, to the will of Zeus, who judges now between Poseidon and Athene. The city of Erechtheus shall bear the name of that god who shall bring forth out of the earth the best gift for the sons of men. If Poseidon do this, the city shall be called Poseidona, but if Athene brings the higher gift, it shall be called Athens. Then King Poseidon rose up in the greatness of his majesty, and with his trident he smote the earth where he stood. Straightway the hill was shaken to its depths, and the earth split asunder, and forth from the chasm leaped a horse, such as never shall be seen again for strength and beauty. His body shone white all over as the driven snow, his mane streamed proudly in the wind as he stamped on the ground and scored in very wantonness over hill and valley behold my gift said poseidon and call the city after my name who shall give aught better than the horse to the sons of man 
But Athene looked steadfastly at the gods with her keen gray eye, and she stooped slowly down to the ground and planted in it a little seed which she held in her right hand. She spake no word, but still gazed calmly on the great council. Presently they saw springing from the earth a little germ, which grew up and threw out its bows and leaves. Higher and higher it rose, with all its thick green foliage, and put forth fruit on its clustering branches. My gift is better, O Zeus, she said, than that of King Poseidon. The horse which he has given shall bring war and strife and anguish to the children of men. My olive tree is the sign of peace and plenty, of health and strength, and the pledge of happiness and freedom. Shall not then the city of Erechtheus be called after my name? Then with one accord rose the voice of the gods in the air, as they cried out, The gift of Athene is the best which may be given to the sons of men. It is the token that the city of Erechtheus shall be greater in peace than in war, and nobler in its freedom than its power. Let the city be called Athens. Then Zeus, the mighty son of Cronus, bowed his head in sign of judgment, that the city should be called by the name of Athene. From his head the immortal lock streamed down, and the earth trembled beneath his feet as he rose from his golden throne to return to the halls of Olympus. But still Athene stood gazing over the land, which was now her own, and she stretched out her spear toward the city of Erechtheus and said, I have won the victory, and here shall be my home. Here shall my children grow up in happiness and freedom, and hither shall the sons of men come to learn of law and order. Here shall they see what great things may be done by mortal hands when aided by the gods who dwell on Olympus. And when the torch of freedom has gone out at Athens, its light shall be handed on to other lands, and men shall learn that my gift is still the best, and they shall say that reverence for law and the freedom of thought, indeed, has come to them from the city of Erechtheus, which bears the name of Athene. End of chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome Part 2 Recorded by Peter Strom Sabetha, Kansas On June 6, 2018Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 3, of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 3, Daphne, Child of the Morning, by Sir George W. Cox. In the Vale of Tempe, where the stream of Penoas flows beneath the heights of Olympus towards the sea, the beautiful Daphne past the days of her happy childhood. She climbed the crags to greet the first rays of the rising sun, and when he had driven his fiery horses over the sky, she watched his chariot sink behind the western mountains. Over hill and dale she roamed, free and light as the breeze of spring. Other maidens round her spoke each of her love, but Daphne cared not to listen to the voice of man though many a one sought her to be his wife. One day, as she stood on the slopes of Asa, in the glow of early morning, she saw before her a glorious form. The light of the new-risen sun fell on his face with a golden splendor, and she knew that it was Phoebus Apollo. Hastily, he ran towards her and said, I have found thee, child of the morning. Others thou hast cast aside but from me thou canst not escape. I have sought thee long, and now I will make thee mine. But the heart of Daphne was bold and strong, and her cheek flushed, and her eyes sparkled with anger, as she said, I know neither love nor bondage. I live free among the streams and hills, and to none will I yield my freedom. Then the face of Apollo grew dark with anger, 
and he drew near to seize the maiden. But swift as the wind, she fled away, over hill and dale, over crag and river. The feet of Daphne fell lightly, as falling leaves in autumn. But nearer yet came Phoebus Apollo, till at last the strength of the maiden began to fail. Then she stretched out her hands, and cried for help to the goddess Ceres. But she came not to her aid. Her head was dizzy, and her limbs trembled in utter feebleness as she drew near to the broad river which gladdens the plains of Thessaly. She almost felt the breath of Phoebus, and her robe was almost in his grasp. With a wild cry she said, Father Penelus, receive thy child. And she rushed into the stream, whose waters closed gently over her. She was gone, and Apollo mourned for his madness in chasing thus the free maiden. And he said, I have punished myself by my folly. The light of the morning is taken out of the day. I must go on alone till my journey shall draw towards its end. Then he spake the word, and a laurel came up on the bank where Daphne had plunged into the stream, and the green bush, with its thick clustering leaves, keeps her name forever. End of chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, part 3, recorded by Peter Strom, Sabatha, Kansas, on June 7, 2018. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 4 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome Part 4 The Vengeance of Apollo by Sir George W. Cox In the cool evening time King Darius walked in his royal garden, and the noblest of the Persians were around him. Then came there a messenger from the western land in haste and said, O king, the men of Athens with the sons of Javan have taken the city of Sardis, and the temple of the great goddess Kabil has been burnt. And King Darius answered quickly and said, What sayest thou, O messenger, that men of whom I have never heard the name have come with my slaves against the land of the great king? Then he bade them bring a bow and arrows, and while some one went for them, the Persians stood round him in silence, for they feared to speak while the king was angry. He took the bow, fitted an arrow to it, and shot it up into the sky, and prayed, O Jupiter, that dwellest in the high heavens, suffer me to be avenged upon the men of Athens. The sons of Javan are my slaves, and sorely shall they be smitten for the deeds which they have done. Then he gave command, and each day when the banquet was spread in the gilded hall, and the king sat down to meet, there stood forth one who said with a loud voice, O king, forget not the men of Athens. But Jupiter hearkened not to the prayer of the great king, for the ships were made ready, and his chieftains and warriors hastened away to the Athenian land and fought in Marathon. They fared not well in the battle, for the men of Athens strove mightily for their country, so in great fear the Persians fled to the seashore, while the men of Athens slew them on the land and in the water as they struggled to reach the ships. And when the fight was over, they spoiled the Persians who lay dead on the seashore, and took rich plunder, for scattered about they found embroidered turbans, and bright swords, and daggers, and golden bits, and bridles, and silken robes and jewels. Thus sped the hosts of King Darius, and the messengers came again in haste, as he sat on his golden throne in Susa, while the nobles of Persia did obeisance before him. Then the king said, Speak, O man, 
hast thou brought good tidings that my slaves have chastised the people of the strange city and the messenger answered saying o king the men of athens have slain thy mighty men with the sword and burned thy ships and few come back of all the great army which thou didst send against them great and fierce was the wrath of king darius when he heard the tidings and he hastened to make ready ships and men and horses that he might go forth himself against the men of athens then in every city of the persian land was heard the noise as of men who have a great work to do and the armorers wrought spears and swords and shields and in the harbors they built countless ships to sail over the dark sea but jupiter hearkened not yet to the prayer of the king so darius died and xerxes his son sat upon his throne and the chief men of the persians were gathered round him then the king spake and said be ready o persians every one of you for i will go forth with all my great power and make slaves of the men of athens and so may the gods do to me and more also if i burn not the temples of their gods with fire and bring not hither the golden treasures which lie in the house of phoebus apollo at delphi then with all his great hosts king xerxes set forth from susa and his governors and warriors and slaves followed him with a great multitude of every nation and people and they crossed over from the land of asia by a bridge which was built over the sea of hella thus they journeyed on in pomp and glory and king xerxes thought that they had done great things when his host slew leonidas and three hundred men of sparta who guarded the passes of thermopylae so his heart was filled with pride and he chose out the bravest of his warriors and charged the men of thessaly to lead them to delphi and the temple of phoebus apollo there was great fear and terror in delphi a messenger came and said the hosts of king xerxes are come to slay the men of this land and take away the treasures which lie in the house of king apollo so the delphians went in great sorrow to the temple and bowed their heads to the earth and prayed saying child of the light who dwellest here in thy holy temple thieves and robbers are coming against us and they are purposed to take away thy sacred treasures tell us then what shall we do for at thy bidding we are ready to bury them deep in the earth till the storm of war be overpassed then came there a voice from the inmost shrine but it was not the voice of the priestess for phoebus apollo himself came down to speak his will and said move them not men of delphi i will guard my holy place and none shall lay hand on my sacred things so they went away in gladness of heart and made ready for the coming of the persians all the men of delphi left the city saving only sixty men and the prophet akaratos and these sat down before the steps of the temple in silence they waited till the persians should come and they marveled at the great stillness on the earth and in the heaven there was not a cloud in the sky and the two peaks of parnassus glistened in the blazing sunshine not a breath lifted the green leaves of the sacred laurels not a bird sang in the breathless air presently as he turned round to look the prophet saw the sacred weapons of phoebus which no mortal man might touch lying on the temple steps and he said to the sixty men who tarried with him lo now will phoebus fight for his holy temple for his own hand hath made ready the weapons for the battle soon in the deep valley and along the bank of the castellian stream were seen the hosts of the persians as they came on with their long spears flashing in the bright sunshine far away the men of delphi saw the blaze of their burnished armor and heard the tramp of their war-horses onward they came and they said one to another the gods have fought for us and the prize is won already see yonder is the home of phoebus and none remain of the men of delphi to do battle for his holy temple still the sun shone without a cloud in the sky and no breeze broke the stillness of the laurel groves still glistened the sacred arms as they lay on the steps of the temple and the open doors showed the golden treasures 
which were stored up within. There lay the throne of Midas, and the golden line of Croesus. There lay the mighty mixing bowl, all of pure gold, which at the bidding of Croesus was wrought by the Samian Theodorus. There lay all the rich gifts which the men of Hellas had offered up to win the favor of the Lord Apollo. Then the leaders of the Persians stretched forth their hands, as though all these things were given up to them by the God who had forsaken his people. But even as they came near his holy ground, the lightning flashed forth, and the crash of the thunder was heard in the blue heaven, and the dark cloud fell on the peaks of Parnassus. Like the roar of a raging torrent, the mighty wind burst forth. Down from the steps of the Delphian hills thundered the huge rocks, and the trees uptorn from their roots were hurled at the host of the barbarians. Louder and fiercer grew the din. Cries and shoutings were heard from the Allian chapel, for the virgin Minerva fought against the men of Xerxes. Smitten by the fiery lightnings, they fell on the quaking earth. Suddenly there was heard a sound more fierce and terrible, and two cliffs were hurled down from the mountain top. Underneath this huge mass, the mightiest of the Persians lay still in the sleep of death, and all who yet lived fled with quaking hearts and trembling steps from the great wrath of the Lord Apollo. So fought the god for his holy temple. When from their hiding places the men of Delphi saw that the Persians fled, they poured forth from the caves and thickets to slay them. They smote them as sheep are slain before the altar of sacrifice, for even the bravest of their warriors lifted not their arms against them. Long time they followed after them in hot haste, and among them were seen two giant forms, clothed in bright armor, smiting down the hosts of the enemy. Then they knew that Philacos and Autonus, the heroes of the place, had come forth to aid them, and they smote the Persians more fiercely till the going down of the sun. So the fight was ended, and the stars came forth in the cloudless sky, and the laurel groves were stirred by the soft evening breeze. With songs of high thanksgiving, the men of Delphi drew near to the temple, and saw that Phoebus had placed again within his shrine the sacred arms which no mortal man may handle. Then was their rich spoil gathered, and the holy place of Apollo shone with gifts of gold and silver, which the men of Delphi offered in gladness of heart, for all the great things which he had done for them. And in every house of the Delphians were seen robes and turbans, rich with gold and silver and embroidery. On their walls hung spears and shields and swords and daggers, which the Persians bore when they came to Delphi. In after days they told their children the wondrous tale, how Phoebus Apollo smote down the hosts of Xerxes, and they showed them the spoils which they took by the aid of the bright heroes, and the two rocks lying on the holy ground before his shrine, which Phoebus tore from the peaks of Parnassus in the day of his great vengeance. End of chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 4 Recorded by Peter Strom, Sabetha, Kansas, on June 7, 2018